This is a copyrighted work. Unauthorized copying or distribution is a crime punishable by up to five years in prison and a fine of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Scholastic Audio presents Wings of Fire. Legends, Dragon Slayer, by Tui T. Sutherland, read by Shannon McManus. Prologue. Twenty years ago, it is nearly impossible to steal from a dragon. Everyone knew that. Nearly impossible and decidedly stupid, especially when that dragon lives in a giant fortress with a hundred other dragons, and you are the size of their average mid-morning snack. But if they did it, if they succeeded, they would be legends. Wealthy legends, with more gold than anyone they knew had ever seen before. That was Heath's grand vision, anyway. Stone couldn't imagine himself as a rich person, but he couldn't stop his little brother and sister once they had an idea in their heads. The best way, the only way, to protect them, was to come along too. And so now he was here. Doing the nearly impossible and decidedly stupid thing, the dragon's palace loomed out of the sand like a dark mountain. Three crescent moons overhead curled like ice dragon claws against the night sky, casting barely a glimmer of light on the dunes below. In the shadows of the castle walls, Stone and Heath crouched in the sand side by side, small, wingless, without talons or scales. Teeth scarcely worth mentioning. We're a perfect dragon's dinner, Stone thought nervously, just sitting at their front door, like we're asking to be eaten. No other creatures in Pyria walk right up to the dragons like humans do. They must think we're the dumbest prey on the planet. Maybe we are, if we really think we can steal their treasure and get away with it. What's taking her so long? He whispered. We shouldn't have let her go back in. He hefted a bag of gold in his hands. This is more than enough for the three of us for the rest of our lives. His brother gave him a scornful look and reached into the other bag. Stone heard the soft metallic sound of gold nuggets running through Heath's fingers. She wanted to go back for more, Heath murmured. She said there was rooms and rooms of it. All this sand dragon treasure, our stone, will be kings. Being as wealthy as dragons won't make us as powerful as dragons, Stone pointed out. We'll see, Heath said, turning his gaze back to the window above them. The narrow slit was made to be too small for an enemy dragon to slip through, but it was an easy squeeze for a sixteen-year-old human girl, like their sister Rose. I think I hear her, Stone whispered. A pair of small hands appeared at the bottom of the window. And a moment later, Rose pulled herself up to straddle the ledge. In the shadows, she could have been anyone, except that no one else had a halo of dark curls quite like hers, and no one else would climb into a dragon's lair twice as she just had. Rose dropped a rope down to her brothers, and they both grabbed it, helping her heave the sacks of treasure up from the floor inside. After a few moments, she signaled for them to move out of the way. Clink, thud, went the bags as they hit the sand. With a hiss, the rope slithered down beside them. Stone squinted up at Rose's silhouette as she inched down the stone wall, finding cracks and dents where she could fit her feet to climb. This whole plan had been Heath's idea, of course. Heath was obsessed with the dragons of the desert beyond their forest. Rose, the youngest, had run the greatest risk slipping into the dragon palace 
and finding the treasure room in the middle of the night. Stone's job was transport. As the oldest and biggest of the three siblings, he could carry all four of the sacks himself, at least until they reached the horses that were waiting a few dunes away, the horses he had stolen from their father's stable two nights ago. Well, if he gets mad, I'll be able to pay him three times what they're worth, Stone thought with bitter pride. Rose had almost reached the ground. Maybe they really were going to get away with this. Stone, Heath whispered. Stop breathing so loudly. I'm not breathing loudly, Stone objected. I'm barely breathing at all. Heath turned to him with an impatient scowl, and then suddenly, his whole face went blank. Stone knew that look. He'd seen that look when Heath's carelessness lit the smithy on fire and nearly set the whole village ablaze. He'd seen it when their father had caught Heath stealing food meant for the wing watchers. It was pure terror, and Stone knew instantly, with a plunging cold fear in his chest, what that meant. He whirled around and saw the dragon looming behind him. She was taller than the trees around their village, with wings that blotted out all three moons. Obsidian black eyes glinted in a narrow snake-like face. Sand hissed between her claws as she flexed them, and Stone could see the dark, dangerous barb of her tail raised behind her like a scorpion's, poised to strike. He'd seen, from afar, what that venom could do to a full-sized dragon. He didn't want to imagine what it could do to a human, or how painful that kind of death would be. The dragon growled, low and long, with a lot of hissing and guttural sounds. She glared at the stolen treasure and, even more menacingly, at Rose, who'd reached the ground and now stood with her back pressed to the castle wall. She's going to kill us, Stone breathed. He had a spear strapped to his back, but the five seconds it took him to reach for it would be all the time the dragon needed to stab him through the heart with her tail. Heath, Rose whispered, there's a sword in the bag nearest to you. Don't. Stone wanted to turn and grab his brother, but he didn't dare move. Don't antagonize her. Right, good idea, Heath murmured. Except it's a bit late for that, idiot. Not sure if you've noticed, but we're in the middle of stealing her treasure. Her treasure? Stone finally noticed the black band of onyx embedded with diamonds that circled the dragon's head. This was the queen herself. So, there was no escape. Death then already. He was only 20. He'd expected to do a bit more with his life before a dragon inevitably killed him. Why did I let Heath talk us into this? Abruptly, Heath lunged for the sack beside him. The dragon let out a shriek of rage and stabbed her tail forward. But Stone just managed to dive and roll out of the way. He saw moonlight ricochet off steel as Heath swung the sword up and clumsily jabbed the dragon's underbelly with it. The weapon clanged against her scales. Heath nearly lost his grip, staggering sideways. Stone leaped to his feet and drew his spear. He ran full tilt at the queen, trying to remember what the wing watchers at school had taught them about dragon weaknesses. The only thing he could remember was someone saying, they don't have any. The dragon's tail whipped toward him, lightning fast. He ducked, and her tail struck the spear, sending shockwaves rippling down his arms. The sand slipped away from his feet, and he fell. Stone, Rose cried, darting forward. She grabbed one of the sacks of treasure and swung it in a full arc around her body, hurling it at the dragon's head. The heavy bag collided with the queen's skull with a loud crack. The desert dragon stumbled back, shook her head, and lunged forward with a roar. No, Stone yelled, trying to stand, trying to bring the spear around, trying to fight the sand that dragged him down. Too slow, too slow. A burst of flames shot from the dragon's mouth. Her wings flared, flinging sand into Stone's face. He floundered forward blindly. Not Rose, not Rose. 
Heath let out a shout of rage somewhere to his left. There was another clash of sword against scales. Following the sound, Stone aimed for the blurry winged shadow and stabbed his spear upward. It connected, lodged in place, and was ripped out of his hands. The dragon roared, but now the roar had pain in it as well as fury. In the dark, through sand-stung eyes, Stone saw the dragon collapse heavily to the sand with a thud that shook the ground. He heard Heath's footsteps sprint past. Stone covered his head and cowered as the dragon thrashed and howled. Heath appeared suddenly at his elbow, tugging him up to his feet. We did it. We killed a dragon. His arms and chest were spattered with dragon blood, and he was carrying something grotesque and dripping in one hand. He'd abandoned the sword, which Stone could see, still sticking out of the end of the severed tail. Let's get out of here before that noise wakes any more of them. He shoved a sack of treasure into Stone's hands. Rose, Stone said. Heath flinched away from him. Stone realized that his brother's clothing was charred, and dark burns rippled along his arm on one side. She's gone, Stone. Heath picked up another one of the bags of treasure, shoved the object in his hand into it, and fled into the darkness. Stone took a step after him, then stopped. I can't go home like this. If I return to father, carrying bags of treasure instead of my sister's body. He turned and looked up at the dark walls. Wings were boiling over the top of the palace, like a million bats pouring from a cave. The sand dragons were coming, called by the dying roars of their queen. And when they catch us. Stone's courage failed him. Still clutching the dragon's treasure, he turned and ran. Part One Chapter One Wren One morning, shortly after Wren turned seven years old, her parents wrestled her into her best blue wool dress, pinned her down to oil her curly hair, and took her up the mountain to be eaten by a dragon. They didn't tell her that was the plan, of course. They didn't say, guess what's going to happen to you today? Or, bad news about that tree climbing expedition you had planned for tomorrow. They didn't say much beyond, stop wiggling, and don't you dare bite me. If they had told her she was off to be a dragon's breakfast, she might have pointed out that the dragon certainly wouldn't care what her hair looked like, so there was no need to spend the last minutes of her life torturing her. But instead, she thought she was trapped on another boring walk with the dragon mancers for an edifying lecture about dragon behavior. And so all she wondered, as they marched through the woods, was why her parents were holding her hands so tightly and why none of the other village children had been dragged along. She was too young to remember the apprentice who'd been sacrificed five years earlier, especially since it was forbidden to talk about the gifts the village gave the dragons. And despite what the dragon mancers thought, Wren hadn't fully understood what she'd read in the books she stole from them. Wren did notice the strange sideways looks from the other villagers, but it did not occur to her that those were, good thing it's her getting fed to a dragon and not me, kinds of looks. She thought they were the usual, there goes Wren, the girl with a dragon's temper, faces she always got. She liked making a horrible face back so she could see them blanch and turn away quickly. But really, she should have been more suspicious. She should have realized her parents were being too quiet. It's just, one never really expects to be fed to dragons. And then suddenly, one dragon mancer stopped and raised his hands, and then all the villagers stopped and stared at Wren. The other two dragon mancers produced ropes from their robes and grabbed her. The tall, thin one said something like, Hear us, O oh mighty wings of flame, in her snooty voice. And the short one, with bumps all over his face, said, We offer you this gift, that you may spare the rest of your lowly worshippers. Then the leader, the smug one, who always ate all the goat cheese at village celebrations, started to say, Thank you for the lives of those 
but Ren didn't let him finish. She recognized the words they were chanting. She'd read them in one of the books she'd borrowed from the head dragon mancer's study. This was the gift for the dragons ceremony. It was real after all, and this time she was the gift. After a lot of wrestling and screaming and fighting, they finally managed to tie her up. But they didn't get to say all their stupid blessing words. One dragon mancer staggered away with his nose bleeding. Another clutched her scratched up arm. The third was hobbling as they hurried off. Ren shouted every bad word she knew at them as the villagers scurried away, avoiding her eyes. Her parents didn't even look back once. They left her on a giant stone slab overlooking the river where the sky was wide open and the dragons would be able to see her easily. The idea, of course, was that the seven-year-old would sit there politely and wait to be eaten, like a good little human sacrifice. But that was obviously not going to happen. Although she was quite little, Ren was never polite and rarely good. And Ren was very much not on board with a plan where she got eaten and all the smug-faced meanies in her village did not. That was the ultimate definition of unfair. Ren was a younger sister, so she knew all about fair and unfair, and getting eaten by dragons while jerks like Camellia stayed inside, probably playing with Ren's dolls, was absolutely 100% not fair. Ren had one brother who'd agree with her, she was pretty sure, but her uncle had taken leave hunting this morning. To get him out of the way, she realized now. Not that an eight-year-old could have stopped the village's plan either, but at least he could have been super mad. He would have yelled at mom and dad. He would have been full of rage and vengeance forever and made their lives miserable for all time, and they would have totally deserved it. But instead, she knew they'd tell him there was a sad accident while he was gone, and little Ren got chomp-chomped by a dragon. Too bad and he'd be sad, but then he'd get over it, and everyone would la-dee-da off into their peaceful, renless futures. Moons above, Ren thought furiously, as she wriggled her hands free from the ropes. They'll probably tell him it was my fault, that I was disobedient again, and that's why I got gobbled. They're going to make me into a story they tell other kids to make them behave. Now she was really mad. She yanked off the rope around her ankles and jumped to her feet. What she wanted to do most was run after the villagers and dragonmancers and yell at them some more. She wanted them to know they were unfair, stupid, stupid heads, and that she absolutely refused to get eaten by a dragon, and she didn't even care if a dragon came and ate everybody else because they were all mean. Ren took two steps into the forest and stopped herself. If I run after them, they'll just tie me up again, but tighter. They wouldn't listen to her. They never did. The more she yelled and screamed, the less they listened. This was a fact she had noticed, but it only made her want to scream louder. Screaming right now would probably summon a dragon, though. Or the dragon mancers, with her cold fingers and scowling faces. Of those two options... Ren might prefer the dragon. She slid down the muddy bank and crouched beside the river, trailing her hands in the ice-cold water. Droplets flew up around her wrists, catching in the sunlight like diamonds tossed into the air. It isn't fair, she thought, yanking a weed up from between the river pebbles. Why did they pick me out of everyone in the village? Why did the dragon send a vision saying they wanted to eat me? I bet they didn't, Ren cried. I bet the dragons don't even care. She plucked a rock from the riverbed and threw it at a bush on the opposite bank. They'd eat anyone they found all tied up. If they could choose, they'd pick someone bigger and yummier than me. Like Camellia. She would make a much better sacrifice to the dragons. Why didn't they pick her? Everyone was always saying how sweet Ren's next oldest sister was. 
She'd be so oily and sugary, the dragons could choke on her. But the dragon mancers loved Camellia, and the way she listened to them with her eyes wide and her fake, this is so fascinating, face on. Ren stared into the rippling water. The dragon mancers would never choose Camellia, she said out loud. They chose me because they don't like me, and mother and father let them. Of course the dragon mancers chose the loud seven-year-old who kicked Master Trout in the shins when he scolded her, the girl who stole their books and read all their secrets, even if she only half understood them. They'd be happy to get rid of her. And maybe mother and father were too. Nobody tried to stop them at all. Not one stupid person in the whole village. She knew her parents were terrified of dragons and did everything the dragon mancers said all the time. But she still would have thought they might say, could you double check that vision one more time? Are you sure it's our daughter the dragons want? Ren rubbed her eyes angrily. Stop crying. So people are terrible and can't be trusted. That shouldn't be such a big surprise, Ren. They've never stood up for you before. Nobody cares about you and so you shouldn't care about them either. Well, I think I shall not get eaten, she thought. That will show them. I don't need a village, or parents, or any of them. I'm smarter than all of them, and smarter than the dragons too. I don't have to be someone's breakfast if I decide not to be, so there. But that meant she couldn't go home. She could never go back to Talisman now that the dragon mancers had told everyone her destiny was to be dragon food, and her parents had said, Sure, that sounds right. Fine by us. She stood up, shaking the freezing droplets off her hand, and a flicker of motion caught her eye on the opposite riverbank. Instantly she crouched, her heart bursting into a gallop and screaming, Dragon! Even as her mind registered that the animal, whatever it was, couldn't be much bigger than a rabbit. She took a deep breath. It's something little. Maybe my breakfast. She kept her eye on the spot where she'd seen it, but the movement had stopped. Cautiously, she slipped into the cold river and splashed across. The other side was rockier, covered in glassy black stones and small tangles of little leafless shrubs. The thing she'd seen was caught in one of those nets of branches that leaned out over the river. She crept toward it slowly. A rabbit would be great. Breathe, Ren. Don't panic. It's certainly not a dragon. It was a dragon. Or at least, it was a very small, pathetic, skinny miniature of a dragon. Its scales were the palest orange she'd ever seen, like a sunset painted on wool and then left under a waterfall, or out in the sunlight for too long. She'd never seen a dragon so pale before. All the ones in the mountains were bright reds or oranges, and the ones that came up from the swamps were shades of mud brown. Its eyes were closed, and it hung limply in the tangled bare branches, its wings drooping toward the river. Probably dead, Ren thought, and was surprised to feel a twinge of pity. For a dragon. What was that about? Feeling sorry for something that would probably eat her if it were still alive. Then again, it wouldn't be able to fit much of her in that tiny mouth. It would take it days to nibble off her pinky finger. She snorted, and the baby dragon distinctly flinched. It was alive. Hey, she said fiercely. Dragon baby, are you faking being dead? so that I'll come up close and poke you and then you can eat my finger. The little creature's eyes fluttered slowly open. It glanced around, spotted Wren, and let out a squeak of alarm. She realized that it was shivering. She wasn't sure if that was from the cold water or because it was scared of her. A dragon scared of me? I bet that's never happened to any of the stuffy, mean old dragon mancers. Wait. This dragon can't possibly be cold. It's a sky dragon. They all have fire inside them. It could burn up that bush in a second and fly away if it wanted to. This is a trick, isn't it? She said, 
You want me to go, oh, poor baby, and try to set you free, and then you'll set me on fire and eat me. I see what you're up to, little weird dragon. The dragon tried to twist itself one way and then another, but it was too snarled in the branches to wiggle free. It let out another pitiful squeak, its minuscule claws opening and closing on the air. It sounded like the kitten Wren's brother had once found in the woods, which their parents wouldn't let them keep because they wouldn't be able to keep it quiet if there were dragons hunting overhead. That kitten will be the death of us all, was how they'd put it, in typical overdramatic grown-up fashion. Squeak, the little dragon said pathetically. Squirble. Eek. Stop being cute and tragic, Wren said, crossing her arms. I'm not falling for it. The baby dragon sighed, closed its eyes, and stopped wiggling. Its wings drooped, and its head flopped sideways. It looked like it had given up, and was planning on lying there in the bush until it starved to death. Oh, fire butts, Wren said crossly. All right, fine. But if you eat even one of my fingers, I am throwing you in the river, and I won't feel bad about it. She clambered out across the stones, feeling the cold water eddy around her bare feet. The branches kept stabbing her as she tried to reach through them, so she started breaking them off and tossing them aside until she had cleared a path to the little dragon. It opened its eyes again and blinked at her in either hope or alarm. She wasn't entirely sure. Its face was more expressive than a lizard's, but still not at all human. What am I doing? Wren muttered. But she reached through the sharp web of sticks and carefully untangled the little dragon's wings, tail, and claws until it slipped free and tumbled into her hands. She jumped back, holding it at arm's length. It was still trembling, sending little shudders through her whole body. And now she could feel that it actually was very cold. She'd obviously never touched a dragon before but she would have guessed that they'd be warm or even burning hot, given the fire inside them. This one was so different, though. Its eyes were pale, watery blue, like a frosted over puddle. It nudged her thumb with its snout and tried to bury its head between her fingers. Cautiously, she brought it closer to her. It immediately latched tiny claws in the weave of her dress and stuck its nose under her chin shivering tragically. Why are you all alone? Wren asked it. And why are you so cold? She ran one hand gently along its side, and it leaned into her palm with a whimper. She'd always thought dragons would feel kind of scaly and slimy, like fish, but blisteringly hot. Instead, the dragonette's skin was more like a lizard's, smooth and cool, and a little pebbly, especially the softer scales under its chin and wings. Wren touched one of the wings softly with two fingers, and the dragon unfolded it to rest in the palm of her hand. She was pretty sure this dragon wouldn't eat her. It looked as if it wanted a mommy more than a meal, or at least something warm to curl up against. Do dragons take care of their babies? Does it have a mommy somewhere nearby? Wren realized she had no idea. She'd been told to avoid mother bears with their cubs and not to take baby birds out of their nests. But the only thing she really knew about dragons was to hide if you heard one coming. Well, if you do have a mommy somewhere, she wasn't taking very good care of you, Wren said. She patted the little dragon's head. Don't feel too bad. Mine is very, very terrible too. She felt a stab of deep, Lonely sadness trying to sneak into her heart, but she shoved it back down under her anger. A roar suddenly split the sky overhead, and Wren ducked into a crouch. The dragonette clutched her in a panic, trying to burrow into her armpit. Calm down, Wren barked, although her heart was pounding like an avalanche. Now she could hear wing beats coming closer, and she was still out in the open here beside the river. She wrapped her arms around the baby dragon and bolted toward the trees. Dark green leaves enveloped them as she tumbled into the first large bush she saw and pressed herself against the trunk. 
Through the cracks between the fan-shaped leaves, she saw a rust-colored dragon soar overhead. Its yellow eyes glittered as it swung its head back and forth, studying the ground. The air crackled with heat, and tiny flames curled from its nose. It's hunting, Ren thought, her heart going even faster. This is the dragon who would be snapping me up right now if I hadn't gotten out of those ropes. She squinted through the leaves and noticed a mark on the dragon's face, an odd burn on its cheek that was smoking, as though it was brand new. Roar! The dragon in the sky bellowed. Roar! It sounded almost human, although that was a bonkers thing to say about a dragon's roar. But there was something about it that reminded Ren of her mom calling her name whenever Ren had a tantrum and went to hide in the trees. This dragon's roar was like that. It sounded mad and frantic and worried at the same time. Yeah, right, Ren thought. As if dragons can have that many complicated feelings. A roar is just a roar. It probably means, where's my dinner? Hungry now. And that's it. She wondered if dragons cared about their babies, or if they ever threw them out to die. Maybe they were actually better parents than humans. Maybe they fought to protect their kids. If my mom came back and called for me right now, would I go to her? Would I let her take me home if she said they'd made a mistake? No, Ren decided, because they could change their minds again tomorrow. Now I know they could throw me away any time for no reason, so they can never, never have me back. The baby dragon in her arms squeaked the tiniest squeak and wrapped its tail around her arm. Its face was completely hidden in the folds of her dress, and it was shivering again. Shh, Ren whispered. It won't hurt you, but it'll definitely eat me if it finds us. Another roar shook the leaves, and the baby dragon squeaked again, small and tragic. Unless, Ren thought for a moment. Do you know that dragon? She whispered. Is it the one that threw you in the river? She knew the baby dragon couldn't possibly understand her, but something about the way it trembled made her think the answer was yes. Was that its mother? Did she get rid of the baby and then change her mind? Or is she making sure it's really dead? Whoever it was, the baby was clearly scared of it. At least someone is looking for you, Ren thought, hugging the little dragon closer but I won't let them take you and hurt you again. The red dragon swooped around in another circle, glaring at the river, and then kept flying, following the river south and east toward the sea. Ren let out a breath and nudged the baby dragon's head up to look at her. It's gone, she said. I won't let it find you. We're safe. She glanced out at the vast, dangerous sky and the unfriendly wilderness that stretched all around them. Well, kind of, sort of safe. As safe as a seven-year-old and a baby dragon can be all alone in the mountains anyway. The tiny creature blinked its large, trusting eyes. Its trembling abruptly stopped, and it put one small paw on her hand, as if it was saying, Yes, I am safe now. Safe with you. Ren smiled at it. This was still a pretty terrible plan, saving a baby dragon who would probably eat her just as soon as it was big enough. But she suddenly didn't care. She had a feeling someone had decided to toss aside this baby dragon exactly the way her parents and her whole stupid village had thrown her away. People are awful and untrustworthy and mean, so I'm going to make friends with a dragon instead. My dragon is way better than any person I know, so there. We don't need anybody else, right, little dragon? Ren said, stroking one of its tiny ears. If they don't want us, we don't care. We can look after each other, can't we? The dragon squeaked again. Even though it couldn't understand her, it was still a better listener than literally everyone in her village. I'm Ren, she said. Do you have a name? It's probably something like Rar Glorf, isn't it? 
squeak, said the dragon. Well, I can't call you squeak, she said. When you're big enough to eat me, I'm pretty sure you won't like that name very much. She ran her fingers lightly over his smooth scales, the color of the palest sunset over the mountains. I think you're a mountain dragon, even though your color is a little wrong. How about Sky? I kind of like the name Sky. The baby dragon poked its snout into the center of the palm of her hand and made a little snortling sound. Ren giggled. I think that was a yes. Hello, Sky. When you grow up, will you burn down my village for me? Especially the dragon mancer's houses? That'll show them. I'm going to grow up on my own just fine and then come back and be like, ha, I did not get eaten by dragons and now my pet dragon is going to eat you. Take that. Ren lifted Sky to her shoulder where he curled around her neck, closed his eyes and fell into a peaceful sleep. She had no more family, no village, no people to take care of her. She knew she could never trust a human again. But she didn't need any of those things. She had a dragon of her own, and she was going to be better than fine. Together, she and Skye were going to be amazing. Chapter 2 Leaf one could say that Leaf did not like dragons, but it would be more accurate to say he hated them with a fiery, burning passion. He'd disliked them from the moment he was told, no, you cannot play outside today, the dragons are restless. His entire life was all about rules for avoiding dragons, placating dragons, hiding from dragons, not annoying dragons. He couldn't go anywhere or do anything without a dozen warnings about the dragons. And if he was ever a minute late getting home or played too long with his friends after school, his parents would think he'd been eaten and lose their minds. It was stressful, and it was frustrating. And he couldn't even argue that they were overreacting because people from the village of Talisman did get eaten sometimes. But he didn't want to live like a scared rabbit forever. He didn't want to become one of the grown-ups who were always yelling at kids for being too loud or hiding all wrong. He didn't want to spend his whole life just trying not to be dragon food. Follow the rules, his mother said. The rules will keep you safe. Do exactly what you're told. Listen to the dragon mancers. Never, ever, ever, ever be disobedient. Disobedient children get eaten his father would agree. We are always in danger, do you understand? It's a dangerous world. Dragons everywhere. It's a miracle we've even lived this long. We'll probably all get burned up in our beds tomorrow. This would always make Leaf's little sister roll her eyes and whisper, well, how are we supposed to avoid that by following the rules? Is there a rule about sleeping in less flammable pajamas? Ren didn't even try to follow all the rules. Leaf would run straight home from school and then turn around to discover that his sister had been distracted along the way by an extra adorable chipmunk or she'd heard a weird noise in the woods and gone to investigate. You don't go toward the weird noises, their father would shout. Or she'd thought of a new question for the dragon mancers and gone to bother them. The impertinence, their mother would say through gritted teeth. You don't ask questions. No one speaks to the dragon mancers without permission, least of all nosy little girls. Leaf thought it was amazing. He wished he were as brave as Ren was, or rather, he wished he could even think of the disobedient things that seemed to come very naturally to her. His other four sisters, all of them older, had no trouble following the rules and staying out of the dragon mancers' way. It was only the little one who gave his father heartburn and made his mother so furious. I'm not sure what's worse, the dragons or the dragon mancers, Ren would say. At least the dragons aren't bossing us around every single minute of every single day. But the summer leaf turned eight, he discovered the answer. The dragons were worse. The dragons were the very worst creatures in the entire world. His uncle had taken leave hunting, 
which was a rare treat, even if they had to hide under bushes every few steps, because everything sounded like approaching wing beats. He returned late that night, tired and itching from the grass and wood bits all over his skin, and his parents informed him that his little sister was gone. Gone? Leaf echoed, puzzled. She ran away again? Once, she'd disappeared for an entire day, then reappeared the next morning with a grin on her face and twigs in her hair, saying she just wanted to see what it would be like to live on her own in the forest with no rules. She'd lost all three of her toys for a month because of that, and Leaf had secretly carved her a little wooden snail to replace them. No, dear, his mother said, looking more tense than he'd ever seen her, which was saying something. She wandered off and got eaten by dragons. Leaf felt like he was in a story, but the wrong story, one he'd stumbled into by accident, where very dramatic, sad things were happening to someone, but of course, that couldn't be him. She wouldn't, he said. You're wrong. Dragons wouldn't dare eat Wren. His father let out a shaky laugh. That is what she would say, he said. But as I'm always telling you, death could swoop down at any moment. We should all be more scared. She should have been more scared, he finished mournfully. It was really her own fault, Leaf's mother pointed out. You know how disobedient she was. She brought this on herself. She had her hands wrapped tightly together, as if she was pressing her feelings flat and thin between them. But you won't get in that kind of trouble, Leaf's father said, patting Leaf's shoulder anxiously. You'll keep being a good boy and following the rules, and you'll be quite safe, won't you? You won't end up like her. You understand why we need to be terrified all the time. Leaf looked around the room, blinking. Ren's toy snail was still perched on the windowsill. Keeping watch for dragons? He'd asked. No, planning his amazing escape, she'd answered. But her favorite doll was now in a basket with Camellia's other toys. That was the thing that made it real. Ren would never stand for that if she were here. What was he feeling? Was he terrified, as his father said he should be? I'm not, Leaf said, shoving his father's hand away. I'm not scared. I'm, I think I'm mad. Why aren't you mad? At your sister, his father said. Well, I suppose I'm a little. No, Leaf shouted. At the dragons who ate her. Voices down his mother said sternly. No yelling, not ever. You know it's forbidden. Do you want dragons to find us and eat us too? His father demanded. Maybe I want them to try, Leaf said, so I can punch them in the face. It doesn't do any good to be mad at the dragons, his mother said, in her only grown-ups know anything voice. They're just wild animals catching prey like any other creature. We don't get mad at bears or sharks or raccoons, after all. Because raccoons don't swoop out of the sky and burn up entire villages, Leaf cried. If sharks could fly and breathe fire, I think we could get mad at them sometimes, too. Plus, also, we don't have bear mancers and shark mancers and raccoon mancers. We only have dragon mancers. And isn't that because dragons are supposed to be all smart and mystical and magic? I mean, what are the dragon mancers even for if they can't keep our village safe? His parents exchanged a weird look. Maybe if your sister had listened to the dragon mancers instead of annoying them all the time, his mother started, then stopped herself with visible effort. They do keep us safe his dad said hurriedly. That's how any of us have survived this long. Most of us are still here, aren't we? That's thanks to our three dragon mancers. We should be grateful, his mother added. And obedient and respectful. Very respectful. Don't disrespect them, Leaf. They do such important work. But they failed, Leaf cried. 
They were supposed to protect us, and they didn't. They're stupid liars. He was crying now, and he didn't care how loud he was, or whether the entire village and all the dragons on the mountain could hear him. Stop that. His mother grabbed his arm and crouched beside him, glancing into the corners of their hut, as though the dragon mancers might have buried little ears in the walls. Never, never speak that way of the dragon mancers. If you study hard and listen to your elders, maybe you'll be a dragon mancer one day, his father said. Then you'll know even more about how to stay safe. I don't want to study dragons, Leaf protested. I want to stab them with swords and shoot them with arrows and kill as many of them as I can. His parents both winced. That's ridiculous, said his mother, and unnecessarily violent. And we'll absolutely get you eaten, said his father, running his hand through his thin hair, so it stuck up like it couldn't believe what Leaf was saying either. No human has ever killed a dragon, his mother pointed out. It's not possible. You might as well walk into their cave and offer to be their lunch. It is too possible. Leaf's oldest sister suddenly offered from her hammock in the loft overhead. Leaf hadn't even realized she was up there, listening to them. Stay out of this, Rowan, their mother warned. You've had a long day, and you're only barely in our good graces right now. Rowan rolled out of the hammock and crouched to gaze down at them. Her voice was innocent, but defiant at the same time. I think Leaf should know about the dragon slayer, that's all. Leaf's skin tingled all over just hearing the word. Dragon slayer. A slayer of dragons. That was the exact thing he wanted to be. Someone who protected good people from terrible monsters, not by chanting mumbo jumbo and talking about visions but by doing something. The dragon slayer is just a myth, their father said. Rowan, please, don't cause any more trouble. He is not a myth. My friend Grove says it's all true, Rowan insisted. Grove's family used to live in the indestructible city, and they had wandering travelers come through all the time, and some of them had even met the dragon slayer. A real dragon slayer? Someone who's still alive? Who is it? Leaf asked. Rowan, do not put ideas in your brother's head, their mother warned. It's not an idea, it's a fact, Rowan said. She sat down and swung her legs over the edge of the loft. Her hair was partly squashed from lying in the hammock, but her dark brown eyes were intense and hypnotic. Leaf would always remember this moment and the look on his sister's face as he heard about the dragon slayer for the first time. The dragon slayer was only a young man, but he was determined to fight to free his people, and so he rode far out into the desert one night, she said, in a low storyteller voice. He crept right inside the lair of the sand dragon queen, and he fought a great battle with her, and the blood sprayed, and the scales flew until finally he cut off her head and stole all her treasure and rode back home, triumphant. Really? Leaf breathed. No, not really, his mother snapped. Utter nonsense, like we said. He brought the venomous tail of the dragon queen back with him as proof, Rowan said, still using her eerie voice. The treasure made him the wealthiest man in the entire world. Rich, powerful, dangerous. The slayer of dragons, the hero of men. Yes, Leaf cried, caught up in the story. And he saved everybody. Stop mesmerizing your brother, their mother yelled. She threw a dish towel at Rowan, breaking the spell. If the dragon slayer were real, the dragons would have caught him and eaten him by now to get their treasure back. And you're leaving out the part about the partner he left behind, father added. Doesn't sound so heroic when you think about that, does it? Aha, Leaf shouted. So you know this story, it is true. Mother gave father an exasperated look. No, 
she said. That's in the myth. It's a fairy tale that only brainless families tell their children. I'm going to be a dragon slayer too, Leif said stoutly. I'm going to be a hero of men and kill dragons to save people just like him. He seized a stick of firewood and brandished it around the house, jabbing at the furniture. No, his mother said firmly. Slaying dragons is absolutely against the rules. The dragon mancers forbid it, and I forbid it too. Rowan, what have you done? Leif's father said piteously. Serves you right, and you know why, Rowan called as she climbed back into her hammock. Don't you want to be a dragon mancer? Father pleaded, intercepting Leif and trying to take the stick away. Leif ducked under his arm and darted across the room. Wise and respected and extremely knowledgeable about dragons. From a distance. There's no need to fight dragons, Mother agreed. We can appease them and keep them away from us if we just follow the dragon mancer's rules. No, their horrible rules didn't save Wren, Leif declared. It's not fair that dragons get to eat people we love, and we can't do anything about it. He clambered to the top of the tallest stool and stabbed his pretend sword toward the ceiling. I won't be scared of them. I swear on this sword. One day, every little sister in the world will be safe, because I shall be the next and greatest dragon slayer of them all. Chapter 3 Ivy. Mommy, is Daddy famous? All the people at the party tonight were acting like he's maybe famous. Yes, he's very famous, dear. Probably the most famous person in the world. Because he's the boss of everyone? Or because he did a dragon stare a long, long, long time ago? Dragon slayer, Ivy, yes. Well, Partly because he's the lord of the town, but mostly because he's the only dragon slayer alive today. And it wasn't that long ago. I thought Uncle Stone Dragon stared too. Slayer, Ivy. No, Uncle Stone didn't slay the dragon. He was just there when it happened. What does slay mean? It means Daddy poked the dragon very hard until it fell over and didn't get up again. Mommy? I know about hunting. You mean, like the way you poke squirrels and rabbits with arrows to get us dinner? Yes, sort of. But he didn't eat the dragon afterward. Why not? Humans don't eat dragons, silly bean. Also, he kind of had to run away in a hurry from the other dragons. Other dragons? Why didn't Daddy Slayer them too? There were quite a lot of them, Ivy and dragons are very big. I want to see a dragon. No, you don't. We're safe down here, far away from all the dragons. Your father keeps us all safe. Why was Uncle Stone yelling at Daddy about running away from the dragons? Did he want Daddy to slay all of them? No, your uncle just gets sad sometimes, and then he thinks about that night and gets upset. Why upset? I'll tell you when you're older, Ivy. Mommy? Ivy, go to sleep. Were the other dragons mad at Daddy? I think maybe slaying a dragon is not very nice. I bet that dragon did not like getting poked until it fell over and couldn't get up again. It's an animal, Ivy. It doesn't have feelings. And your father is a hero. Now, shh. Mommy? Mommy. Mommy, you know how Daffodil has a pet rabbit? Do you think I could have a pet dragon? No, Ivy. Ivy was born in the hidden city of Valor, years after the dragons burned their village to cinders and tried to hunt them all into extinction. She spent her childhood in the cramped tunnels that the survivors and dragon slayer followers had hollowed out of the earth, the only place where the dragons couldn't find them. Of course, in her dad's version of the epic tale, the decimated village and vengeful dragons rarely came up. Instead, 
He talked about the obsidian-tipped sword he'd found, and how he drove it into the dragon's eye. He described the yellow dragon's fierce roar and the fire that scorched the sand around them as they fought, and he rolled up one sleeve to show the burn scars that covered half his body. Sometimes, if the dragon slayer's fans gave him enough to drink, he'd talk about the treasure, the gold, the glittering gems, the weight of the lazulite dragon in his hands. His eyes would blur as he described the treasure, the one thing in his life he'd ever truly loved. But his favorite part of the story, the part he never skipped, was boasting about cutting off the poisonous tip of the dragon's tail. He'd bring people over to see it day or night, even long after bedtime, even people who'd already seen it a thousand times. It sat preserved in a glass box in the family's living room and gave Ivy nightmares. The other girls in Ivy's class refused to sleep over at Ivy's after Violet said, what if one day it comes to life? And then Daffodil said, or a whole other dragon grows out of it, like how lizards can grow back from their tails? And Violet said, or what if one of us accidentally sleepwalks into it and gets all poisoned? And all the other girls went, ooh. Ivy thought these were quite reasonable fears. It really was the creepiest room decoration ever. It had a dark crust of blood along one edge and a barb gleaming with venom that curled like a scorpion's stinger. She didn't understand why anyone would want to look at it even once, let alone keep it in a fancy box on a tapestry-covered pedestal where one's daughter would have to see it every day. Sleeping over at the other girls' caves instead was more than all right with her. She was always invited. Everyone wanted to be friends with the dragon slayer's daughter. She was practically a princess of the underground city. But even the lord's daughter was never allowed outside. She rarely saw the sun, and she had to imagine the wind. Her bedtime story was the same every night. Once upon a time, a mighty hero went forth into the desert and slayed the sand dragon queen. Ivy's mother would stare dreamily at the flame of the oil lamp as she spoke, stroking Ivy's hair. He battled bravely into the night until she lay dead on the sand, and then he galloped home with the greatest treasure the world has ever seen. Where is the treasure now? Ivy asked when she was four, and again when she was five, and even more often when she was six. Can I see it? Shh, her mother would whisper. No one can see it. It's in a secret place. That he's my dad, Ivy pointed out. Daffodil says it's weird that he has a big shiny treasure, but I never get to see it. Daffodil says maybe it doesn't exist at all, or maybe he lost it or something. Daffodil says I should hold my breath until you let me see it, but I practiced, and it gave me a super big headache so I'm gonna not do that. Daffodil has so many helpful thoughts, her mother observed. Have you seen the treasure, Mommy? Of course I have, she'd say, but there was a flicker in her placid expression that made Ivy wonder. Mother always saw Father as a hero, even when he was snoring loudly in his hammock or complaining about the smell in their cave mansion which turned out to be coming from a pair of his wool socks that he'd stuffed under the rug and forgotten about. Mother repeated everything he said to anyone who would listen, even when she had to know some of it wasn't true. At around the age of six, Ivy started noticing all the things that weren't true. That was confusing enough. But what was even stranger was how nobody else seemed to notice or care. Like when her father told the citizens of Valor that he was going to expand the cave tunnels so there would be many safe and well-built ways to get to the underground lake. And then a year later, he pointed to the one tunnel that had always been there, the one mother and a team of other moms had dug out on their own years ago, and told everyone he had shored it up and made it safer and bigger and better. And everyone said that was amazing, and he was amazing and named it Dragon Slayer Way, even though it was exactly the same as before. Didn't everyone see it was exactly the same as before? 
Didn't they remember the women who'd worked so hard on it? Ivy was still only little, but she remembered carrying dirt in baskets when she was four years old, back and forth and back and forth in a line of children. She remembered her mother talking about how much safer it would be for everyone when they could get water without leaving the tunnels. She remembered her father rolling his eyes and scoffing at the silliness of the plan. But now he said it was his plan, and it was named after him, and everyone nodded and cheered, even Mother. It made Ivy wonder a little bit whether her brain was working all right. She wanted to ask questions, but questions always made her parents frustrated and grumpy with her, and her teachers only said things like, that's not in the curriculum, Ivy, or you'll understand when you're older, or why don't you sit quietly and do another math work slate, dear? When she was seven, she had a sweet teacher named Miss Laurel, and she thought maybe she'd try again. She waited until recess, when the children were all sent to run to the underground lake and come back with a bucket of water, and then she approached the teacher shyly. Miss Laurel, can I ask you a question? Of course, Ivy. Miss Laurel was sitting on the floor trying to sew a tattered book's pages back together. She gave Ivy a smile that looked tired in the torchlight and patted the ground beside her. D did you hear my dad's speech last night? Ivy sat down and picked up a scrap of paper that had fluttered out of the book. In the great hall? Yes, everybody did. It was a mandatory gathering. Do you know what mandatory means? That everybody has to go except kids but Mother brought me anyway. Oh. Miss Laurel's forehead wrinkled. Oh, dear. She took Ivy's hand and squeezed it between hers. Did it scare you, sweetheart? Ivy thought about the flickering torches, the shouting crowd, the boy in the torn green uniform standing hunched beside her dad with his hands tied in front of him. Should it have been scary? Mother always brought her to banishments, Ivy usually fell asleep on her shoulder, wishing they could have had a normal bedtime instead. This time she'd stayed awake and listened, though. This time, she sort of knew the boy in trouble. He was one of the nice wing watchers who brought peaches to the school after outdoor patrols. Daffodil said he had cute hair and she was going to marry him one day. I guess it was mostly confusing, Ivy said. I didn't understand what Daddy was saying. He was saying that Pine was a danger to the community, Miss Laurel said gently. Pine went to the old village and scavenged in the ruins. If any dragons had been watching, he could have led them right back to us. Ivy took a deep breath. But Daddy goes to the old village all the time, she said in a rush. Miss Laurel's face did something strange like all her expressions were falling off of it at once, so it looked like a mask for a moment. I'm sure that's not the case, she said finally. He does, Ivy said. He brings things back, spoons and horseshoes and a little ball for me and other stuff. Miss Laurel patted her head. Aren't you lucky to have such a brave father to take care of you? But, Miss Laurel, why can my dad go there whenever he wants? But Pine went there once, and now he's banished from Valor forever. Perhaps you've misunderstood where he goes, dear. Anyway, he's the dragon slayer and lord of Valor. They're his laws, so he can't possibly break them. That doesn't seem fair, Ivy said. And he told the wing watchers to go looking for iron. Aren't the ruins a smart place to look? But the law. I think Daddy made up the law after Pine went there, Ivy said firmly. Miss Laurel stood up and dusted off the book she'd been working on. That's silly, Ivy. You'll learn more about how laws and lords work when you're older. Now, you'd better hurry if you want to have time to play after you get your bucket of water. Ivy sighed. Miss Laurel was just like the other grown-ups after all. She ducked through the classroom door into the tunnel outside and made it about three steps before she was suddenly seized and dragged into a different classroom. Hey, she yelped. Shh, 
Daffodil covered Ivy's mouth with her hands. As always, her long dark hair was tied into pigtails with bright yellow scraps of fabric, which matched her bee pollen yellow tunic. Ivy had once heard her mother say that Daffodil's mother dressed her like that so everyone would remember the sunny flower her daughter was named after, and then hopefully forget Daffodil's actual dreadfully strong personality. Ivy realized the violet was in the otherwise empty classroom as well, sitting on one of the tables carved from the rock and blinking owlishly. Violet and Daffodil were the loudest girls in her year and best friends, whenever they weren't absolutely furious with each other. Daffodil practically vibrated with energy when she had to sit still, and Violet made up all the best pretend games. Ivy's mother often said, Those two are not my favorite children. But there were only so many kids Ivy's age in the underground city, so Mother couldn't exactly stop her from playing with them. We heard you talking to Miss Laurel, Daffodil said in a stage whisper that could have been heard on the far side of Valor. You heard her, Violet said. You made me go get all our water buckets. She waved one hand at three buckets of water lined up beside her. Wow, Ivy said. Did you carry all of those at the same time? Yes, Violet said matter-of-factly. I'm really strong. One day, I'm going to get super tall and lift the roof off the whole city, and then we won't be underground anymore, and it'll be very shiny and smell nice, and everyone will say, Thank you, Violet. You're so great. And I will say, You are so welcome. What else can I lift? No, they'll say thank you, Daffodil, because I was the one who even told you to do that in the first place, Daffodil said, putting her hands on her hips. No, Violet argued. I thought of it myself. You did not. It was my idea, Daffodil said. I said you could lift off the roof. I said it yesterday. But I thought of it the night before that. I just hadn't said anything about it yet. Ivy could see that this was nosediving into one of Daffodil and Violet's epic fights, which turned the whole classroom into a war zone at least once a week. She edged toward the door. I should maybe... Look, you're scaring her away, Daffodil said pouncing on Ivy and dragging her back into the classroom. I think you're scaring her away, Violet objected. Ivy, Daffodil said, heroically ignoring Violet, which Ivy knew from experience was quite nearly impossible. You were asking Miss Laurel questions about Pine. Yes, Ivy admitted. She tried to remember whether Daffodil had been at the banishment. She didn't think so. The bright yellow would have been hard to miss. Is he really gone? Daffodil said. Never ever to return? I think so, Ivy said. But why? Daffodil wailed, throwing herself to the ground. She flopped onto her back with one arm dramatically over her face. My life is ruined. Did your dad say he had to go let himself get eaten by dragons? Violet asked. No, Ivy said. He just said Pine had to leave and never come back. Hmm, Violet said. So, like, almost the same thing. Violet, you are so mean, Daffodil shouted. How dare you say my boyfriend will get eaten by dragons? He's not your boyfriend, Violet said. He is very old like 17 maybe even. But he could have been, when I grow up, if he wasn't banished forever. What did he do? Violet asked Ivy. Yeah, Daffodil said, sitting up abruptly. You told Miss Laurel your dad does the same thing all the time. Well, I thought so, Ivy said. But Miss Laurel said I must have misunderstood. That is such a grown-up thing to say, Violet said, rolling her eyes. Did you guys know that there's a law saying nobody's allowed to go to the old village? Ivy asked. What? No, there isn't, Violet said. What old village? 
Daffodil asked. The one the dragons burned down, Violet said impatiently. Where everybody used to live. I knew that, Daffodil barked. I meant, what do you mean? The old village, like, what law? It was a good question, shut up. Saying shut up is not nice at all, Violet said, turning up her nose. That's bullying. You're bullying me. No, you, Daffodil started, and Ivy hurriedly intervened. I never heard of a law like that before, she said. Me neither, said Violet. My dads work on laws and orders with your dad, and I know they've been to the old village. They brought me a half-burned doll and said maybe I could fix it to make it pretty. But that sounded boring. So instead, I pretend she's a furious ghost who haunts the ruins, waiting to get her revenge on the dragons. Yes, Daffodil cried, running to the wall and bouncing off it and running back and slicing the air with an imaginary sword. Fight me, dragons! But that's all Pine did. Ivy said. She would get through this conversation, no matter how easily distracted the other two were, and even if they didn't remember it for more than a day. She'd never tried telling other kids about the weird things that didn't line up in the world. Maybe they'd say something a grown-up had never said. Pine did what? Violet asked. Fight a dragon? Daffodil chimed in. No, no. He went to the old village. That's why he got banished. Because there's a law that says you can't. They stared at her for a long moment, the quietest Ivy had ever seen them. She waited for Daffodil to poke Violet in the stomach and run away giggling, or for Violet to explain why Ivy was wrong. That's not right, Violet said finally. There's no law like that which means someone made up an unfair reason to get rid of Pine. That's grown-up lying, which is worse than kid lying. I don't like that. Me neither, Daffodil agreed. Lies, she added, in a dramatic stage whisper, peering through her fingers. Ivy shivered, half in awe and half in terror. Nobody ever said the dragon slayer was lying. She realized she'd been kind of waiting for someone to say it out loud so that she wouldn't have to. But now that someone had, it felt stabby and bad in her insides. That was her father they were talking about. Maybe I'm wrong, though, Ivy said. Maybe it's a new law. I will find out, Violet said. I am excellent at thing finding out. But won't you get in trouble? Ivy asked anxiously. My parents yell at me when I try to find things out. Then I will yell back, said Daffodil. That is what I am excellent at. I think we should invite her to join the secret club, Violet said to Daffodil. Daffodil threw up her hands. What? You can't say that in front of her. That is so rude. What if I said no? You can't say no. Violet said inexorably. She already knows about it. She doesn't know what it's called, Daffodil said, crossing her arms. So are you going to say no? Violet asked. No, I'm saying yes, but it's not fair because I was thinking we should invite her except I was going to wait until she left the cave to ask you like a not rude person. Um. Should I leave the cave? Ivy asked. She was already in most of the secret clubs formed by the other seven-year-olds. It was actually surprising that she hadn't even heard of Violet and Daffodils. Maybe it was a very new club. But she guessed it would probably break up like all the others, probably faster because of how Violet and Daffodil fought all the time. Also, she wanted to go sit by herself for a moment to think about lies and why her dad would tell lies, if that was what they were, and why all the other grown-ups let him, when kids like Daffodil and Forrest got in huge trouble for their lies all the time. Nope, you're in, 
Welcome to the club, Violet said, reaching out her hand, which Daffodil knocked aside as she shouted, Welcome to the club, over her. Ivy didn't know whose hand to shake first without getting in trouble, so she used both her hands and shook theirs at the same time. It is a club about knowing things, Violet said solemnly. It is a club about secrets, so you have to promise to keep them, even when certain people are being very loud about everything. She glared at Daffodil. We're the only people in it, but it is not a club about excluding people, Daffodil said, apparently missing Violet's veiled jab. Except Daisy because she is very, very annoying and I hate her. Daisy was Daffodil's older sister, age nine, and as far as Ivy could tell, a perfectly pleasant, quiet person. Don't say hate, Violet said. That is a mean word. Fine, said Daffodil. I loathe her. What is the club called? Ivy asked, trying to head off another argument. We are the truth seekers, Violet said. Maybe it was the hushed, somber voice she said it in, or maybe it was just the exact words Ivy wanted to hear at that moment, but something about it felt right and good and much more important than the other secret clubs. I hope it doesn't fall apart too quickly, she thought. She'd never wanted a secret club to last before. She usually just went along with whatever the others were playing. We will find out the truth about Pine, Daffodil said, matching Violet's solemn tone. We will find out the truth about everything. Everything, Ivy thought, as the other two touched their hands to their foreheads and then to hers, and then to each other's, and then made her do the same to them. Truth that other people don't know. Why Pine was really banished. Why her dad told lies to the people of Valor. And if he was lying about one thing, what else had he lied about? The treasure had to be real. Her dad was a lord now, and the severed dragon tail was definitely real. But had he left anything out? Were there lies buried in his story about the dragons? In everything he said about dragons? On the way home from school that day, Ivy borrowed a Wing Watcher's dragon guide from the library. And that night, she studied the drawings as if she'd never seen them before. Mud dragons, sand dragons, ice dragons. Each of them were painted with little tiny scales the color of gems. Sapphire blue, tangerine orange, diamond white. And their faces, their faces looked so intelligent. Maybe daddy didn't have to slay that dragon, Ivy thought. This was a forbidden thought. The dragon slayer was a hero. That was the story of valor in one sentence. She traced one finger along the shimmering wings of the rainforest dragon. In the drawings, it had the kindest face, which was a silly thing to say about animals that would eat you in a heartbeat, but it still felt true to Ivy. Maybe some of the dragon slayer's story is a lie too, she thought feeling the danger of even thinking the words to herself. I wonder how the dragons would tell it, if they could tell their own stories. Chapter 4 Wren Wren would never say there was something wrong with her baby dragon. He was a million percent perfect, and she'd bite anyone who said he wasn't, if there was anyone around to try it but she had to admit, he was kind of a weird little guy. For one thing, he loved animals, in a sort of adorably obsessive way. His favorite was snails. Anytime he spotted one, he would throw himself to the ground nearby and stare at it with wide eyes, watching the little antennae slowly blorb in and out. He could watch snails inch around under the grass for an entire morning if Ren didn't make him get up and keep moving with her. In fact, snail was the first word she learned in dragon. He said it so often that she finally tried saying it back to him, 
which he found delightfully hilarious. As they walked, he'd sit on her shoulder and point and chatter at every bird, as though each one was the newest, shiniest, most amazing thing he'd ever seen. He freaked out with joy when ladybugs landed on him, and he moped for days when squirrels ran away at the sight of him. It also made him a completely useless hunting partner. The first time Wren brought Skye a rabbit that she'd managed to bring down with a slingshot, he gently stroked its fur for a moment, and then he burst into tears. Tears? She hadn't even known dragons could cry, much less over food. Baby Skye, she said, as he blubbered into her skirt. You very silly dragon. You must have eaten meat before. I thought dragons only ate meat. He clambered up her lap and onto her shoulder, still boo-hoo-hooing, and buried his cold nose in her hair. Another tear dropped off his snout and slid down her neck. Did they give it to you already cooked? She asked. Is that why this is weird? Because you can tell it used to be a rabbit? <laughs> the dragon snuffled. Well, if you won't eat it, I will she said. But you have to eat something. She emptied her pockets of the nuts and berries she'd scavenged while hunting. Skye leaped off her shoulder and pounced on them, gobbling all the fruit first. Such a strange, small dragon, she said, tugging on his ears affectionately. He made a noise somewhere between a purr and a growl. On the plus side, if you won't eat a rabbit, then I think you probably also won't eat me. What do you think? Are my fingers safe? He agreed, or disagreed, or burped. She wasn't quite sure what any of his noises meant yet. She'd kind of been hoping he could roast the rabbit for her and save her some work, but Skye showed no sign of setting anything on fire. He never had smoke rising from his nostrils, the way the dragons flying overhead did. He never sneezed out bursts of flame, although he did sneeze quite a lot for a while after his time in the river. He never even breathed heat, not even on the coldest nights when they both really needed it. And still, it took Ren over a year to figure it out. For a long time, she thought he just didn't want to, or that maybe he was sick from the cold river and needed to get better before his fire came back. And then for a while, she guessed that baby dragons must hatch without fire and grow the ability to make it later. But eventually something happened that made her realize that Skye was different from other dragons. They had been slowly working their way south that whole first year together, intending to get far away from Wren's village and the mountain dragon's palace. Skye was a slow traveler, partly due to all the snail-watching stops, but Wren was in no particular hurry once they were outside her village's usual hunting area. Wren was hoping the winters would be easier if they came down from the mountains, but when they followed the river toward the sea, they found themselves in a vast marshy swampland where there were literally dragons hiding in the mud everywhere. After three close encounters with teeth surging up out of the swamp, Wren and Skye retreated back to the mountain foothills in a hurry. Wren kind of remembered the map she'd found in the Dragon Mancer's books, although it was sketchy and mostly unhelpful, and every empty space on it had been labeled, Here Be Dragons, which made her want to yell, Oh, really? Why, thank you, Mr. Obvious Map Maker. From that map, she knew there was a desert west of the mountains, but she didn't really know what that meant. She'd never seen a desert, or met anyone who had. But Skye seemed to think it was worth a try, so they crossed the mountains through a pass during the warmest part of the year. From what she could tell of the seasons, Wren thought she might have turned eight by now. She didn't know how fast dragonets grew, but Skye was probably a year old at least. The pass channeled them up and up a winding canyon for days on end, finally ejecting them onto an outlook with a view of the far western horizon. Deserts, it turned out, were big and wide and flat and terrifying, if you asked Wren. Sand, 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 as far as the eye could see, and almost nothing else. Hmph, Wren said, 
crossing her arms and glaring at it. Humph, Sky agreed. He'd started imitating several of her noises, especially her grumpy ones, which was extremely cute. But she didn't want him to lose his own language, because she wanted to learn it too. Imagine being the only person in the world who spoke dragon. Besides, her mouth seemed to work better with dragon sounds than his did with human ones. Look, yuck, she said in dragon, pointing at the endless desert. That was the closest she could get to saying, there's no way we can live out there. What a dreadful place. There's absolutely nowhere to hide from the sand dragons, and we'd probably boil to death on the first day. Yuck, Sky agreed, lashing his tail furiously. Too big, too hot. And then he added a few more unintelligible dragon growls. Ren looked north, mountains curving away into the distance, and south, where she saw a waterfall pouring out of one of the cliffs. But there were no clues about which way was safest, no sign saying, excellent home for wandering girl and dragon here. She sighed. The one thing she missed about living in a village was having things to read. She didn't miss a single one of the stupid, awful, treacherous people. Maybe Leaf. Don't think about Leaf. But she missed stories she could bury herself in, or piles of new facts about something she didn't know. The village school had only had a few books, and she'd zipped through them all before she turned six. That's why she'd stolen the ones from the dragon mancers, because she'd been so desperate to read something new. But at least new books came to Talisman now and then, sold by wandering tradesfolk, or sometimes someone would write a new one. Out here in the wilderness, she hadn't seen a book in forever, and she missed reading so much, it felt like half her soul was curled in a corner, waiting to be brought back to life. Plus, it would be ever so useful to have a new book with a map in it to consult right about now. She knew the indestructible city was farther south and east, between the next big river and the swamps, but the dragon mancer's map was all question marks and tree doodles and here be dragons beyond that. Maybe we could go to the indestructible city and steal a map, she said to Skye in her own language, which she was starting to call human in her head. I don't want to talk to anyone, but if we could get in and out without being noticed... I could steal something to read, too. On the other hand, the indestructible city was the most well-fortified human settlement in the world. So, maybe not the best place to try to rob. Rrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
I guess we can at least try heading toward the indestructible city. If it looks too alarming, we can go right past it. That night, as they made their way over a large, rocky plateau, Sky nudged Ren and pointed to their left. A faint orange light was coming from behind one of the boulders. Ren dropped to the ground, making herself as small as she could. Sky did the same beside her. They listened for a long, still moment, waiting to see if the light moved. It didn't, but Ren thought she heard distant growls. She glanced at Sky and saw his ears pricked toward the sound. We run away, she whispered in dragon. He shook his head. Want to see. He almost never argued with her, especially about which direction to go or how fast. So she nodded and followed him as they crawled quietly toward the light. It turned out to be coming from a hole in the rocks, along with a thin wisp of smoke. There must be a cave underneath them, Ren realized, and someone down there had built a fire. Sky wriggled to the edge and peeked over, blinking as smoke wafted into his face. Ren stretched out on her stomach next to him. There were dragons down below. Could be worse, Ren thought, propping her chin on her hands. Could be humans. She counted four small dragons galloping around the cave, chirping and roaring and wrestling one another. Another was curled on an outcropping, holding something in his claws. Something that rustled and rolled like paper, which he had his snout buried in with a riveted expression. Is he reading that? Ren thought with surprise. Dragons can read? Sky was probably too little to have learned to read Dragon before she found him. She wondered if she could teach him to read her language. Hang on, she thought. All of those dragons are different colors. She squinted. The firelight and the fuzz of smoke made it difficult to tell at first, but she was pretty sure she could see five different sets of scales. Yellow, blue, green, black, and brown. The only one that was familiar was the brown, which matched the mahogany scales they'd seen on some of the swamp dragons. None of them were red or orange, like the dragons Ren was used to seeing. In the last year, she'd occasionally seen a few white ones flying overhead, and some that were a pale yellowish white, but neither of those were down there either. Are there really that many different kinds of dragon? And how can they all be together without killing each other? She'd thought the red dragons and the brown dragons were enemies. She'd assumed all the dragons fought with any others who looked different from them. But maybe they're actually friends. The baby dragons in the cave all looked happy enough to be together, even the black one, who kept making remarks in a scolding tone from his perch on the wall. Maybe dragons are better at getting along with each other than people are. This fit nicely with her current theory of the world, which was that dragons were better than people in every way, full stop. She glanced at Skye and saw the saddest look she'd ever seen on a baby dragon. It made her want to cuddle him and surround him with bunnies and snails. What's wrong? She whispered in dragon. He pointed to the biggest baby dragon, the brown one. It was playing with the others, but every now and then, it would stop to go back to the fire and breathe a few more flames on it, making sure it stayed alight. The little yellow dragon bounded up beside him and did the same, adding her tiny flames to his. The brown dragon nudged her aside and accidentally knocked her over, then looked comically alarmed when she bounced up and jumped on him. Immediately, the blue dragonette ran over and leaped on top of both of them, and they rolled for a while, yipping and roaring. A year ago, Ren would have thought those were roars of fury and that they might tear each other apart. But now she recognized the sounds Sky made sometimes. The little dragons were laughing. Ren didn't know the word in dragon for lonely. She didn't know how to ask whether Sky wished he had dragon friends like that instead of her. She did know she didn't like the feeling she had at that thought, as though something had bitten a large chunk out of her heart. You want to go there? 
she asked awkwardly, pointing down into the cave. She didn't know how to get him there. The hole for the smoke was too small even for a tiny dragon to fit through. But she'd help him search for another way in, if that was what he wanted. There must be an entrance to the cave somewhere nearby. And if Skye needed dragon friends, she'd help him find some, no matter how long it took. He gave her a puzzled expression. Me, there? Need dragons, she tried. Happy yum friends? Yum was obviously not the right word for this question, but it was the closest she could think of to something you love and want and are excited about. Sky wrinkled his snout and made a little snort chortling sound. Eat dragons, no thank you, he said. She tried one more time. Happy us, she said. More happy you them? To her surprise, tears suddenly appeared in his eyes. He leaned his long neck over and buried his face in her hair at the curve of her shoulder. No, 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 he mumbled. More, more, more happy you, me, us all the days. Ren's heart swelled. She slung one arm around his neck and hugged him closer. Are you sure? She whispered in her own language. You want to stay with me instead of joining other dragons like you? However much of that he understood, he nodded fiercely. Happy me, she whispered in dragon. A louder growling came from below them, and a full-grown red dragon suddenly swept into the cave. She knocked the wrestling dragonettes to the side and roared something at them as they scurried back against the walls. Ren saw the little emerald dragon sidle into a nook where she'd be out of the red dragon's line of sight. Sky gasped, a faint breath of air against Ren's cheek. He wiggled closer and stared at the red dragon. Ren wouldn't have recognized her, except that Sky started trembling like a leaf exactly the way he'd trembled the first day she held him, and she'd never forget that. The red dragon in the sky, searching the river. Could this be the same one? Ren waited until she turned her head, and yes, there was the burn scar she'd seen before, dark against the red scales. Who is that? She whispered to Sky. The closest she could come in dragon was, what called this? He mumbled something back that she didn't understand, but she didn't need words to see that he was still scared of the red dragon. Let's go, she said, crawling back from the hole. She stood up and lifted Sky into her arms, although he was getting too big and heavy for that. You're safe with me. Safe us. Sky snuggled into her arms and took a deep breath, in and out. Safe us. Ren kept walking for the rest of the night, long after Sky fell asleep on her shoulder, putting as much distance as she could between them and the mysterious cave of multicolored dragons. Whatever they were doing down there, and how all those different kinds of dragons had ended up together, she didn't need to know. It had nothing to do with her. All Sky needed was her, and all she needed was Sky. As the golden line of the sunrise appeared over the ridge to the east, Ren remembered the little dragons breathing flames on the fire. Those dragons had been a lot smaller than Sky, but they'd had no trouble breathing fire. It's not a dragon thing, she realized. It's a Sky thing. He doesn't have any fire. He's supposed to, but for some reason he doesn't. He wasn't sad about not having dragon friends. He was sad that he can't breathe flames like that. I bet that's why the red dragon threw him away. The mountain tribe didn't want a baby dragon with no fire. She was probably searching the river to make sure he'd really drowned. Poor little Sky. I'd love you with or without fire, she whispered to his snoring snout. You're perfect, just the way you are even if you are weirdly obsessed with snails. His eyes popped open, and he blinked at her. Snails? He chirped hopefully. Chapter 5 
Leaf. Leaf would not have guessed that his second favorite sister would turn out to be Rowan. She was the oldest, and she usually ignored her five, now four, little siblings, as though they were ants running about underfoot. She much preferred to be off with her friend Grove, hunting or fishing, and talking about whatever teenagers talked about. But one day, when he was nine, after he had asked her to tell him the Dragon Slayer's story for the 400th time, he came out of school and found her leaning against the schoolhouse wall, holding a thick book. Rowan, the teacher said, eyeing the book suspiciously. That's an unusual accessory for you. Or for anyone in our family, Leaf thought sadly, except Wren. I'm going to help Leaf study, Rowan said, with an air of innocence that struck Leaf as far more ominous than anything else. The teacher didn't seem to notice, though. Mother and father think he could be chosen to be a dragon mancer's apprentice. So naturally, I want to help prepare him. Behind the teacher's back, Leaf raised his eyebrows at her but she kept her gaze on the teacher and didn't crack. Hmm, I'm not sure your level of scholarship would be any use to him, the teacher said snippily. But if your parents are fine with it, I don't suppose I care. She turned and regarded Lee for a moment. Of course, if you are chosen to be a dragon mancer, dear boy, I hope you'll remember your real teacher fondly. She swept away down the path leaving Rowan and Leaf alone. Rowan burst into giggles as soon as she was out of earshot. Old toad, she said. Bet you shall be a lot nicer to you from now on, just in case you do end up a dragon mancer. Thanks, Leaf said, slightly awed by the sight of a grown-up being expertly manipulated by a 16-year-old. Are you really here to help me study? Yes, she said, but not this boring stuff. She dropped the book in her bag and beckoned him around to the back of the schoolhouse and then into the woods, weaving through the trees until the village buildings were out of sight. In a small clearing, she tossed her bag at the foot of a tree and scrambled into its upper branches. A moment later, two wooden swords fell with a clatter onto the grass. Oh, Leaf said, wide-eyed. What? Really? Rowan swung down out of the tree and put her fists on her hips, grinning. Well, if you're really going to slay a dragon one day, you'll probably need to practice a little first. You're going to teach me to fight? He cried. I'm going to train you to be a great warrior, she said, but only if you promise not to tell mother and father. As far as they know, we're studying for the dragon mancer exams. But then... Won't I have to take the Dragon Mancer exams? A sly look flitted across Rowan's face. Well, sure, but you won't actually pass them. Don't worry, hardly anyone does. They've had only six apprentices in the last ten years, remember? And I'm not sure they're learning anything besides how to fetch and carry and make goat cheese. The ones who've survived, that is. Leaf picked up one of the wooden swords and slashed it through the air. But I'm going to learn to be a great warrior. Ha! Hiya! Rule number one, Rowan said, eyeing him skeptically. Don't shout like a maniac and warn the dragon you're about to attack. I mean, seriously. From then on, they went into the forest and trained every day after school. It was hard work. Nowhere near as fun as following Wren around and listening to her notice things and complain about the village but it made Leaf feel like he was doing something, or at least getting ready to do something, something Ren would be proud of him for, if she were still here. And it helped him discover that Rowan was way more interesting than he'd expected. For one thing, she knew a lot about dragons. We think there are six or seven different kinds, she said one day, parrying his thrust. What? he said stumbling back. There's more than one kind? I thought they were all the same. Leaf, seriously. Haven't you noticed the difference between the swamp dragons and the mountain dragons? Their faces are different. Their scales are different. 
Grove says even their dens and castles are different, according to what he learned in the indestructible city. You said six or seven. What else is there besides the swamp kind and the mountain kind? There are desert dragons, like the one the dragon slayer killed. Arctic dragons, apparently, who live in the ice and snow. And ocean dragons, who live under the sea, we're pretty sure. He shuddered. He'd only seen the ocean from a distance, from the top of a mountain, but he did not like the idea of dragons lurking underwater. The same hungry threat coming from above and below at once was too creepy to think about. And maybe one or two more, Rowan went on, spinning into another attack, so he had to dodge away. Grove swears he once saw a totally black dragon, but I've never heard anyone else mention them. Plus, there are parts of the continent where no one's ever been, so there could be other dragons there. I wonder if any of them are easier to fight than the others, Leaf said. But we're closest to the mountain dragons, right? The red and orange ones? Those are the ones I have to slay to protect the village. The ones who ate Wren. He jabbed his wooden sword toward Rowan, and she easily knocked it away into the bushes. He harumphed and went to retrieve it. When he came back, Rowan handed him a blueberry the size of his fist. She had one for herself as well. Leaf sat on the grass, holding the berry in his hands and remembering blueberry expeditions with his little sister. She'd make him laugh with imitations of the stuffy dragon mancers, and he'd challenge her to tree-climbing races so he could win, and then she'd get furiously angry and throw all her blueberries at him and scream, and then he'd fake apologize, and then she'd get even more furious, and then ten minutes later, they'd be swimming in the lake and laughing again. And then the next day, after he'd forgotten all about the fight, he'd climb into his bed and discover she'd filled it with squashed blueberries. He sighed. I miss Wren. Rowan gave him an odd, searching look. Do you think you would hate dragons so much if they hadn't taken her? She asked. I mean, like if it turned out it was someone else's fault? How could it be? Leaf asked. He thought for a moment. You mean, like if someone pushed her off a cliff and then the dragons found her and ate her? Yes, Rowan said carefully. Something like that? Then, no, said Leaf. I would hate that person instead. But I think I'd still have to slay the dragons to make sure it didn't happen to anyone else, right? He traced one finger along the flat of his sword. Don't tell anyone, but I a little bit hate the dragon mancers for not seeing the dragon coming that day. They're always telling us to hide in the shelters, or when to avoid the forest, or that we need to spend an entire day gathering some particular fruit as tribute for the dragons. All they do is have visions about the dragons. But on the most important day, when it's the most important person, he trailed off, swiping at his eyes. Rowan nudged his shoulder with her knee. He knew that was the closest she ever came to physical affection or sympathy. It helped the tiniest bit. But mom and dad say it's not their fault, Leaf said. I guess they told everyone to avoid the river that morning, and Wren went anyway. Disobeying the dragon mancers did sound like something Wren would do, but standing still out in the open, long enough for a dragon to spot her and catch her? That didn't sound much like his little sister at all. She never stopped moving. She was quick and clever, and he would have thought she could roar dragons out of the sky with her own fury. Furious. That's what he needed to be. There wasn't time for sad. He needed to train, to become strong and powerful. And then he needed to go slay the dragons who'd done this. He finished his blueberry and jumped to his feet. Let's go again. Rowan came at him and he ducked under her arm. She spun and whacked his shoulder with a flat of her wooden blade. Good move, but too slow, she said. Try again. They whirled and jabbed for a while in silence. Leaf's arms ached, and he was pretty sure he'd have bruises all over his back tomorrow. But he refused to complain or ask for a break. Every bruise made him stronger 
more ready to stand between the dragons and the children of Talisman. Rowan whipped his sword out of his grip again, and this time he had to climb a tree to retrieve it. She turned in a slow circle, studying the clearing and the forest, as if to make sure there was no one else nearby. Do you ever wonder whether the dragon mancers are hiding something? She asked, as he swung himself back down. Ran thought they were, he said. She once said they were just grumpy old folks ordering everyone around. I think that might be what Grove thinks too, Rowan said, glancing out of the trees again. He keeps hinting at it, but because he's smarter than Wren, he won't say it directly. He's not smarter than Wren, Leaf objected. I mean, he's older than Wren, so he knows more things, but that's not the same. A flash of pity crossed Rowan's face, and Leaf knew why. He couldn't stop talking about Wren in the present tense, even seasons after losing her. You know what? You should become a dragon mancer apprentice, if they'll take you, she said. No way, Leaf said. I want to keep learning how to stab dragons, not be locked up in a hut with some musty paper and even mustier old people teaching me how to bow and scrape. But that's not all you'd learn, Rowan said. You could find out all their secrets. I don't want to be a dragon mancer, Leaf protested. You wouldn't have to be, she said. Get in there, put your head down and pretend, and learn everything they know, like what happened to most of their apprentices, and how do their visions work, and why have they forbidden anyone to go try to steal treasure, and then tell me everything, and we'll use their knowledge to go kill all the dragons. Yes, Leaf cried. Wait, no, this is a trick. How much studying are we talking about? Like, years stuck inside with those grouches? Arr! Can't you do it? I tried, actually, Rowan said, looking down and whacking the nearest bush with her sword. Last year, they said I failed the tests. But I have a theory. It's not about the test scores. It's about who they trust. Why wouldn't they trust you? Leaf asked. Rowan made a weird, wry, inscrutable smile face. Maybe I already know a little too much, she said. Anyway, they seem to like you. I bet you could do it. Yuck, Leaf said firmly. No, thank you. Rowan suddenly tensed. Leaf froze in place. They both tilted their heads, listening. The warning bell was ringing which meant dragons were coming. Quick, Rowan shouted, grabbing his hand and running toward the village. Leaf realized they were still clutching their swords. There was no time to hide them. He knew his child-sized wooden sword would be less than useless against a dragon, but somehow the weight of it in his hand made him feel a little safer. They pelted through the forest, branches whipping at their faces. The bell pealed on and on desperately. The bell towers were built a ways up the mountain, deliberately far so the sound wouldn't draw the dragons to their village. Leaf imagined the apprentice out there pulling on the rope, knowing he or she had to stay with the bell instead of racing to his shelter like everyone else. He didn't think it was much of a mystery why the dragon mancer's apprentices rarely survived very long. No, Rowan. He definitely did not want to be one of them. He wondered if this one had been sent to the bells because of a vision, or whether actual dragons had been spotted. Despite his conversation with Rowan, despite his frequent doubts, he still wasn't quite willing to risk his life testing the theory that the dragon mancers were lying. They burst out of the forest behind the schoolhouse and saw someone running up the road toward them. At first glance, Leaf guessed it must be one of his parents, but as the figure came closer, he realized it was Grove. That's weird, he thought. Grove came looking for us. Well, for Rowan, but Mom and Dad didn't. They must be in the closest shelter to home. They had three other kids to protect, after all. They must trust Rowan and Leaf to get to safety on their own. But it still wasn't the greatest feeling. 
Grove, Rowan cried. Leaf never saw her face light up that way for anyone else. Oh, thank the moons, Grove called, looking enormously relieved. I wasn't sure you'd hear the bell out there. He paused by the schoolhouse, trying to catch his breath. Rowan tugged to open the trap door that led to the schoolhouse shelter. That was where all the kids had to go whenever the alarm rang during the school day. Leaf had done it often enough just in the last year that he knew how many steps led down to the hollow below and exactly where the candles were, even in the dark. He wished they could hide in the schoolhouse instead. It was supposedly camouflaged from the air, hidden by trees and roofed with leafy branches, but there was still a fair chance a dragon would set it on fire one day. Leaf was about to follow Rowan and Grove into the shelter when he heard a sound from inside the schoolhouse. Leaf, Rowan called. Come on, hurry. Wait, he said. I'll be right there. He tossed her his sword and darted up the back steps into the school. Someone was huddled under one of the desks, crying. Someone small, with thin shoulders. Too small to be Wren, and Wren never cried. But still, for a moment, Leaf felt his heart try to reach out and catch her. He crouched beside the desk and recognized the child. It was Butterfly, the teacher's youngest son. Leaf thought he was about four years old. Hey, Leaf said softly, don't be scared. Don't be scared, Butterfly yelped, raising a tear-streaked face to glare at Leaf. Dragons are coming to eat me. Pfft, Leaf scoffed. You're too scrawny. They wouldn't like you. I bet you taste like chicken feed. No, I don't. Butterfly looked outraged now. Mommy says I'd be the most delicious thing they ever eated. They want to eat me so much, they fly here looking for me all the time. Who would say that to a four-year-old? Leaf wondered, and then remembered that his parents said stuff like that all the time. That is completely stupid, Leaf said. Is there one super delicious rabbit in the woods that we're all looking for when we go hunting? Um, Butterfly blinked a few times. I don't know. Is there? No, we catch whatever rabbits we can, silly. Same with dragons. They eat whatever they can get. They're not hunting for you, especially. Mm, maybe, Butterfly said skeptically. But they are scary. I guess, Leaf said, waving one hand. You don't have to be super scared of them, though. Be smart scared instead. Smart scared? Like, it's a good idea to hide from them, especially when you're little. But is this the best, smartest hiding spot? I don't know. Butterfly rubbed his grubby face. I came looking for mommy. No, it isn't. The best hiding place is in a shelter, with a big, strong warrior like me guarding the door. Butterfly laughed. You're not that big and strong. Bigger than you, Leaf said. I bet I could carry you on my back all the way outside. Outside? Butterfly said warily. And down into the shelter, Leaf said, while singing about dragons. I like songs. Butterfly said, scrambling to his feet. Leaf turned around and let the four-year-old climb onto his back. He was heavy, but Leaf managed to stand up and head for the door. Oh, dragons are totally stupid, and dragons are totally bad, he sang off the top of his head. Butterfly giggled. The way they keep eating our goats, it makes me so terribly mad. You have a very bad voice, Butterfly said, snuggling his face into Leaf's neck. Whenever I see a dragon, I want to shout, go away. But since I'm polite and never start fights, I just hide for the rest of the day. His ridiculous song had gotten them across the schoolyard to the shelter steps. The warning bell was still clanging ferociously in the distance, and the treetops were stirring as if the wind or dragon wings, were rising. Rowan was standing a few steps down, waiting for them. 
she lifted Butterfly off Leaf's back and carried him into the shelter. Leaf glanced around for a moment, making sure no one else was coming. Then he closed the trap door and Grove lit one candle, and they were safe in the semi-dark. Hopefully safe. More or less safe. Leaf had heard of other shelters caving in, or of fires set close by that smoked out the people hiding, so they were caught. But those stories were few and far between, and this was a good shelter, sturdily built by the whole village to protect the schoolchildren, stocked with pallets to sleep on and barrels of water in case they were trapped down there for long. It was also quite large, too big for just the four of them. He swung his sword in the open space, then stopped quickly, glancing at Grove. He knows what we're doing, Rowan said. Don't worry, he thinks it's great. Yeah, the world needs more dragon slayers, Grove said with his charming grin. Wish I didn't have to work so I could join you. He sat at the bottom of the stairs, leaning against the dirt wall, his long legs stretched out in front of him. Butterfly promptly sat down in his lap and curled up, as though no one could possibly mind his dazzling four-year-old presence on their knees. Grove chuckled and patted Butterfly on the back. Leaf understood why Rowan liked Grove. Grove was different, and that's what she'd always wanted. He even looked a bit different from the other village boys. His eyes were narrower, his hair was a long, shaggy, dark mop instead of close cut, and his clothes were dyed dangerous colors, like orange. Mostly, though, he carried himself like someone who'd seen the world and knew things. Grove was the only person near their age who had traveled beyond their village. He and his father had arrived in Talisman two years earlier, looking for a place to settle after their own village, farther south had been burned to the ground by dragons. That fire was how Grove had gotten the burn scars on his hands and face. Whatever other family they'd lost, neither of them ever talked about it. That much Leaf knew from Rowan's stories, but she usually never let her little brother or sisters get anywhere near Grove. Apparently, they were embarrassing, although Leaf had no idea what she could possibly mean by that. Hey, Grove. Have you really been to the indestructible city? He asked. Rowan sighed theatrically and slid down the wall to sit beside Grove. Butterfly stuck out his feet to rest them on her. Of course I have, Grove said. It's massive, and it's never been burned. We figured for sure it'd be the safest place to live. Isn't it? Leaf asked. Why didn't you stay? Grove thought for a moment, tilting his head toward Rowan. It's hard to get in, and then it's not as safe as it sounds. I mean, it's safe from dragons, but... He trailed off. But what? Leaf pressed. What else is there? Bears? Wildcats? Do they have a spider problem? Ren had really hated spiders. No, Grove said, looking amused. More of a human problem. Leaf swished his sword, practicing his footwork. Really? Do people attack them? No, that would be impossible. More like... Grove glanced at Rowan. I mean, it's the people inside the city that are the problem. Don't give the children nightmares, Rowan said with a yawn. I'm not children. I won't get nightmares and butterflies practically asleep already. Tell me, Leaf yelped. Grove glanced at Rowan again, and she shrugged. All right, Grove said slowly. Do you know anything about the Invincible Lord? Leaf shook his head. He runs the indestructible city right now. His family always has. But this Lord is different from the ones who came before. He has all these ideas about who is useful and who isn't, and what he can use everyone for. He has plans to expand beyond the city, risky plans, and he'll do anything to make them happen. To him, everyone's expendable. I heard he wanted to hire the Dragon Slayer, Rowan interjected. Really? Leaf thought about that. The power of the indestructible city 
combined with the might of the Dragon Slayer? They could take on the dragons together. Maybe they could save the whole world. The rumor says he's been trying to get the Dragon Slayer to come to the city for years, Grove agreed. But I think higher might be the gentlest way of putting it. What? Leaf glanced from Grove's face to Rowan's, but he didn't understand the expressions they were making. Grove shrugged. I wouldn't trust him if I were the Dragon Slayer. Besides, kid, the IC has a lot of rules. Everyone's mad, strict, and scary. Not my kind of place. So when my dad heard about the legendary, magically protected village of the Dragon Mancers, he decided that would be better for us. Doesn't everyone have Dragon Mancers? Leaf asked. And at the same time, Rowan snorted. You came looking for Dragon Mancers? Most places don't. Grove answered Leaf. My village didn't. The indestructible city doesn't. Talisman is special, apparently. I'd choose a stone city with dragon fighting catapults over a mountain scrap heap guarded by three old lunatics any day, Rowan scoffed. Not this stone city, Grove said. You wouldn't like it there either. He tipped up her chin. We'll make our own. We'll steal a castle from the dragons and live there. Ooh, Leaf breathed. I want a castle, Butterfly mumbled sleepily. A dragon-sized castle would be extremely stupid for us, Rowan said with a laugh. At least until we learn how to fly, or quadruple our height. I'll help you steal it, Leaf said. Any day. I'll be ready to fight dragons soon, right, Rowan? Maybe if you spend more time practicing and less time making up songs for grubby children, Rowan said, gingerly lifting Butterfly's feet off her lap. Grove laughed, and Rowan stood up to continue their sword-fighting lesson in the flickering candlelight. They might have been joking, but Leaf wasn't. One day, kids like Butterfly wouldn't have to be terrified all the time. One day, Leaf wouldn't be hiding in a musty shelter while the dragons soared overhead. One day, the dragons would be hiding from him. Chapter 6 Ivy Ivy heard her mother coming and slid her papers under the book she was pretending to read. She didn't think she would get in trouble, exactly, for drawing dragons all the time, but she knew her parents didn't love it. Why can't you spend your time on something more useful? And what a waste of paper for two of the comments she'd gotten so far when she'd tried to share her drawings with them. Mother poked her head around the door. Those girls are here again, she said disapprovingly. But I can tell them you're studying. No, no, I'm all done with my homework, Ivy said truthfully. Please let them stay. Her mother sighed and went back out to their front room, where Ivy could now hear Violet and Daffodil arguing with each other. The Truth Seekers Club had lasted, against all the odds, over a year now. Despite all their fighting, Violet and Daffodil were fiercely loyal to each other, to the idea of their secret club, and, it turned out, to Ivy as well. Daffodil tumbled into the room first, flinging herself into Ivy's hammock so it swung back and forth. Her yellow ribbons were crooked, and she looked like she'd just been running from one end of valor to the other, although she kind of always looked like that. Oh, my stars. Hi, Daffodil burst out. I have been so busy today, you can't even imagine. The Wing Watchers are having a big meeting tonight, and I was trying to figure out how to sneak in, but it's almost impossible, except I think maybe I found a secret tunnel into the cavern that I might be able to fit through if I cover myself in butter and hold my breath and don't eat anything for the rest of the day. Do you have any snacks? Violet asked innocently, coming through the doorway. I have carrot slices and nectarines, Ivy said. She slid the bowl over as Violet folded herself neatly onto the floor beside her. Arr! You're both so mean, Daffodil said, lunging out of the hammock to grab a piece of nectarine. 
You can't sneak into that meeting anyway, Violet pointed out. That tunnel is way too small, and even if you fit through it, they'll definitely notice you huffing and puffing and smelling like butter. Plus, the meeting is after bedtime, and your parents are way strict about bedtime. And Daisy would probably tell on me if I snuck out, Daffodil grumbled, narrowing her eyes. Besides, Ivy added, if you spy on a wing watcher's meeting, they might not let you become a wing watcher one day, and that would be super sad. Violet raised her eyebrows. Wait, do you want to be a wing watcher? Ivy glanced down at the curling tail on the drawing poking out from under her book. Maybe, she said. I mean, they know so much about dragons. Violet leaned over and slid the drawing out so she could look at it. Whoa, cool, she said. She held it up for Daffodil to see. You're getting so good at those, Daffodil cried. Which kind is that? The sea dragon, Ivy said. I think the face looks a bit too horsey. The wings are always fun to draw, but the legs are so hard. Violet picked up the book to squint at the real drawing, then back at Ivy's. Well, she said loyally, maybe yours is what they really look like. It's not like anyone around here has ever studied one up close, so how would we know? I like yours better. Me too, Daffodil said quickly. You didn't even look at the book drawing, Violet pointed out. You're just saying that because I said that. No, Daffodil objected. I'm saying that because I like Ivy, and I know everything she does is the most awesome, so there. Violet rolled her eyes. Well, I'm saying it because I mean it. Hopefully, I'll see one someday, Ivy interjected hurriedly. And then I'll know what they really look like and be able to draw them even better. You are literally the only person I know who wants to see a dragon, Violet said. That's not true, Daffodil said. I want to see a dragon. But, like, you only want to see one so that you can tell everyone you saw it. You're looking for another crazy Daffodil adventure story. Ivy wants to see one because she's actually really interested in them. It doesn't matter, though, Ivy said. We can't start wing watcher training until we're 12 at the earliest. Four more years until she'd be allowed to train. Then another year after that before her first possible mission outside. She had to wait five years to see a dragon, even though she lived in a world full of them. Well, Violet said, glancing at Daffodil. How about a truth seeker mission instead? Daffodil flailed her way out of the hammock and peeked out the door. Coast is clear, she whispered, staying where she was to keep watch for eavesdroppers, or more specifically, Ivy's mom. Violet tugged a scroll out of her satchel and unrolled a drawing that turned out to be a scribbly map. Ivy lay down on her stomach next to her and studied it. She'd seen maps kind of like this in the Wing Watcher's Guide but this one had a few details she didn't remember seeing before. Did you take this from school? Ivy asked, tracing one of the rivers with her finger. Their year didn't study geography yet, but the older kids did. I snuck in and copied it from the teacher's scroll, Violet said. That's why it's a little wobbly. So how long do you think it would take to get from here to here? She jabbed her finger at one section of the mountains and then another section farther north. Um, Ivy said, scrunching up her forehead. All morning? Ivy, Violet said, giggling. Way longer than that. Days and days and days. Oh, Ivy said with a shrug. What's that little drawing up there near the top of the mountains? That's the mountain dragon's palace, Violet said. I mean, that's what this map maker thinks it looks like anyway. Ivy's heart went thump and skip and started fluttering weirdly in her chest. They have a palace, she said. In the mountains? 
Of course they do, Violet said. Like the one the sand dragons have in the desert that your dad snuck into? Ivy couldn't quite explain the feeling she was having. Of wanting to see something so badly and knowing she'd never ever be allowed to. What did a dragon palace look like? Was it beautiful? Did it have rooms for different things? An eating hall? A throne room? A library? How could dragons be vicious wild animals, the way her dad described them, but also have castles where they lived together and queens who ruled over them? How did a wild animal obey a queen or build a castle? She wished she could ask her father about the palace in the desert, but his dragon-slaying story was always the same. Lots of gory killing, very vague on the details around it. He never talked about sneaking inside, or how he carried out the treasure, or what any of the dragon stuff looked like. Maybe Uncle Stone would tell me, if I could get him to talk about that night at all. Ivy's uncle had never married and although he was supposedly as rich as the dragon slayer, he was never seen spending his treasure. He lived alone in the smallest cave in the underground city. Sometimes he came over for dinner and spent the entire evening staring glumly into his soup. Ivy found him a little unsettling and way too quiet, except every once in a while when he yelled at her dad and was way too loud. So... You know how your dad was away for a few days? Violet asked, studying Ivy's face. Ivy nodded. Her mother had fluttered around the caves in a state of nervous disarray the entire time he was gone. It had been rather exhausting. He took my favorite horse, she said. I was worried he wouldn't bring her back. Do you know where he went? Daffodil asked from the door. Ivy thought for a moment but she couldn't remember being told. I thought it was a regular gathering expedition, she said. Although, come to think of it, there had been a lot of noise around him coming back this time. A few more men shouting, Heat the hero! Or, Hurrah for the dragon slayer! Their voices echoing through the tunnels and filling up the great hall. He says he went to this palace, Violet said tapping the little drawing of a castle way up north in the mountains. He was gone for three days, and when he came back, he told everyone he rode up to the gates of the Mountain Dragon's Palace and shouted at them to come out and fight, but none of them would, because they're scared of him. Why would he do that? Ivy said incredulously. Last time he only fought one dragon. What if a whole bunch had come out to fight him? He would have been eaten up so fast. I want to know how the dragons knew who he was, Daffodil demanded. I mean, did all those dragons actually think, Oh no, it's the dragon slayer. Everybody hide. Seriously? Because how? Did the sand dragons describe him to the mountain dragons? Or draw them a picture? Aren't we totally miniature to them? Can they even tell us apart? Those are great questions, Ivy said. Her dad had always acted as if, of course, everyone in the universe knew who he was, so she'd kind of assumed that included all the dragons. But really, did the dragons have any idea what he looked like? Did they ever think about the dragon slayer at all? Thank you, Daffodil said, looking delighted. No, they're not. Violet said. Those questions are missing the whole point. Oh, yeah? Well, you're missing a whole brain, Daffodil shouted. Why, Violet? What's the real question? Ivy asked quickly. Just look at this map, Violet said. He was gone three days. How could he possibly have gone all the way to this palace and back in just three days? Ivy stared at the map. She only sort of understood it. She knew the little triangles were mountains and the wiggly lines were rivers. She didn't quite know how far it really was to the top of the map. She only sort of knew where Valor was on it, somewhere in the wooded foothills at the southern part of the mountain range. But she heard the urgency in Violet's voice, 
and she felt a weird shivering in the universe. Was this another dragon slayer lie? If it was such a big, obvious one, wouldn't lots of people have noticed it? Or if they had noticed it, why didn't they care? Is there any way, she asked, putting her little finger on the palace and stretching her thumb toward Valor. Maybe there was something magic in the treasure that makes him go really fast? Daffodil laughed. Your dad never goes fast. That was true. The dragon slayer tended to dawdle, to stop and chat to anyone he saw, to sit down and eat whatever extra food was lying around. But maybe he did it somehow, Ivy said. Or else where did he go for all that time? That is an actual great question, Violet pounced. We should find that out. We totally should, Daffodil agreed. Wait, Ivy started. But how can we figure it out? Daffodil asked, looking at Violet. What do we do? We follow him, Violet said, her voice dropping to a thrilling whisper. Yes, Daffodil agreed in a matching whisper. Oh dear, oh no, Ivy said. Following my dad? Outside? We definitely aren't allowed to do that. We aren't allowed to read my dad's law scrolls or steal books from the library either, Violet said, glancing pointedly at the Wing Watcher's guide on Ivy's floor. But we've done those things anyway, for truth, for justice. So we can know more stuff than other people, Daffodil cried, raising one of her fists in the air. No, Violet said, frowning. This is not about beating other people at knowing stuff, Daffodil. Um, it totally is, Daffodil said. You love being the person who knows the most things. I saw your face when you won the spelling contest. I didn't steal that book, Ivy interjected, by the way. I'll give it back. I'm just not finished with it yet. Anyway, I have a plan, so everyone shush, Violet said. And that was how, ten days later, Ivy found herself sneaking behind her father as he left the caves again. She was technically supposed to tell Violet and Daffodil. Her instructions were to run and get them so they could all follow him together. But there wasn't time for that. He left the cave so suddenly, and Ivy was pretty sure the important part was following him more important than getting the others, she thought. She hoped they wouldn't be mad about this. She'd have to remember every detail to tell them to make up for going without them. Heath sauntered through the tunnels, whistling. He didn't head toward their small stable of horses, so he couldn't be planning a long trip, and he hadn't made a glorious announcement to a gathered throng of worshippers before leaving either, so this wasn't one of his dragon slayer quests. He'd told Mother he was going outside, and she'd simply told him to be careful, but he'd also taken a shoulder bag hidden under his shirt, and he avoided walking past Uncle Stone's door, so he was definitely up to something. Ivy was good at not being noticed, and her father was exceptionally good at not noticing things, especially things he thought were unimportant, like little girls. She stayed several paces behind him, pressing herself against the wall whenever he stopped to chat with one of his followers. She ran into a problem at the tunnel exit, though. Her father chose one of the exits with a ladder up to the sky, where a wing watcher stood guard at the bottom. Ivy crouched behind a bench carved out of the rock. Her heart was pounding. She'd never been this close to this exit before, certainly never without permission. It smelled different here. She didn't think she was imagining that. Hello, Holly, Heath boomed cheerfully as he approached the bottom of the ladder. It's Foxglove, sir, the wing watcher said. Ivy didn't know her very well, although Foxglove had left school only a couple of years ago to train with the wing watchers. Her hair was shaved into a close, dark fuzz over her head, and her forest green uniform was neat and unwrinkled. 
Most interestingly, Foxglove's expression was hard to read. It wasn't the usual adoring gaze Ivy's father got all over Valor. She looked calm, focused, unimpressed. Ivy smushed her face around, trying to imitate her. Violet and Daffodil would be so startled if Ivy could make a cool, I don't care, expression like that. Any dragon sightings today? Heath asked, ignoring the name correction. No, sir. Too bad, too bad. He cracked his knuckles. Can't wait to meet another dragon with a pointy end of this guy. He patted the sword at his waist with a grin. Foxglove raised her eyebrows, but said nothing. Well, I'll be back soon, Heath said. He put one hand on the ladder. Sir, Foxglove said, I am required to ask what your purpose on the outside is. By your own decree, sir. Heath frowned at her. You are required to ask other people. I am the Dragon Slayer and the Lord of all of Valor. It was my understanding that the laws apply to everyone, sir, Foxglove said evenly. Ivy held her breath. She knew that expression on her father's face, this moment on the edge right before he exploded with anger. But instead, he shifted from a glare to a smug grin, as oily as Ivy's hands after the olive harvest came in. Very good, Holly, he said, wagging one finger at her. I like to see my people following my laws. Where would we be without them? Am I right? It's Foxglove, sir, she said again. I am going outside to assess the status of the orchards, he said grandly. Check up on the fruit harvesters. Lord business, don't you worry about it. Foxglove gave another slight nod, stepping back so he could climb up the ladder. He went without saying a word of farewell. Ivy rubbed her temples, thinking, how could she get past Foxglove? No self-respecting wing watcher would ever let an eight-year-old climb outside on her own. Unless maybe she asked really nicely? Ivy was a big fan of asking nicely. She found that this nearly always worked, at least with grown-ups. Foxglove was a teenager, though. That was a mysterious in-between kind of person who might do absolutely anything. They were inexplicable, Violet would often say wisely. But she had to try, or her father would be too far out of sight in a minute. Ivy jumped up from behind the bench and ran over to Foxglove. A wonderful moment of surprise flashed across the wing watcher's face before she went back to her very cool, nothing here is interesting, expression. I have to catch up with my dad, Ivy said breathlessly. Please let me go after him. I promised I'd give him something before he left, and then I forgot, and he'll be so mad if I don't give it to him. I promise I'll come right back. She smiled her, I love you the best of all my teachers smile, which also usually worked. No way, kid, Foxglove said, not unkindly. I can't let you out there alone. I won't be alone. I'll catch up to my dad. I'm really quick, I promise. What do you have to give him? Foxglove asked. Um, Ivy panicked. She reached into her pockets, fumbling to see whether she had anything at all. Just, uh, this super important, um, potato. She held it out, utterly betrayed by pockets that were usually full of interesting rocks and scraps of nonsense. But two days ago, Mother had taken her pants to wash them and must have emptied out everything. So all she had was the potatoes she dug up in gardening class that morning. Foxglove slowly raised one incredibly elegant eyebrow at her. It's really important, Ivy said. This potato could change everything. I can't tell you anything else. It's top secret potato business. I see said Foxglove. Let me guess, we're going to take down the dragons with potatoes. Oh, 
Ivy said, startled. She had never thought of taking down dragons before, even though her dad was the dragon slayer. She kind of thought of that as dad's thing, but not something she'd ever want to do. Mm, maybe we can use the potatoes to make friends with them instead. Now there was a definite shift in Foxglove's face. Maybe something even a little bit like a smile. Have you ever been outside? Foxglove asked. Ivy shook her head, and Foxglove crouched beside her. Are you good at keeping secrets? Ivy thought about that for a moment. Yes, from mother and father, she said finally. Not from Violet. Hmm, said Foxglove. Is Violet good at keeping secrets? The best, said Ivy. It's very annoying. Foxglove laughed. She glanced around at the empty tunnels, then up at the sky-scented hole above them. What if we just go see what he's doing? Together. And if he looks busy, we won't even bother him. Yes, Ivy breathed, her eyes wide. That would be perfect. All right, let's go, Foxglove said, pointing up. She lifted Ivy onto the ladder, then climbed up right behind her, her strong arms ready to catch Ivy if she slipped, although of course she didn't because she was good at climbing. Ivy crawled out of the hillside into an indescribably vast forest of trees, all of them something like 80 times her size, she guessed. The air smelled like apples and grass, and it kept flying into her face and up her nose instead of staying still like the air in the underground city. It was also noisy. The whole outside was whooshy and shush shush me and crickle crackly and a little buzzy, too, and super bright, like, why was there so much light everywhere? Ivy sat down in the dirt and closed her eyes for a moment, listening to the whooshing and feeling the light try to burn off her face while the air tried to blow it out. It was a lot. There was a lot happening. Foxglove, what are you doing? said a young male voice nearby. Just taking Ivy to find her dad, Foxglove said, in one of those grown-up voices that was secretly saying something else. Ivy cracked an eye open and squinted up at her. The other wing watcher had his arms crossed, looking down at Ivy, but he didn't look mad. He had a planning-something face that looked a lot like Violet's. Hey, Ivy realized, Foxglove knows my name. A very cool teenager knows my name. But we might not find him, Foxglove said significantly. So if he comes back without seeing us, no need to mention this. Right, said the other wing watcher. I was looking for dragons in that direction anyway. He pointed at a spot of blue sky beyond the trees. Blue sky, Ivy thought. She'd seen it through holes in the ceilings of a few caves, but it was so much bigger and bluer out here. Try to remember it better than that. Daffodil isn't going to settle for bigger and bluer. Ready to walk? Foxglove asked Ivy. Ivy scrambled to her feet and took Foxglove's hand. They edged down the sloping hill, between towering craggy trees on a carpet of pine needles. At the bottom of the hill, Ivy started seeing more and more fruit trees, apple and pear and peach, with berry bushes tangled between them. She slowed to match Foxglove's cautious, quiet pace, and then stopped completely when Foxglove froze and squeezed her hand. Up ahead, Heath was sauntering through the trees, holding a half-eaten apple nearly the size of his head in his hand. He glanced right and left as he went, on higher alert than he had been in the caves. Foxglove tugged Ivy behind a tree. Where is he going? She whispered. I don't know, Ivy answered. He'd had a bag, but he wasn't using it to carry apples. What else could he be going to get? He just said outside. 
The wing watcher peeked around the tree at him. The old village is in that direction, she whispered. But the law, Ivy said. I mean, didn't Pine? He can't. She trailed off, surprised by the suddenly grim expression on Foxglove's face. Foxglove was staring after Heath, looking very much like maybe he was her least favorite person. That's right, Ivy, she said. He can't go there. At least, if the law is fair and applies to everyone. Foxglove's fingers twitched on the hilt of her dagger. So he probably isn't, Ivy said. Maybe he's going to get pears for mother. He'll be back soon, right? Foxglove looked down at her, and the frown slowly cleared from her forehead. She opened her mouth, maybe to say something reassuring, but she was interrupted by an unearthly sound from the sky. It was like an avalanche, or a thousand giant tigers roaring at once, or thunder in a hurricane the size of the continent, or like something else enormous and terrifying that Ivy had never heard before. It gave her instant goosebumps and made her want to curl up like a hedgehog somewhere safe, preferably with violet and daffodil and a bunch of pointy swords. Foxglove hissed an unfamiliar word. That was cursing, Violet informed her with a scandalized expression when Ivy asked about it later, and grabbed Ivy. Before the sound had finished echoing off the mountains, Foxglove had thrown Ivy halfway up the trunk of the nearest evergreen and was scrambling up behind her. Move legs, Ivy thought frantically. She forced herself to reach up and grab another branch, sticky with sap, and haul herself higher. A few moments later, she was about halfway up the tree when she felt Foxglove's hand on her ankle. Stop there, Foxglove whispered. Stay completely still. Ivy didn't have to be told twice. She clung to the trunk, tucking her legs in and imagining herself as a knot in the bark. Small, brown, indistinguishable, definitely inedible. She was glad she was wearing her old gray tunic and pants instead of the new dark purple ones her mother had made for her. The dragon roared again, and now she heard a new sound, this one coming from below her. She squinted down without moving a muscle and saw her father racing through the trees. His eyes were wild, and he'd dropped his apple. Ivy had never seen him move so fast. He ran as though the dragon were right behind him, breathing fire on his heels. She could hear his heavy, panicked breaths as he tore past. But the dragon wasn't down there. It was up in the sky. Ivy could hear the wing beats. She couldn't resist. Carefully, slowly, she inched her head up and back until she could see the blue expanse beyond the thicket of branches. A flash of black scales soared overhead, wings tilting, flickering tail, breath of flame on the air. A dragon, a dragon, a dragon. It swooped around again. This time she caught a glimpse of its face, not horsey at all, but perfect, long and elegant, with the most intelligent eyes. And the scales were more than black. They caught the sunlight in shimmers of dark purple and blue and green, and small diamond-white scales flashed under its wings. The dragon roared once more, and then it lashed its tail and swept away west, toward the desert. Another long moment passed before Ivy realized she'd been holding her breath, and she slowly let it out. Wow, she whispered. She wanted to stay in the tree longer, remembering the dragon, maybe waiting to see if it came back. But before long, she felt Foxglove tug gently on her ankle. They descended quietly, and Foxglove reached up to help Ivy down from the last branch, which was way higher than Ivy would have been able to reach on her own. I guess that was your first wing watcher lesson, kid, Foxglove said. If you hear a dragon, hide. Do not run. Dragons are much faster than you, 
but they won't usually bother with prey if it's in a sharp, sticky tree like this one. And if the branches are thick enough and you're motionless enough, it hopefully won't even see you. She glanced in the direction Heath had been running. Only a coward or an idiot would run from a dragon. Ivy was nearly startled out of her dragon days. Was Foxglove talking about her father? The dragon slayer wasn't a coward. That wasn't even possible. He had been running awfully fast, though. You're so lucky, Foxglove said. The black ones are the rarest. I can't believe you got to see one on your first time out. What did you think? Were you beyond scared? Ivy smiled at her. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen, she said. I loved it. Loved it? Foxglove echoed. The dragon? Or the exciting, terrifying running and hiding part? The dragon, Ivy said promptly. I loved the dragon. Foxglove raised her eyebrows again. Well, I haven't heard that before, she said. I thought I was the only one who secretly thinks dragons are kind of great. You do? Ivy breathed. Do you get to see dragons every day? Not every day, but that's basically our job, Foxglove said with a grin. Watching the sky so everyone is safe. Studying the dragons so we can understand them as much as possible. We lost a lot of books and a few of the older watchers when the village burned but we're trying to bring back everything we knew. I want to be a wing watcher so much, Ivy said passionately. I'll put in a good word for you, Foxglove said. That is, if I'm not banished before then. Come on, let's get you home. We didn't learn much today, did we? Ivy disagreed, although she didn't say so out loud. She learned to hide, not run from dragons. She'd learned that dragons were even more amazing than she'd thought. She'd learned that her dad acted like a cat with its tail on fire when he heard one. And she'd met Foxglove, a wing watcher who understood her. They started back toward Valor, but Ivy kept tripping over tree roots because she couldn't keep her eyes off the sky. She wished the dragon would come back, or that another one would fly overhead. Foxglove stopped her near the entrance and went ahead to make sure Heath wasn't around to catch them going back in. Ivy took a deep breath, trying to fill her lungs with all the outside air they could hold. I don't want to go back underground, she said, when Foxglove returned. I want to see more dragons. I want to stay out here. Why can't I be a wing watcher now? I don't think the old folks are quite ready for eight-year-old guardians yet, Foxglove said crouching to meet Ivy's eyes. But tell you what, come back whenever Squirrel and I are on duty, and I'll give you a little early training, if you don't tell anyone but Violet. Really? Ivy breathed. Really, Ivy who loves dragons, Foxglove said. Just promise me, you'll never, ever, ever go outside without a wing watcher. I promise, Ivy said. She went home covered five small scrolls, which were supposed to be for math homework, with sketches of the dragon in flight, and fell asleep to dreams of wings and scales. Chapter 7 Wren Not far from the indestructible city, Wren and Sky found a sheltered valley that was full of hiding spots, and hard enough to get to that Wren was pretty sure they'd be safe there for a while. Or, more specifically, that Skye would be safe hiding there while she went into the city. No! Skye yelped when she explained this plan. No leaving me! He threw himself across her lap and looked as pitiful as a small dragon with lots of sharp teeth could look. I don't want to, but it's very dangerous for you, she insisted in dragon. No dragons there. She didn't know much about any villages besides her own but she was quite sure none of them would be pleased about a girl strolling in with a man-eating predator by her side. They wouldn't give her a chance to explain that he was a cuddly vegetarian, especially in the indestructible city, the one place in the world that fought back against the dragons. More dangerous alone, he cried. 
Sad sky. Very, very, very sad sky. He snuffled tragically. I won't be gone long, she said in her own language, hoping he'd understand. Trust me, I don't want to talk to people or have anything to do with people. But I don't have scales to protect me, and I need something new to wear. The blue dress had been big on her that day, a year and a half ago, but now it was painfully tight, short in the arms, and ragged along the hems. She knew a lot about finding food and shelter in the forest, starting fires, and hiding from dragons, but she didn't know anything about making new clothes, especially without a flock of sheep handy. Also, a map if I can find one, and maybe something to read. His answer was garbled by his sniffles, but from the words she caught, she guessed he'd asked, What if you don't come back? I'll always find my way back to you, she said as fiercely as she could, which was pretty fierce given how much of the dragon language was growling and roaring. No matter what happens to either of us. And look, while I'm gone, you can learn to fly. She zoomed her hand over the meadow flowers, scattering dandelion seeds into the air. It worried her a little that Sky couldn't fly yet. Not having fire was one thing, but he certainly had wings, and she had no idea how to teach him to use them. That seemed like a dragon parent's job that she couldn't fill. For a while, he'd flapped his wings occasionally, especially when he saw birds overhead and got excited. But once he'd realized that Wren couldn't fly, he'd stopped even trying. He seemed perfectly happy to walk beside her, or, if he could charm her into it, what he really preferred was for her to carry him. But that was now impossible, as much as Wren loved him. He seemed to be growing markedly bigger every time they fell asleep. By the time they reached the valley, his shoulders were level with Wren's waist, and his wingspan was wider than her outstretched arms. Sky grumbled and muttered and stomped around the valley for two days, but finally Wren convinced him that he could not follow her to the indestructible city. It had apparently never occurred to him that most dragons ate humans, and most humans therefore found dragons terrifying. Apparently he'd thought Wren always hid from adult dragons in the sky because they might be looking for him, not because they'd find Wren a delicious snack. He was thoroughly outraged by the idea of someone snacking on his wren. I would bite them, he cried. I would roar at them. I know you would, Wren said, scratching behind his ears. Just like I would bite and roar at any human who tried to hurt you. But me against the entire indestructible city is a fight that wouldn't go well. Fine, Sky grumbled sounding so much like a dragon version of Ren's older sisters, that she burst out giggling, which offended him even more. The next morning, she made sure Skye knew where all the best hiding places in the valley were, and then hugged him goodbye. She climbed through the hidden passage and started down the mountain. Through the trees, she caught glimpses of the river glittering down below, a different river than the one she'd found Skye in. Leaves whisked around her bare feet, and she discovered that the birds sang at full volume when Wren wasn't accompanied by a dragon. It was awfully strange to be without Sky. Wren hadn't been away from him for more than a few moments since the day she'd found him. Right away, she missed his humming, his weight leaning against her hip, his little yelps of glee when he spotted an animal. She wished she could make it to the city, get inside, get what she needed, and get back to the valley in one day but she had a feeling it was all going to be more complicated than she hoped. Could a nine, ten-year-old girl in a ragged dress just walk right into the indestructible city? Is this a terrible idea? People can't be trusted. What if they try to feed me to the dragons again? Maybe only my village is full of awful people. Or maybe this place is worse. She frowned tugging at one of her sleeves. I'll just look at it first. I don't have to go in if it looks dangerous. Wren had heard that the indestructible city was built halfway up a cliff overlooking the forest, but she was still startled when she reached the end of the trees and saw it, towering far overhead as though it were a city on one of the moons. She hadn't known that the cliff would be so high, 
or so steep. She hadn't realized how hard it would be to get to the city or how impossible to sneak inside. At first glance, the only way to enter the city was by climbing an endlessly long set of stairs that had been chipped out of the cliff face, cutting back and forth on a path into the sky, and now worn smooth and alarmingly slippery by thousands of feet going up and down. There was no railing, nothing to hold on to, and nothing to keep someone from tripping and plummeting off the cliff to their doom. Soldiers guarded the bottom of the stairs and the gate at the top, as far as she could see. A few people were climbing the stairs, but far more were gathered around the foot of the cliff, within sight of the soldiers. Wren could see wagons and tents and rugs spread on the ground. She saw families asleep in huddled piles, far back in the line, and she saw others stirring pots over campfires. Some of the travelers looked as though they'd been there quite a while, as though they'd made camp and were prepared to wait as long as necessary for a shot at the stairs and the safety of the city. She climbed a tree and watched from the forest for a while to see if there were any other ways into the indestructible city. There was a waterfall plunging from the top of the cliff, not far from the city walls. Wren could see a contraption set up along the outermost wall to gather water from it. Hanging from a set of pulleys next to the water wheel was a large platform with tall woven sides. Wren studied it for half the morning before it finally moved, creaking slowly all the way to the bottom of the cliff. There, a trio of hunters wearing animal pelts loaded the platform with a live goat and a pile of deer carcasses. Oh, Wren realized. It's for things that would be too heavy or unwieldy to carry up the stairs. As she watched, a group of travelers approached the hunters and started talking to them. She couldn't hear what they were saying, but there was a lot of hand-waving and pointing. Finally, the travelers handed over a basket. Wren guessed it contained food or herbs, but what were they paying for? Then, one of the travelers came forward, supporting a hunched, limping, elderly man with a long, white beard. She helped him climb over the side into the platform basket with the goat and the dead deer, and he settled himself awkwardly on the bottom. That looks like an uncomfortable ride, Wren thought, as the platform jolted into the air. But better for the old man than the steps, I guess. The platform banged against the sides of the cliff as it was hauled up, and she imagined being surrounded by the smell of the carcasses. She would have thrown up over the edge onto the heads of the hunters, she was pretty sure. But that was the only other way into the city, apart from the steps, and it was clearly guarded and policed by people who would demand payment for anyone to use it. That wasn't going to work for her. She would have to climb the steps along with everybody else if she wanted to get inside. Did she want to get inside? Those were also the only ways out of the city, other than leaping off the cliff, which meant a quick escape wouldn't be possible if she needed it. Wren did not like that at all. Also, small point, but the people stuck on the steps, inching slowly toward the city, were sitting ducks for any hungry dragons flying by. Wren wondered how many of them got eaten every day. Surely the dragons must know about this easy one-stop snack parade. She swung her legs for a moment, thinking... She really needed something new to wear. She'd torn a new hole in her dress just by reaching up to the tree branches. But was it worth the risk of talking to people? And maybe getting stuck in the indestructible city? She studied the line of people waiting to climb the steps. Near the front was a group that seemed to include a few families and several children. They had half their goods packed up as though they were hoping to be allowed in today. Maybe she could sneak in as one of them and avoid any questions. Wren jumped down from the tree and wandered casually toward the base of the cliff. No one paid her very much attention as she wove through the encampment. Most people were nervously watching the sky or trading stories of close escapes and clever hiding spots. She reached the big family group as they got to the foot of the steps, where two men stood with slates and frowns and stiff shoulders. Both men were wearing leather armor covered in sharp, thorn-like spikes. That would make them difficult for a dragon to pick up, Wren supposed, but it looked uncomfortable and hot, especially for climbing up and down the cliff. Plus, 
They look like a couple of grouchy porcupines, she thought. She wished Sky could see them. Intent, one of the men snapped. We're looking to settle here, if we can, said a tall woman with a baby on her hip. Our village was destroyed. We've been waiting in this line for three weeks, a man behind her added. No room for refugees at the moment, the soldier said brusquely. New Lord's orders. Isn't there a quest? The tall woman asked. We heard there was a way to earn a place in the city. Not for all of you, he said, raising an eyebrow at two little boys who kept pushing each other, despite their father hissing at them. The Invincible Lord will generously admit one family, consisting of no more than six people, if they bring the Dragon Slayer to him. A Dragon Slayer? Ren wondered. Like, a person who slays dragons? She felt indignant on Skye's behalf. That jerk. I hope someone eats him. What does the new lord want with the dragon slayer? Another woman in the group asked. An alliance, of course, said the first porcupine soldier. Wren didn't like the gleam in his eyes. If the dragon slayer worked for the invincible lord, they could save us from the dragons forever. They could build new indestructible cities. We could take back our world. That's what the Invincible Lord says, interjected the second porcupine soldier. He says this world should be for people, not dragons. Wren snorted to herself. We sent one of our villagers to seek the dragon slayer to ask for his help, said the tall woman with a baby. But our village burned before the dragon slayer arrived. What if he's dead? Or what if he won't come here? The first soldier shrugged, rattling his spikes. Sounds like a problem you'll have to solve. That's why it's called a quest, isn't it? Or you can keep waiting and see if the Lord changes his mind, the other offered with a grunt. They don't care whether these people live or die, Ren thought scornfully. They wouldn't lift a finger if dragons swooped out of the sky to eat them right now. This is just another place where powerful people step on everyone below them. The indestructible city is no better than talisman. She slipped quietly behind one of the bigger men in the traveling party and started to sidle away. May we enter to trade at least? The tall woman asked. We have been traveling for so long, and some of our children need medicine. Her baby made a sad, restless sound, and she pulled it closer to her, wrapping one big hand around its little head. Ren wondered whether the woman would trade that baby for a safe place to live, or if a bunch of dragon mancers told her to. You may have a pass to visit the market for a day, said the porcupine soldier in a bored voice, if you leave your children down here with us. He pointed behind him to a fenced-off area up against the cliff. Inside, three children huddled together silently. The oldest looked younger than Ren. The other soldier smiled an unfriendly smile. That way, we know you'll come back, he said. The woman took a step away from them, wrapping her other arm around her baby, and the two bickering boys fell silent, staring up at their father's anxious face. Orphans must be stamped and turned over to the city, the first soldier went on. We'll find a place for them. You mean forever? asked the tall woman. You keep the orphans? Invincible Lord's orders, said the second soldier, with a nod that rattled the spikes on his helmet. They're safer with us, after all. Nope, Wren thought. Nope, nope, no, thank you, nope. She ducked under someone's arm and wove quickly back through the group, who were all muttering and whispering about the new Lord's rules. She wanted to run all the way back to Sky immediately, but she didn't want to attract the guards' attention. She doubted they'd want to chase her in all that armor, but it would still be safer to put a lot of distance between them before she made a break for the forest. Toward the end of the line, she nearly ran headlong into a pile of orange fur, which turned out to be a positively enormous cat in the arms of a boy. Wings above, Wren yelped in surprise. She remembered the kitten she'd wanted from years ago. Would it have grown as big as this creature? The cat hissed lazily, 
as if it couldn't really be bothered to scare her away. Its face was flat and gorgeously grumpy, and its fur was long and silky. It was seriously nearly as big as Sky was. Don't touch my cat, the boy said, narrowing his eyes. I definitely won't, Wren said. Why would I? I like my face not clawed off. She doesn't scratch, he said. But I do, if anyone touches her. He was a hair shorter than Wren, with bushy eyebrows and a moon-shaped face, and one silver earring shaped like a dragon, which was entirely too excellent for a person this obnoxious. I'm not going to touch your stupid tiger, Wren said. But when it grows up and eats you, don't be surprised. You deserve it. Did you growl at us? He asked. When you nearly ran into my cat? Oops. Had she said wings above and dragon? I wasn't growling at you, she said. It was more of a general growl at everything, probably, if I did. Why are you going to the back of the line? He asked. Are you running away from your parents? He considered that for a moment. If you are, I should tell. Don't you dare, Wren said fiercely. I know eight different ways to kill you before you take your next breath. He regarded her skeptically. You do not. You're tiny. You're tinier than I am. Nuh-uh. Besides, I have a cat. Yeah, well, I have a dragon, Wren heroically managed not to say, with very impressive self-control, if she thought so herself. And I have guards to protect me, the boy said, as if that fact was extremely boring, but something he had to live with. So where are you going? Guards? Wren wondered. Why? He did look much more pampered and much less desperate than everyone around them. I have decided not to go to the indestructible city today, she said, lifting her chin. Not that it's any of your business. Goodbye. He did not move out of her way. The cat blinked thoughtfully at her. You look silly, said the boy. That dress is too small for you. Well, that cat is too big for you, and so is your stupid face, Wren said. She wondered where his parents were, and why they let him have a cat that size, and whether he was planning to try to carry it all the way up the steps to the indestructible city. Oh, he said, you're funny. Are you one of the new clowns for the manor? Is that why you're dressed like that? Why are you bothering me? Wren demanded. I don't like people. I don't want to talk to you. I don't like people either, he said. Only cats. No, wait. Only this cat. Her name is Dragon. You are so weird, Wren said. It is weird to name an animal after a totally different animal. Is it? he said indifferently. Dragon doesn't care. I'm undauntable. What's your name? None of your business, Wren answered. Wait, what? You're what? Undauntable, he said. That's my name. That's even worse than dragon for a cat, she said. You made that up. Undauntable? That's like putting a sign on your head that says, go ahead and try to daunt me. Do your parents hate you? He scowled with enormous ferocity. No, they think I am perfect. Then they should have called you perfect, Wren said, if they were so determined to give you a terrible name. It's not terrible, he shouted. I am undauntable. What's your so great name then? Still, none of your business, Wren said. I have places to be. Goodbye. He shoved the cat in her way so she had to stop again. Will you tell me your name if I get you a new dress? He demanded. Definitely not, Wren said. I don't want a new dress, and I don't want anything to do with you. She turned to go another way and discovered a new gigantic porcupine soldier, bristling with spikes, standing just behind her. This was a rather alarming discovery. That's my bodyguard, said Undauntable so you probably shouldn't kill me any of your eight ways. You're from the city, Wren realized. 
She should have guessed from the earring and the clean, shiny look of his clothes what she could see of them beyond the cat, which she was not going to call dragon. It could be cat if it had to be anything. And maybe his silly name was also a clue. Maybe all the kids in the indestructible city had absurd pompous names, like the Invincible Lord. What are you doing down here? I got bored, and so did Dragon, he answered. New people at least have a chance of being interesting. Easily bored, rich, and powerful usually means dangerous. Wren narrowed her eyes at him, wondering what the safest way out of this conversation was. Bodyguard, Undauntable said. Find me someone in this line who has a dress to trade in this girl's size. Do not do that, Wren said. I don't want a dress. I want a tunic and pants, and I will get them myself. She hadn't thought of trading with someone in the line. That would be much easier than going up to the city, although it might also draw more attention to her than she would like. With what? Undauntable said, sizing her up. You don't have anything to trade. Wren slipped her hands in her pockets and felt a small, cool shape. I have this, she said, pulling it out. It was one of Skye's baby scales that had molted off him recently. In the palm of her hand, it looked like a small, pale orange jewel. Undauntable gasped, and even his bodyguard's eyes widened. Is that a dragon scale? Undauntable demanded. I've never seen one that color before. Like I said, none of your business. Wren pocketed the scale again and turned to saunter back up the line. Wait, Undauntable said. I want it. Please let me have it. I'll give you way more than anyone else here for it. You don't have anything I want, Wren said loftily. Undauntable hefted the cat over his shoulder and seized a pouch off the bodyguard's belt. Here, he said, pouring round silver pieces into his palm. You can have all of these. What good are little bits of silver to me? Wren asked. I can't eat them or wear them or read them. What? Undauntable said. How backward is your village? You don't use coins? Wren didn't think her parents had used coins in talisman, but she wasn't sure. I just don't want them, she said. Yes, you do, Undauntable said impatiently. They argued a bit more, until finally he walked her up and down the line and showed her how everyone would accept the silver coins in exchange for the things she really wanted. It was kind of a weird phenomenon. No one in Wren's village had ever traded like this, with bits of shiny metal instead of useful things, as far as she could remember. But the travelers were eager to take them, so they must be useful in other places. The dragon mancers had all the shiny metal, she suddenly remembered. She'd seen lots of it in Master Trout's secret cabinets when she stole the books, but she hadn't thought it was very interesting. Maybe this is like the treasure the books talked about. All those pages of notes on which Dragonmancer had what stuff? She'd skimmed that part. It was beyond boring to read about how two gold rings equaled one ruby equaled whatever, whatever, with lots of notes on dividing it fairly into four exactly equal parts. Yawn. With Undauntable's help, Wren ended up with dark green pants. Too long but she could roll them up and then unroll them as she got taller. A moss green tunic, fawn brown boots that felt weird after a year of bare feet, and a soft wool cloak dyed the gray of a stormy sky. She also got a map of the continent, two loaves of cranberry nut bread, a canteen on a strap for carrying water in, five books she'd never read before, and, in the end, Undauntable's silver dragon earring, because she couldn't think of anything else she needed, and he insisted she needed more to repay the price of the scale. All right, you can have it, she said, dropping the little scale into his hand. Where did you find it? he asked. He breathed on it and rubbed it shiny, then held it up to the light. I bet this came from a baby dragon, he said shrewdly. If we could track it down, I could have a whole chest plate made of these. Wren shuddered. She did not like the image that popped into her head, 
of undauntable hunting down sky, searching for more scales. I found it in the swamps, she said, pointing northeast, the opposite direction from where sky was hidden. Undauntable did not look like a guy who'd enjoy wading through swamps. If I find another one, I could bring it back to you. Yes, he said delightedly. Do that. Don't sell it to anyone else. All right, she said. I'll come back and look for you in a year. Maybe a little sooner if I finish these books and need something else to read. A year, he said, dismayed. That's so long. I think you'll survive, she said, rolling her new possessions up in her cloak. I know I will, he said. I am the prince of the indestructible city, but you will almost certainly be dead in a year. That's cheerful, she said, trying not to let on that she was startled by this news. A prince? No wonder he was so weird. Wait, did that mean the invincible lord was his father? I bet that's a fun family to be part of. Although, I guess they can't actually be worse than mine. You'll just have to wait and see. I don't like waiting, he called after her, stamping his foot as she walked away. This is extremely aggravating. Saddest story ever told, she called back with a wave. Wren couldn't go directly to the forest and her valley, not with Undauntable's eyes following her. She headed south instead, following the river until the indestructible city and its porcupine soldiers and all its alarming people were out of sight. And then she swam to the other side, veered back toward the trees, and ran all the way home to her dragon. Chapter 8 Leaf It was funny, or perhaps terrible, how you could spend your entire life training for one purpose, only to have everyone around you suddenly decide you were destined for something else. Of course, Leaf's parents had been hoping that Dragon Mancer would be Leaf's destiny from probably the day he was born. But Leaf had never wanted that, never hoped for it, never even thought about it. He'd barely paid attention during the Dragon Mancer exams. He'd only taken them to keep up the pretense that Rowan had been studying with him all these years. He thought sometimes that it was odd how nobody had guessed. Didn't anyone wonder how he'd gone from a scrawny ten-year-old to the strongest, fastest person in the village? Did anyone think it was strange that someone who supposedly had his nose in his books all day could also walk on his hands, scale any cliff face, swim upriver against the current, and lift boulders twice his size? But none of that mattered. He'd spent all that time and worked so hard to become someone who could slay the dragons that had killed Ren. And then, all at once, he was someone else. Age 14, stuck with an official Dragon Mancer's apprentice invitation, parents who were over the moons with joy, and an older sister who was entirely too amused about the whole thing. Saying no was not an option. Even Grove wanted him to do it. He said, Whatever the Dragon Mancers are hiding, this is our chance to find it. Rowan's group of friends who were obsessed with fighting dragons all thought this was a fantastic development. But they weren't the ones who had to milk the goats, chip the candle wax off the floors, and sprint into the hills about once every three days to ring the warning bells. They weren't the ones sleeping on a thin straw pallet in a cramped room with another apprentice, who spent all his time either snoring or talking about the last two apprentices and how gruesomely they'd been eaten. Leaf had been assigned to the leader of the Dragon Mancers, Master Trout, who seemed nearly as displeased about having a new apprentice as Leaf was to be there, even though it had been Trout's idea in the first place. That's because he hates everything, Ren's voice whispered in Leaf's mind. He was supposed to be born as a tarantula, and instead he came out more or less human, so now he has to talk to people instead of biting them, and that means he's always frustrated and hungry. The worst part about being around Master Trout all the time was that Leaf couldn't stop remembering all the jokes Ren had made about him. The way his receding chin made him look like a smug turtle. The way he spoke with maddening slowness, as though nobody else could possibly keep up with his brain. The way he would be casually cruel to small children, or people begging for help, 
and then he'd chuckle quietly to himself for the rest of the day, thinking he was the only one who'd noticed. Leaf wondered what Wren would think of how he now scurried around, doing Trout's bidding day and night. The dragon mancer never stopped talking, but Leaf couldn't tune him out, because Trout would switch from a boring lecture to imperious orders mid-sentence, in the same disdainful tone of voice, and if Leaf missed an instruction, he'd lose a meal, or he'd be sent to the alarm bell three days in a row. He wished Wren were there to puncture the gloating bubble around Master Trout's head. She would have pointed out how small and mean the dragon mancer was, the icy pebble where his heart should be, and she could have made him laugh about it, instead of feeling smothered by it all the time. Leaf could imagine Wren setting him free, but he couldn't figure out how to do it himself. Maybe that was why he started having conversations with her in his head. Do you think I should run away? He thought at night, when the snoring kept him awake. Maybe I can go be a dragon slayer right now. You absolutely should do that, said the wren in his mind. Running straight into dragon fire sounds way more fun than this boring place. Where would I go, though? He asked. To the mountain dragon palace? By myself? And after I kill a dragon there, then what? First, you should go to the indestructible city, she said. Ask them to send you on a quest. Then, when you come back covered in the blood of dragons, they'll probably give you gold and a house and ooh, maybe a parade. And then you can demand that they build a statue of me for everyone to remember me and weep for me forever. The indestructible city is way in the opposite direction from the dragon palace, he said. Maybe I could find a village closer to here, a place where everyone is living in terror, and then I could free them from the dragon that hunts them. One tiny problem, Wren pointed out. You're 14. When you offer to slay a dragon, the villagers will 100% laugh at you. They will not. Okay, they might. But I know I'm ready. Eh, said imaginary Wren. Your left-handed sword fighting needs work. I bet you could kill a dragon with the smell of your armpits, though. Thanks, Ren. These pep talks are so helpful. Go away and let me sleep. He dreamed of fighting dragons every night. The only thing getting him through the apprenticeship, apart from his imaginary sister, was his free day once a week, when he would go into the forest to train with Rowan and her friends, Rowan and Grove had gathered a few more people their age who believed the dragons could be fought and the world could be different. One was Cranberry, Rowan's best friend. Her hair was twisted into lots of tiny braids, with the tips dyed dark red to match her name, and she had the most perfect teeth Leaf had ever seen. She had been part of a traveling entertainment troupe before they'd been attacked by dragons, and she'd been separated from them. She'd turned up in Talisman when Leaf was 12, and she was still hoping the rest of her troop would find her there. In the meanwhile, she'd taught Leaf all her acrobatic moves. Together, they'd practice cartwheels and handsprings and backflips. There was also a pair of brothers, Mushroom and Time, who were clearly there because everyone liked Time, and so they were stuck with Mushroom. Time was short and charming and didn't take training seriously, but he loved talking about what the Dragon Palace must be like and all the many kinds of treasure they would find there. His twin brother was more square-jawed, a little taller, a lot gloomier, and tended to complain whenever he was tired, or it was raining, or when his brother did something better than he did, which was often. Leaf had seen him glaring at time behind his back more than once, especially whenever time had Cranberry's full attention. But Leaf didn't really care about all their drama or the treasure they spent so much time talking about. They made him laugh and helped him train, but most important, they kept him focused on his goal. He was going to be a dragon slayer. Together they would find the dragons and start getting rid of them. Even if Thyme or Mushroom or Cranberry were only doing this for treasure, the result would be a safer village and a safer world. Have you found anything in Old Trout's house yet? Grove asked him one day, after Leaf had been an apprentice for half a year. Any secrets? He asked casually, with a grin, as though this was a joke. 
but there was a layer of intensity under his smile. Two days earlier, the dragon mancers had had a vision that Grove's father had expanded his small farm too far, enough to attract the dragon's attention. They'd ordered him to cut down his sunflowers, pull up half his vegetables, and give all of that, plus two goats, to the village, which, according to Grove, meant it would all be going into the dragon mancer's pockets. Grove had argued with Master Trout at the village meeting, in front of everyone. He'd asked to at least have a vote on how the food would be redistributed. There were families who actually needed it. But Master Trout refused to call a vote. He pointed out that he was the one in charge, and Grove was an outsider who should sit down and listen to his elders. None of the other landholders had stood up for Grove or his father. They all avoided his eyes and stayed out of their way, afraid of attracting the dragon mancer's wrath. So Leaf knew there was more to Grove's question than usual. He locks his study, and we're not allowed in, Leaf said. Sometimes he brings out a book and gives us a lecture on dragon kings or how much they eat, and then he takes it back inside and locks the door again. He tossed his knife high into the air and caught it neatly as it spun back down. If there are any secrets, they must be in there. But I doubt we'll find anything like you're hoping for, Grove. I can't see Trout leaving himself notes like, Excellent lie about the visions today. More sunflowers for us, mwahaha. Maybe not, Grove said, stealing the knife out of the air as Leaf threw it again. But there must be something we can use. Or why would he lock it? It's not all lies, Cranberry said from her perch in a nearby tree. I've been keeping track. Their visions about dragons flying overhead are right more than half the time. I want to know the secret to that. Lucky guesses, Grove said dismissively. Leaf snagged the knife out of his grasp again, but Grove was so worked up he didn't even notice. Dragons are always flying overhead. There's nothing amazing about predicting that. I think everything they say is a lie, and we need some kind of proof. You'll have to break into the study next time he's out, Leaf. It's too dangerous to ask Leaf to do that, Rowan chimed in. He practically belongs to Master Trout right now. The dragon mancers could do all kinds of terrible things to him if they catch him spying on them. She gave Grove a significant look that didn't mean anything to Leaf. You're right. I'll do it, Grove said. Just tell me the next time he'll be gone for a while, and I'll find a way in. The opportunity came six days later, when Master Trout went to a vision session with the other two dragon mancers, and Leaf's fellow apprentice had the day off, so Leaf was alone in the house. Grove crawled through the garden and ducked past the goats, and Leaf led him in the back door. His study is up here, Leaf said, leading the way upstairs. His heart was pounding, but more with excitement than fear. If Master Trout returned and caught them, Leaf guessed he would probably be banished from the village, but at least he wouldn't have to be an apprentice anymore. Grove tinkered with a lock for a while, a long while, long enough to tip Leaf a bit toward nervous, but finally something clicked in the mechanism and the door swung open. His secret lair, Grove whispered, and Leaf thought of tarantulas again. You don't have to come in, Grove added. Go for a walk. Make sure someone sees you. Give yourself an alibi. Leaf shook his head. I want to see what he's hiding, too. The room was dark and shadowy. The only window was covered with a thick curtain, and all the lamps were out. It smelled like cinnamon-dusted mold, one sharp, pleasant scent scattered over a deeper, wetter, more rotten odor. A movement on the desk made Leaf's heart leap out of his chest until he realized it was a small cage with a coiled snake inside. Creepy, Grove said, pointing to the snake. He strode over to the desk and studied the papers on it for a moment without touching them. Leaf headed toward the bookshelves instead. They lined two walls, but were only about a quarter full of books. The rest of the shelf space was taken up by weird oversized artifacts most of them gleaming with gems. A diamond-studded hourglass as tall as Leaf was. A loop of metal that he thought at first might be a belt, but with a ruby embedded in it like a ring. A copper cup that Leaf could have climbed into, etched with flames. These are dragon's things, 
Leaf realized. There had been a rumor a few years ago that someone found a dragon-sized silver spoon in the woods, but the dragon mancers had spirited it away and hushed up the story. They must collect any objects dropped or lost by the dragons, or at least Trout does. There's so much here, though. Have the dragons really just casually dropped all this treasure? He supposed the dragon mancers had been here since the founding of the village, 30 or 40 years ago. Maybe over that much time, it was possible. But it made him wonder what was in the large, triple padlocked safe behind the desk. He took a step back from a heavy gold paperweight shaped like an eye and felt something in the wooden floor below his bare feet. When he crouched to look closer, he discovered a deep scratch arcing out from the bookshelf, as if the shelf had been dragged back and forth several times. Leaf hooked his fingers on the shelf, and it slid easily forward along the groove. An enormous piece of paper was nailed to the wall behind the bookshelf, taller than Leaf. The edges were crinkled, as though they wanted to roll in, and the drawing on it was part map, part blueprint. Grove, Leaf whispered. What am I looking at? Grove came to stand beside him, and they stared at it for a long time. I think, Grove said finally, it looks like a palace. A dragon's palace, Leaf agreed. In the mountains. This is the home of the mountain dragon queen, isn't it? That's where I need to go. That's where Ren's killer is. But why does Master Trout have this? The blueprint was covered in little notes and details, good spot for climbing and heavily patrolled and frequently set on fire. Do not go this way. Some of them were in a language with letters Leaf didn't recognize, but many of them were legible, and some of those were in Master Trout's own handwriting. Leaf knew it well by now. Has Trout been to the dragon's palace? Leaf wondered. How would he know any of this? And where did he get this drawing in the first place? Grove asked. Did he draw it himself? No, Leaf said. He can't even draw a straight line. His sketch for the garden plot was a mess. He reached up and gently ran one finger over the strange symbols that were inked over every room. Did dragons draw this? Grove said in a hushed voice. Is that dragon language? That's not possible. Leaf whispered back. Dragons don't have a written language, do they? And surely they couldn't make art or detailed blueprints like this. He glanced sideways at the flames carved into the giant copper cup. That was a kind of art, he supposed. And now that he looked closer, there were little etchings around the rim that matched some of the symbols on the map. He felt a strange, creeping unease crawl along his skin. He'd always thought of slaying dragons as akin to wiping out a plague of deadly insects or fighting a bloodthirsty shark. If they could draw maps and write, that made them something else again. Not human, but not as mindlessly animal as he'd thought either. Hey, Wren interrupted his train of thought. If they're so smart and literate and talented, maybe they should know better than to eat equally smart, literate, talented seven-year-olds. I think that's it, Grove said. This is the dragon's map of their own palace. Trout must have stolen it from the dragons a long time ago, judging from how many notes he's added since then. Leaf couldn't believe it. He couldn't imagine Master Trout sneaking into a dragon's palace, or escaping uneaten, or even walking as far as the palace in the first place. Maybe he sent someone else. Leaf traced the yellowing edges of the map. That seems more like him. This looks so old. Maybe he sent an apprentice a long time ago, before we were even born. Maybe that's why Talisman is here in the first place, Grove said thoughtfully. I've always thought it was weird that someone built a village this close to the mountain dragons. Maybe it started as a treasure smuggler's den, and then the smugglers got old and became dragon mancers instead. Different kind of thieves, but still stealing. Do you think that's their big secret? Leaf asked Grove. That they used to steal dragon treasure? Grove rubbed his head. I feel like there must be something else. Something bigger.
Leif stared at the spires of the Dragon Palace, trying to picture Trout and Crow and Gorge as young treasure smugglers. Or as young anything, ever. If Grove's theory was right, that made it even more hypocritical that the Dragon Mancers had forbidden anyone to go to the Mountain Palace. Now that sounds like Trout, Wren grumbled in his head. Stealing treasure for himself, then stopping anyone else from getting any? Well, I'm going, Leif told her, no matter what they do to stop me. We need this, Leif said, tapping the map. This is exactly what we need. But we can't take something this enormous, Grove said. Can you copy it? If I had a year, maybe, Leif said. Start now, then, Grove said. He grabbed a piece of paper from one of the messy piles on the floor. On one side, Master Trout had written the first few lines of a lecture and then crossed them out. The other side was blank. Grove shoved it and a charcoal pencil into Leaf's hands. But all these details, Leaf said helplessly. Where should he begin? What was important and what could he leave out? It was too much. He couldn't do this alone. Just do the best you can, Grove said. I'll show you how to pick the lock, and you can come in and work on it any chance you get. I wish Wren were here, Leaf admitted. He looked down at the floor. He hadn't said those words out loud in years. Me too, said the Wren in his head. I'd be great at copying this map, uncovering Trout's secrets, and figuring out how to break into a dragon palace. Imagine that she is. Grove said, touching Leaf's shoulder. Think of what her advice would be, and imagine her watching you. She'd be excited about this, wouldn't she? I remember she was always either mad or excited about something. That's true, Wren whispered. Stealing something this incredible from those jerk-faced dragonmancers? You clearly have to. Do it for me. Leaf sat down and started to draw. Chapter 9 Ivy This is it! Ivy danced around Violet's room, throwing her arms wide. This is the day we finally become wing watchers. I can't believe it! I can't believe you talked us into this, Violet said from her hammock. She turned a page of her book. I'm supposed to be on the law council track. Boring! Daffodils shouted. She grabbed Ivy's hands and spun her around. We're going to see dragons, and watch dragons, and ride dragons. Seeing and watching are the same thing, Violet observed. And you are definitely not going to ride any dragons, you lunatic. Ivy had imagined this day for so long, but she had never thought it would all really happen, that she'd still be best friends with Violet and Daffodil when they were 13, that they'd be speaking to one another, that they'd all be starting wing watcher training together. Let's go now she suggested. Let's be early. That will be so novel for Daffodil, Violet said. I'm not sure her heart could take it. I was early for school once last year, Daffodil said proudly. Her face darkened. Because Daisy tricked me about what time it really was. That only worked once, though. I never let her fool me again. Now that they were 13, Daffodil had switched to a ponytail and she usually managed to lose the yellow ribbon her mother put in, most often before lunch. Out of the three of them, she was probably the most excited about the wing watcher uniform, since it meant she could finally wear a dark color. Violet was the tallest and got the best grades, except when their teachers marked her down for asking too many questions or arguing about details. She'd cut her hair to chin length, and she'd convinced Ivy to draw matching dragon wings on the backs of all their hands. Everyone thought they represented their new wing watcher status, but they were secretly symbols of the truth seekers. Ivy had thought about cutting her hair too, but she knew her mother would be upset if she did. Mother was already not convinced that being a wing watcher was a good idea, so Ivy didn't want to give her anything else to fuss about. The wing watcher welcome ceremony was in one of the bigger caves not far from the exit where Ivy had been sneaking out with Foxglove for the last five years. Two wing watchers were already there when they arrived. Squirrel and the commander, Brooke. 
Most wing watchers started training at age 13, guarding the exits at age 15, running missions outside at age 16, and then, if they survived, usually retired back to another job inside the caves, sometime between ages 22 and 25. Brooke was one of the few who'd stayed on. She was somewhere in her 40s, won every strength competition the village ever had, and apparently loved recruiting new wing watchers more than anything else in the world. My babies, she yelled enthusiastically as Ivy, Violet, and Daffodil came in. So ready to learn. You're my favorites. She galloped over and shook all their hands, beaming. What about me? Forrest asked, coming in behind them with an injured expression. You are my favorite son, Brooke clarified. These three are my favorite recruits. Forrest looked skeptical about that distinction, perhaps because he was Brooke's only son. Ivy would not have guessed, five years ago, that he'd ever want to be a wing watcher like his mother. She still didn't think he could make it through an entire silent patrol without pretending to fart, laughing his head off, falling out of a tree, or accidentally setting something on fire. Violet was entirely certain that he'd only been allowed to join because of Brooke, although, as she said, they also took Daffodil, so maybe they just have very low standards. Which had prompted Daffodil to steal all of Violet's writing utensils for a week, a very Violet-specific form of torture. Ivy, Brooke said. Any word from your Uncle Stone? Ivy shook her head. Her uncle had left Valor abruptly a year earlier, and hadn't been seen since. His cave was still reserved for him, in the hope that he would return. Sorry to hear that. The commander shook her head. He never quite recovered from what happened in the desert. What do you mean? What happened? Violet asked sharply, but Brooke was distracted by the arrival of more guests and bounded away without answering. Hmm, Daffodil said, giving Violet a one-eyebrow-raised look. Indeed, Violet said. Secrets are afoot. Ivy, do you know what she meant? Ivy shook her head, but she had a vague memory of asking her mother why Uncle Stone was always so sad and getting the impression that there was a reason she was too young to know about. The cave gradually filled with current wing watchers, the other three recruits, and their families. Daffodil's sister Daisy waved at Ivy from across the food table, but Daffodil dragged Ivy away before she could go say hi. Violet's dads both stopped by to hug each of them, still looking vaguely confused about why Violet was doing this at all. Finally, Foxglove came over, beaming, to greet Ivy and her friends. I brought you something, Ivy said to her shyly, handing her a folded note. Inside was Ivy's best ever drawing of a dragon in flight, a black one, like the one they'd seen together that first day, with its glorious wings filling the page. In the corner, she'd written, Thank you for everything. Aw, Foxglove said with a grin, studying the drawing. I didn't have to say anything to get you in, you know. Brooke wanted you as soon as she saw the first drawing in your portfolio. We haven't had a recruit with artistic talent in years. She winked at Ivy, tucking the drawing into her pocket. Maybe it's time for an updated wing watcher's guide. Yes. Can I write the words? Violet interjected. I have so many suggestions. So do I, Daffodil chimed in. Violet eyed her disapprovingly. I have good suggestions and a passing grade in writing, unlike some people. I passed, Daffodil objected. I did pass. Passing on the second try is still passing. I am a great writer, Violet know-it-all face. Ivy, who's a better writer? Violet demanded. Eep, Ivy said. I'm definitely not answering that. Because it's me, Violet said pityingly to Daffodil. And she doesn't want you to have a huge temper tantrum about it. Because it's me, Daffodil said furiously. And she knows you will act all wounded and offended for a year if she tells you so. Nobody's writing a new guide yet, Ivy interrupted trying to sound as soothing as possible. We have lots of research to do before there's enough information for that. Research, Violet sighed happily. 
Daffodil wrinkled her nose. Which will require expeditions, Ivy said to her. Up into the mountains, maybe out to the desert. Ooh, Daffodil said with shining eyes. I like your wings, Foxglove said, pointing to the back of Violet's hand. Yeah, they're awesome. Ivy drew them, Violet said. Are you planning to retire soon, Foxglove? The wing watcher looked startled. She'd met Ivy's friends before, and even taken them outside a few times, but she hadn't spent a lot of time in the line of fire of Violet's blunt questions. No, I don't think so, she said. She glanced around the cave. Most of us are planning to stay on for a while. I noticed that, Violet said. I noticed that no one from Pines here has retired, even though you all could by now, if you wanted to. Foxglove tilted her head at Violet with a thoughtful expression. After a moment, she said, most people don't talk about Pine very much anymore, because they're usually talking about whoever the latest banishment was instead, Violet said. But I bet you guys still talk about him. Him and the other three wing watchers who've been banished since then. It's not actually safe to talk about them too much, Foxglove observed, taking a step back from Violet, but still studying her curiously. If you have thoughts about them, perhaps you could share them with me later in a quieter setting. Oh, look, Squirrel needs my help with the strawberries. Excuse me. She dove back into the crowd and hurried away. You are as subtle as a grizzly bear, Daffodil hissed. We're all wing watchers now, aren't we? Violet said with a dazzling smile. I'm just interested in what the older wing watchers think about and talk about, and also hypothetically possibly whether there's a secret wing watcher conspiracy afoot. What? Ivy said, startled. I told you there's no way, Daffodil whispered, and that it's really rude to talk about in front of Ivy. Hey, Ivy objected. Are you serious? You guys are keeping a secret from me? I didn't want to, Violet said. Daffodil made me. And just this once, you're terrible at it? Daffodil threw up her hands. She should know, Violet said in a low voice. She might hear something, now that we'll be around them all the time. Know what? Ivy asked. What kind of conspiracy? What's your evidence? I suspect someone is planning a revolution, Violet whispered, in a voice nearly as dramatic as Daffodil's, most likely from within the Wing Watchers. They're not happy about how Valor is run. I've seen all kinds of clues. You have? Ivy's mind was reeling. That's the real reason Violet agreed to be a Wing Watcher, Daffodil said, folding her arms because she couldn't stand it if there was a conspiracy and she missed it. Oh, Ivy said. I thought it was because we were all excited about dragons. Violet put one arm around Ivy and glared at Daffodil. It is also because we are all excited to do this together, she said. Daffodil, stop ruining Ivy's big day. You're the one ruining it, Daffodil whispered furiously investigating non-existent conspiracies to overthrow Ivy's dad? Oh my goodness, Ivy said, everything hitting her at once. It couldn't be true, could it? The wing watchers were amazing and could do no wrong. She'd follow Commander Brooke and Foxglove to all three moons and back again. But if they were really plotting revolution, that meant taking down the government of Valor and the government meant Ivy's father, who happened to be swaggering into the cave at that very moment. Hello, wing watchers, he boomed. What an exciting day. Recruits, line up for inspection. Ivy stood between Violet and Daffodil, her usual spot. It kept them from elbowing each other, arguing or pulling each other's hair. With Forrest on the other side of Daffodil and Moth on the other side of Violet. She tried to shake off what her friends had said. Violet always saw secrets and conspiracies everywhere. She was right most of the time, but sometimes she was wrong. This had to be one of those times. The dragon slayer paced slowly down the line, wearing his very serious expression, 
which he put on for most formal occasions where people would be watching. What's this? He said, stopping in front of Ivy. How did you wing watchers get your talons on the smartest girl in valor? Young lady, I hope you don't have any plans to run right at the dragons like your brave old man. No, sir, Ivy said. But she couldn't stop herself from smiling back at him. He was joking, and it wasn't the most accurate joke. Ivy was far from the smartest girl in valor. That would be Violet. But it always felt something like sunlight when her father paid attention to her. I'll come poke them for you if you need me to, he said, patting his sword with one hand and clapping her on the shoulder with the other. We generally avoid poking them, sir, Commander Brooks said. Polite, but with a hint of judgment underneath. Heath squinted at her. Well, good, he said after a moment. Leave that to the dragon slayer, eh? He chuckled. Just take care of my little girl out there. Dad, Ivy said, embarrassed. Now this was too much attention. She didn't want to be treated any differently than the other wing watchers. She wondered if she was imagining the looks the older wing watchers were giving one another, as though her father were a wasp's nest hanging over their heads, as though they were deciding right then whether they could trust her or not. The wing watchers are some of the most important people in valor, Heath declared, standing back to survey them all. We have always needed brave young people like you to watch the skies for our greatest enemies. You protect us all. You are our first line of warning and defense. As long as we have wing watchers, the dragons will never find us. Of course, if they do, I'll slay them and save us all. But what you do is very important, too. Thank you for volunteering. Let's raise a toast to your sharp eyes and your courage. Ivy lifted the glass of apple cider someone handed her. She couldn't help remembering the day she'd seen her father race through the forest, fleeing in panic from the sound of a dragon. Courage wasn't the first thing that came to mind anymore when she thought about the dragon slayer. What if he shouldn't be the Lord of Valor anymore? It gave her chills inside and out to even think those words. At the end of the ceremony, and the toasting, and the eating, and the mingling, as people were starting to leave, Foxglove found Ivy again and gave her a hug. You did it, she said. That tiny little miscreant I met five years ago has finally become a real wing watcher. Well, I still have to go through training, Ivy said. Pshaw. Foxglove waved her hand in the air. You already know more than any of your teachers. Which reminds me, don't listen to a word Chipmunk says. He made sure all his outdoor missions were at night and hardly even saw one dragon. When do we get to start watching for dragons? Ivy asked. Tomorrow? Can we do a sky gazing mission tomorrow? Sky gazing could mean going outside and climbing a tree, or it could mean going to one of the spots in Valor with a view of the sky. Either way, Ivy would be happy to stare into the blue all day, waiting for a dragon. With Foxglove, so far she'd seen ten sand dragons, nine mountain dragons, two mud dragons, and one that was such a weird purplish color that they'd both decided the sun must have been in their eyes. They hadn't seen a black dragon again since the first day, but Ivy loved all of them. Is Foxglove part of the conspiracy? She suddenly thought. The world went sharp and then blurry around her. Is that the only reason she's been so nice to me all this time? Because she's using me to spy on my dad? That first day outside, when they'd followed Heath together, suddenly took on a very different light. That can't be it. She does like me for who I am. I know she does. Ivy wished she could go back to the beginning of the day, when all she was thinking about was how soon they could see another dragon. We'll see, Ivy who loves dragons, Foxglove said with a smile. She hesitated, then crouched beside Ivy. Listen, don't let the commander know how you feel about the dragons, all right? She lost a lot of people when the village burned. Oh, Ivy said, feeling guilty. Of course, I'll be careful. I'm sorry, I didn't know. She hadn't even thought about the fact that Brooke was old enough to have lived in the old village. That meant she'd known Heath before he was the dragon slayer. 
Ivy glanced across the cave at the wing watcher commander, who was trapped in a corner, listening to Ivy's father as he declaimed about something. Brooke was very good at keeping her face expressionless, but Ivy was very good at figuring out when people were angry or about to get angry. She could see the grip Brooke had on her cup of cider and the little lines of tension around her eyes. How did she really feel about the dragon slayer? If Violet was right, and someone in the Wing Watchers was planning a revolution, did Brooke know about it? Could it be Brooke herself? I'm a Wing Watcher now, Ivy thought. Brooke is my commander. But Dad is my dad. He made mistakes and lied a lot, but he still loved her in his way. And Mother loved him, and Ivy loved him too, the side of him that was her father. If Violet and Daffodil found proof of a secret conspiracy, what was Ivy going to do? Will I have to choose between my friends, my dream, and the dragons, or my family? Part 2 Chapter 10 Wren After seven years living on her own with a dragon, Wren figured she probably knew more about the geography of the world than any other human in it. She'd finally given up on the useless maps most people had and was working on her own. It was beautiful, if she did say so herself, and intricately detailed. It certainly helped to have a dragon's eyes overhead, describing the coastline and spotting landmarks for her. The summer after she met Undauntable, she and Skye had traveled all the way to the north edge of the mountains, circling far around Talisman and the Palace of the Mountain Dragons. They'd gone to the farthest point of the peninsula and discovered hidden villages there where people lived in relative safety, at least compared to the villages directly below the dragon's wings. Wren wasn't interested in human villages, though, except as places where she could trade her old books for new ones. She didn't trust people, especially the ones who made clucking noises and asked where her parents were and invited her to their houses for a meal. She never stayed near human settlements longer than a night, and she never went inside their buildings for any reason. Once they'd reached the top of the continent, she and Skye had turned south and gone down the coast, looking out to the Great Bay and the distant islands. Skye liked to gallop along the beach and then gallop back, shaking sand off his wings all over her. He loved hermit crabs nearly as much as snails. And then he met his first baby turtle and nearly fainted with joy. Is this all because you wish you had your own shell you could hide inside? Wren asked. They'd developed a sort of hybrid human-dragon language between them, shifting back and forth between the two, depending on which words they knew of each. So cute, Sky warbled, near tears. He lay down beside the turtle and rested his head on his front claws. I love it, Wren. Look at its little head. Look at its little feet. It is the sweetest, best little animal in the whole history of the universe. Don't let the snails hear you say that, Wren teased. They might get jealous. They'd camped on that beach for days so Skye could make sure the baby turtle made it to the ocean and survived and had a wonderful life ahead of it. Wren kindly decided not to tell him she was pretty sure the ocean dragons ate turtles. Hopefully they'd miss this particular one. They saw the blue and green dragons often, soaring out over the water or diving into the waves. Twice, Wren saw a sea dragon swoop down and then fly up again with an actual shark thrashing in its talons. She stayed a little closer to the tree line after that. The dragons of the sea didn't seem all that interested in hunting for land animals, but she was quite ready to hide if they suddenly changed their minds. The river delta and the swamps after it were tricky to navigate, plus potentially full of dragons hiding under the mud, so Wren suggested going back into the mountains. But then Skye had a wonderful idea. You could ride on me, he announced, and I could fly over the swamps. Wren studied him dubiously. They had wandered into a cluster of mangrove trees, and not being able to see what was in the water around her feet had made her nervous. So she was sitting up on one of the branches, deciding what to do next. Sky was perched on a tree beside her. 
He was still very small compared to all the other dragons they saw, but he was more than twice Ren's size by this point, and the tree was drooping unhappily underneath him. That would be great, Ren said, but I'm not sure you're big enough yet. She was politely avoiding, saying, and also you're a rather dreadful flyer. Sky had enormous enthusiasm, very little sense of direction, and a habit of getting distracted by seagulls, forgetting to flap, and suddenly plummeting out of the sky. Ren thought he was very likely to accidentally fly her into a tree. Climb on, Sky offered hopefully. Let's try. He edged a bit closer, wobbling as the branch bowed lower. Well, all right, said Ren. She had kind of been dreaming of this moment since Sky first managed to jump off a boulder and go up instead of down. After all, who would have a dragon for a best friend and never fly with him? She scrambled onto Sky carefully, settling her legs right above his wings and wrapping her arms around his neck. This is weird, she said. This used to be the other way around. Hang on, he yelped happily and leaped into the sky. Five minutes later, they crashed into the ocean. Ren floundered back onto the beach, laughing. I'm sorry, Sky yelped, splashing after her. I'm sorry. Let's try again. We will, Ren said, when you're a little bigger. She waded over to him and hugged him fiercely. That was amazing. So they went back into the mountains. But the next year, Sky was a lot bigger, and they were able to fly over the entire swamplands and see the peninsula and islands on the far end of the continent. They also saw another human city out there, as big as the indestructible city, and just as likely to shoot flaming things at dragons, it turned out, so they flew away without investigating any further. Later on, they followed the indestructible city's river to the southern coast and flew east, along the edge of the rainforest, with Ren making notes on her map about the peninsulas and islands down there. They were both curious about the rainforest, but it made a lot of strange noises and looked very dense and hard to fly in. So in the end, they colored that whole section of the map dark green, labeled it Here Be Trees, and left it at that. Sky practiced until he was a brilliant flyer, according to Ren, and he was always very careful when he was carrying her. The only part of the continent they hadn't really explored was the desert and the Arctic tundra above it. Every time they looked at the desert, Ren got nervous. She didn't like the idea of being so exposed of having nowhere to hide from other dragons or from other people. Whenever Ren ran out of things to read or needed new clothes, they'd go back to their hidden valley and Sky would wait while she ventured down to the indestructible city. There, Ren would climb a tree and watch the line at the cliff for days if necessary. It was never more than two until Prince Undauntable showed up. Then she would go down, give him another dragon scale, and get everything she needed. Once, when Ren thought she was around 12, Undauntable asked her to come into the city to visit his manor. It's really big, he said proudly. Wow, Cat agreed. Even though Undauntable had grown to be slightly taller than Ren, a fact she disliked, the cat was still much too big for him, and he still carried it everywhere. And Ren still refused to call it Dragon. You'll be very impressed, he added. He swept his hair back in what he probably thought was a dramatic fashion. He'd grown it long, trimmed his eyebrows, and was wearing one of Skye's scales embedded in a big silver ring. His robes were pale orange, perhaps to match. Meh, Ren said with a shrug. She picked up another book. They'd found a family in line who had at least ten books she'd never seen before. She couldn't carry them all but she was having a hard time choosing between them. A house is a house, just a bunch of walls. These are big walls, he said crossly. It's way bigger than your house. So, said Ren, your city has far too many walls for me. I have a feeling if I went up there, I'd never be able to get back down. She thought, and then Skye would try to come rescue me, and they'd shoot at him. That's silly, said the prince but you won't want to leave anyway, 
once you see how big and amazing it is. Oh, said Wren. And would I get to be adopted by a big, fancy family so I could have my own walls? And maybe a collar so everyone knows I belong to them? You could bring your own family, he said, in the voice he used when he thought he was being sly and gathering information. How many would that be? I could tell Dad to find a place for you. Wouldn't they be so pleased? Everyone wants to live here and hardly anyone can, but he'd listen to me. Ooh, you could live next door to me. I don't like our neighbors anyway. I don't mind kicking them out. I do not want to live in the indestructible city, Wren said firmly. But then you could see me all the time, he wheedled. She arched an eyebrow at him. What makes you think either of us would like that? The, because I'm the, everyone wants to be friends with me, he blurted. If I lived next door to you, Wren pointed out, I wouldn't be able to bring you the dragon scales you love. Just think about that as you look around at all your hundreds of friends. I could have one more friend who barely tolerates me, or I could have the most unique dragon scales in the city. Then you'll feel better. You don't understand anything, he grumbled. I'll take these five, Wren said to the woman with the books. You buy the other five, she said to Undauntable, and bring them to me next time I come back. What? Just carry them up and down from the city every day in case you show up? He demanded indignantly. Don't pretend like you ever walk those steps, Wren said with a laugh. You have your own fancy basket these days. I saw it. A person basket had been added next to the cargo platform in the last few years. She wondered how many people used it besides the prince, and she wondered whether he came down often, looking for her when she wasn't here. She put her new books in the knapsack she'd just bought as well, pretending not to pay attention, but she was pleased to note Undauntable buying the other books behind her and handing them to his bodyguard. So when will you be back? He asked, following her as she strolled to the end of the line. I don't know, she said, like she always said, but we'll both survive until then. You'd better, he said. Wren started toward the river and was enormously surprised when he grabbed her hand. She looked at him, and he immediately let go. I was just going to say, he said quickly, that I'm very mad you won't come see my house. But, but I hope you come back soon because you are not boring. Don't stay away a whole year again this time. Was it a whole year? Wren asked. Huh, well, we'll see. He looked sort of wounded, so she added, you are reasonably interesting yourself, I guess. Probably the second most interesting friend I have. That seemed to cheer him up. So she did not add that she only had two friends, and that he just barely squeaked into the category at all. This backfired a little, however, when two years later, he asked her to marry him. Chapter 11 Leaf Leaf spread the blueprint on the table, and Cranberry leaned over it with a gasp of awe. You did it, Grove said. Leaf, this is amazing. You're crazy brave, kid, said Time. It had taken him months of stolen moments to copy the blueprint, carefully penciling in every detail he could while his heart pounded and every noise sounded like Master Trout returning. This is really the Mountain Dragon's palace? Mushroom said skeptically. How do we know? What the heck is this? He pointed to a smudge in the top left corner. And over here. Prison? That doesn't look like a prison. It looks like a bunch of columns. I just copied it, Leaf said. We'll have to trust that whoever made it, and all the people who added notes to it, knew what they were doing. Mushroom snorted, but everyone else nodded. This changes everything, Leaf. Rowan said. It was risky, but it means our plan might actually work now. He smiled up at her. Even though he was a tall 15-year-old, she was still taller than him. I did it for Wren, he said. Sadness, and something else flickered in her expression, and she looked away quickly. I don't know, Mushroom grumbled. If this is even remotely correct, it means our plan is more stupid than it was before. 
Look at all the levels. Where do they even keep their treasure? According to the notes, most of it is here, Leif said, pointing to a pair of rooms near the center of the palace. But we don't know how old this map is, or whether the dragons have moved it by now. Great, Mushroom rolled his eyes. So we're going to sneak into a palace full of dragons based on a kid's scribbled copy of an ancient, unreliable drawing that might be a total fantasy. Heck yeah, I'll do it, Time volunteered. I'm not scared. He winked cheekily at his brother, which even Leaf could guess was a bad idea. Mushroom scowled and stalked out of the room, muttering to himself. Thank you, Leaf, Grove said, putting one hand on Leaf's shoulder. Go back to the Dragon Mancers. We'll study this and decide what to do. Two days later, Rowan appeared at the gate of Master Trout's garden in the middle of the day. This never happened, and Leaf had also never seen her face do what it was doing, which was something like trying not to freak out, and something like falling apart, and something like she was about to stab someone all at the same time. Um, he said, glancing down the row of beans at the other apprentice, who was out of earshot, he hoped, working on the flower beds near the house. Hi? Leaf, Rowan whispered, clutching the gate posts and crouching down to talk through the slats. We have a problem. Leaf deliberately spilled his basket of beans next to the fence and knelt to pick them up. What's wrong? He whispered back. Master Trout was inside the house, but could be spying on them through one of the dusty curtains. Rowan rubbed her fingers together nervously. The map, she said. The blueprint, whatever, it's gone. Now Leaf knocked over his basket for real. What? He cried. What do you mean? Did you tear it? Can't we fix it? No, it's really gone, she said. I mean vanished, like stolen. By who? Leaf's body felt chilled, like icy fish scales were trailing over his skin. The dragon mancers? Did they find out what I did? Rowan shook her head. It was well hidden. It had to be one of us, she hesitated. And the only one missing is Mushroom. Missing, Leaf echoed. Something bad was happening, but he didn't understand it. Why would Mushroom steal the map they were all going to use together? Where was he? We think he's gone to the dragon's palace on his own, she said. So he can use the map to steal the treasure for himself. Mushroom, Leaf said but he'll definitely mess it up, especially by himself. I know, Rowan said. What do we do? Leaf asked. How far away is the Dragon Palace? Does he have a big head start? Can we catch up to him? Catch up to who? A nasal voice interrupted them. Rowan winced, then looked over her shoulder as Leaf slowly got to his feet. The other two Dragon Mancers had snuck up on them, and were now standing on the path behind Leaf's sister. The female dragon mancer, Crow, was tall and gaunt, with brittle hair in a gray toadstool-like shape around her head, and wrinkles of disapproval permanently scored around her mouth. She always spoke as though she was the only person in the room whose opinion mattered. She also had a habit of repeating the last thing she'd said again, more loudly, as if to stick it firmly in people's minds. The other one was Gorge a man with a lizard's face, terrible skin, and slick hair, who couldn't muster a natural smile to save his life. His perpetual expression was sly, insecure, and malevolently gleeful at the same time, as though he knew full well that everyone he met wanted to punch him, but couldn't because of his power. Yes, children, he said. Who were you talking about? No one, Leaf answered, at the same time as Rowan said, a friend? He went hunting, Rowan added quickly. Alone, and he's kind of clumsy, so we're just worried about him. No big deal. It is a terrible, terrible idea to lie to a dragon man, sir, Crow said. Terrible. I'm sure you will not make that mistake, apprentice. She turned a sharp eye on Leaf. And while you frantically decide how much to tell me, I will generously mention that we heard you say, Dragon's Palace. So please, 
Don't leave that part out. Do not leave it out. Leaf knew that she was giving them a chance, and a second lie would have bad consequences. But he didn't know how much they'd heard. Did they know about the map? He had to risk some of the truth, but maybe not all of it. We think our friend Mushroom has gone to the dragon's palace, he admitted hesitantly. He, he's always talking about stealing treasure, and we think maybe he's gone to try. Even though we've forbidden it, Gorge demanded. What a doomed idiot. Crow's eyebrows sank down and together, and she sucked in air between her teeth. This could be a disaster, she hissed. I know, Rowan said. He'll probably get eaten. Much worse than that, Crow interrupted. If the dragons catch him, they could decide to punish the entire village for his crime. We could all be on fire by this time tomorrow. On fire! Perhaps, Gorge said slyly. Someone could do something about this. We can stop him, Rowan said. We'll leave now and catch him before he gets to the palace. Leaf wondered what she was thinking behind that determined, helpful face. What would they really do if and when they caught Mushroom and got the map back? He had a feeling Rowan, Grove, and Time would still want to sneak into the palace. But was Crow right about what would happen to the village? Not if I kill the dragons first, his heart whispered. It's been a long time since you or I had any new dragon treasure, Gorge said in his slithering voice, sliding his hands together. So many useless weak apprentices, so prone to getting eaten before they can achieve their goals. Treasure smuggler, Ren whispered scornfully in Leaf's head. That's what they really want, more treasure, more power. They don't care about the village. Did they once send apprentices to steal treasure? Leaf wondered back. Is that why no apprentice has lived long enough to join the ranks of the dragonmancers? That's true, Crow said slowly. It would be very enriching for everyone if certain parties returned with dragon treasure and shared it with the correct people. But if the expedition were unsuccessful, that would be such a shame. Such a shame. Indeed, said Gorge. If our intrepid explorer snuck off to the dragon palace, but did not return with treasure. I imagine the dragons would require a sacrifice, Crow said. A big, big sacrifice. Wait, said Leaf. So you do want us to steal treasure, even though you forbade it? Hypocrisy from a dragon man, sir? Ren muttered. I'm shocked. Shocked. Shh, said Crow. Your friend set this in motion. This is all his fault. These are the consequences. I only see one happy ending here. We can catch Mushroom if you give us a chance, Rowan said quickly, before he even gets to the palace. No, 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 said Gorge. If you're going all that way, someone should go into the palace, steal something, and bring it back to us. Otherwise, I'm afraid something terrible will happen. Indeed, they want a stranger this time, Crow said in an eerie voice. Her eyes were unfocused, as though another story was unfolding in a mirror of the world between her and Leaf and Rowan. Yes. They want an outsider who brought danger to the village. Someone with too many questions. I sense this person draws the dragon's wrath. Their wrath. She's talking about Grove, Leaf realized. But surely she doesn't mean, she can't mean what it sounds like. What do you mean by a sacrifice? Leaf asked. Some of his goats? Has it been that long since our last one? Crow murmured, reaching a skeletal finger to trail down Leaf's cheek. He squelched his shudder and held himself rigidly still. I remember it like it was yesterday. I know you remember. Don't you, dear? 
she said to Rowan. We can stop Mushroom, Rowan said, talking over her last words. And we can bring you treasure. Let us go after him and we'll make it happen. Hmm, Gorge said. I think we need our sacrifice standing by, just in case. He beckoned to Leaf's fellow apprentice, who had been watching from the flower beds, while trying very hard to look as though he hadn't noticed the other dragon mancers. Tadpole approached nervously, glancing between the four of them. Go find young Grove for me, Gorge said. Take him to the dragon mancer's council hut and make sure he stays there to wait for us. Bring a few men from the village guard if you think you'll need help. We'll be there soon. Yes, sir, Tadpole said, bowing a few hundred times before hurrying away. You don't have to do this, Rowan said desperately. We didn't have to, Crow corrected her. But thanks to young Mushroom's greed, now we do. Grove will stay with us. All you have to do is follow your friend and return with some treasure, and everyone will be so happy. Ever, ever so happy. Rowan looked as though she'd been snared in a spider web as Crow and Gorge turned to walk away. We have to go now, Rowan said to Leaf, glancing up and down the quiet path. Do you need anything from in there? She nodded at the house. Leaf wished he could run in, grab the map off the wall, and escape, but he might as well wish for a flying carpet to the dragon's palace. Nothing, he said, swinging himself over the fence. Give me a sword and I'm ready. He was not planning on coming back to Trout's house. Whatever happened to the palace, whether he killed ten dragons or only one, he wasn't going to come moseying back to the drudgery of being a dragon mancer's apprentice afterward. His life as a dragon slayer was about to begin. They took the long way through the woods to avoid any townspeople. When they arrived at the schoolhouse, Cranberry and Time were standing outside it, looking confused. Rowan, Cranberry said as they ran up to her. A group of villagers just came and took Grove away. We don't know why. Wait, you do- What's happened? She added, seeing the look on Rowan's face. Crow and Gorge found out that Mushroom is on his way to steal treasure, Rowan said. We have to follow him and come back with treasure for them, or they're going to sacrifice Grove. The horror and enormity of that exploded in Leaf's head. He'd been trying so hard to convince himself that he'd misunderstood, that none of this could be happening, that Crow and Gorge had been talking about stealing more of Grove's goats instead. Do you really think that's what she meant? Leaf cried. No one would let them do that. We don't sacrifice people to the dragons. Of course we don't, Cranberry said. But Rowan looked physically sick, like she really believed the dragon mancers were capable of such a thing. All I know for sure is they took Grove, she said. And I know he isn't safe until we get back here and pay them off. Then let's go, Leaf said. Whatever the dragon mancers meant, whether Rowan was right or not, they still had to catch Mushroom and get the map back. Cranberry, I need a sword. Cranberry led the way to their secret stash of weapons and handed him a sheathed sword, which he buckled around his back. Two more daggers went into his boots, and then he was off and sprinting through the forest ahead of everyone else. He knew they would follow him, even though he was ten years younger than they all were. One upside of putting himself in danger to copy the map was that now it was kind of etched in his brain. He didn't like the idea of relying on his memory, but he was pretty sure it was all there, every careful line and each tiny note painstakingly redrawn. He also knew that the Dragon Palace was north of the village, near the source of the river, so following the river would make logical sense. But he wasn't sure whether Mushroom would think of it. Doing the smart, logical thing was clearly not Mushroom's strong suit. They traveled north all the rest of that day and half the night, only stopping because time finally fell over and said he couldn't go any farther without some sleep. Leaf offered to take the first watch, and spent most of it climbing to the highest spots around them, looking for any sign of a campfire that might be mushroom. But there was nothing. No sign of him anywhere. The same was true on the second day and the third. They climbed along the ridges of the mountains, keeping the river in sight, 
with the peaks slashing sharply in the sky above them, like dragon claws. Dragons the color of flames flew overhead day and night, bursting through the clouds or swooping suddenly over the next peak and sending them all diving for cover. They found remains of campfires, and once, a discarded fishing net, but none of them looked new enough to be mushrooms. He was nowhere to be found. On the fourth morning, they came out of a long stretch of trees onto a section of boulders, and there it was at last, the Palace of the Mountain Dragons. Leaf had been full of wild energy for most of the trip, running on adrenaline and destiny. But as they all squashed themselves into the shadow of a boulder and lay down to stare out at the palace, for the first time, he felt a glimmer of fear. It was so enormous. He'd kind of known that from the scale of the blueprint, but he hadn't really absorbed it before. The palace looked like it had swept down from the sky and eaten most of the mountain. Towers seemed to grow out of the gray-black rocks. Every ledge was an entrance to the caves and halls carved out of the mountainside. Even from their vantage point, they could feel the crackling heat and smell the trails of smoke that hung in the air like clouds. And something that wasn't in the blueprint? The palace was swarming with dragons. Leaf had never imagined there were so many dragons in the world. From his vantage point, he was pretty sure he could see more dragons than there were people in all of Talisman. This was more than a village. This was a city of dragons. Dragons crawled over the mountain, building new parts of the palace or repairing collapsed towers. Dragons flew from ledge to ledge. Dragons soared in from afar to drop bodies of other dragons in the smoking ravine along one side of the palace. Dragons sat on the highest points of the castle walls, spreading their wings to sun themselves. How could there be so many dragons in one place? Despite all his strength and skill, Leaf felt as small as an ant. An ant who dreamed of killing a whole city of dragons. He spotted the prison that had been in the blueprint, the tall columns set off to the side, around some kind of arena. He could see more dragon wings glittering from the top of each column, and a sort of web between them all. He wasn't quite sure how a prison like that could hold dragons, but that was one of those mysteries he was perfectly happy to leave unsolved. Yeesh, Time whispered beside him. I know, Cranberry whispered from Leaf's other side. Like, couldn't you be a little more impressive, dragons? Rowan snorted a nervous laugh. Do you remember the ways in? She asked Leaf. Leaf took a deep breath, calling the blueprint back into his mind. There weren't a lot of entrances at ground level, since dragons usually arrived from the sky. They would have to climb half the mountain, with dragons flying all around them, to get to the lowest entry point, which was where a trash chute led out from the palace above. The note beside it had said, not an ideal option. It might be easier, and less smelly, to go in through the prison arena, which had a low entrance but was also in full view of all the dragon prisoners and any passing guards. He studied the palace, mapping it onto the blueprint in his mind. If the prison was there, and those two towers were there, then the trash chute hole should be. Leaf reached over Cranberry and grabbed Rowan's arm. Look, he whispered frantically. She raised herself onto her elbows and cupped her hands around her eyes. Not far below the hole, a small shape was making his way up the side of the mountain. His gray clothing blended in with the rocks and smoke, and he was inching upward at a snail's pace, creeping from shadow to shadow. Leaf wasn't sure if that was Mushroom being cautious or Mushroom being slow and tired. Oh no, Time whispered. He must have stolen the map a whole day before we noticed, Cranberry said. He had more of a head start than we thought. What do we do now? Leaf asked. It's too late to stop him, isn't it? Rowan didn't answer. They watched in silence as the figure climbed higher and higher, and then finally, with agonizing slowness, pulled himself into the trash chute and vanished into the dark interior of the palace. I guess now we wait and see, Rowan said finally. Either he'll come out alive, or he won't. 
And if he does, Time said, he might need our help to get away safely. Leaf didn't say it, but he knew everyone must be thinking the same thing. There was no way a human could walk into that palace and come out alive. The map might help him, but the odds were far in the dragon's favor. That didn't mean Leaf wouldn't try. He wished he had the map, but he was going into that dragon palace, one way or another. This was something he had to do. He would take at least one dragon life for Renz, even if it meant certain death. Chapter 12 Ivy All you have to do is watch the sky, Foxglove said for the 80th time. Stay right here and don't move. If you see a dragon, remember everything about it and tell us later, when we come back for you. Do not leave this tree on your own. Oh my goodness, we know, Daffodil said laughing. We'll stay put. We promise, Ivy added. She wound one arm around the branch above her. Violet? Foxglove asked sternly. I promise too. Violet rolled her eyes and shoved herself up to a higher limb. If you three misbehave, Commander Brooke will never let any 14-year-olds outside alone ever again, Foxglove said. Think of your responsibility to future annoying teenagers. It's all we ever think of, Daffodil said sweetly. We'll be right here when you get back, Ivy said. Foxglove made a hmm sound and swung down out of the tree. Squirrel and two others were waiting for her on the ground, ready to escort a fruit-gathering party. The wing watchers would keep an eye out for dragons, help everyone hide if it was necessary, and bring them home safely. That's what wing watchers do, Ivy thought, watching them leave. They're protectors and researchers. They're not secret revolutionaries. They're not, no matter what Violet thinks. She hadn't seen any signs of a secret conspiracy during their first year of official training, but then again, she had to be the last wing watcher anyone would trust with information like that. Ivy, Violet, and Daffodil were only sky-gazing today. This was their third time officially sky-gazing outside, but the first time they were being left alone to do it. Ivy had practiced a lot with Foxglove, but most of the adult wing watchers didn't know that so she had to pretend it was all new and exciting to her. Then again, she wasn't really pretending. It was still pretty exciting. She could forget all her underground city worries when she watched for dragons. Violet had seen a sand dragon once, on a secret trip outside with Ivy and Foxglove, but Daffodil still hadn't seen any, and she was infinitely outraged about that. Ivy rested her back against the trunk and stared up into the blue sky. So, Violet said, as soon as the wing watchers and fruit gatherers were out of sight, I haven't had any luck with either secret. Have you? No, I haven't, said Daffodil. Although I kind of forgot we were supposed to be working on that. Violet sighed expressively. Ivy? I asked my mother again about Uncle Stone, Ivy said. But she said I'm still too young to hear about it. By all the dragons. Violet said, how bad is this secret if 14 is too young to know it? I don't think it's because she's 14, Daffodil offered. I think it's because she's Ivy, and her mom never wants her to know anything. Ivy couldn't argue with that. There were lots of things she only knew because Violet and Daffodil had explained them to her. I haven't even tried finding anything about the, um, the other secret, Ivy said. I figure, obviously, no one will talk to me about it. And maybe, I don't really want them to. No one should talk to anyone about it, Daffodil said. It's way too dangerous. Hey, you're the one whose life was ruined when Pine was banished, Violet pointed out. I'm basically doing this for you. You know nothing about love, Violet, Daffodil cried. And you are not doing this for me at all. You're doing it because you're nosy and can't stand it when other people know things that you don't. Only when they're important, Violet said. I thought you'd be all about starting a revolution. Causing chaos is literally your favorite thing. I don't have a problem with chaos or revolution. I have a problem with one of my best friends acting like an idiot, 
You can't be sure all the wing watchers are part of this imaginary secret revolution. If you say the wrong thing to the wrong person, they could turn you in for treason, and then you'll be banished. And then it'll suddenly be a lot quieter and less stressful around here. So, actually, never mind. You keep being you. Ivy laughed. Out here, with the wind blowing in her hair and the leaves rustling around them and dragons somewhere in the sky, even her friends bickering over dangerous conspiracies felt joyful. It was still weird to see Daffodil without a speck of yellow on her anywhere. Weird also to see Violet running through the woods and jumping over fallen trees instead of reading a book. But weird in a good way. Ivy was so, so happy to be outside in the amazing sunlit world with them. Even though they were talking about a revolution against her dad, today it just didn't seem real. It was hard to believe that people could be so mad at each other when there was all this sky and millions of trees and towers of beautiful gold-lined clouds overhead. And in those clouds, hey, she whispered, do you guys see that? It was so far up that she wasn't even sure it was a dragon, except that there wasn't anything else it could be. Birds didn't reflect the sunlight in little flashes. No bird was that big, or the color of diamonds, not at the same time. Daffodil inhaled sharply and clambered onto the branch right next to Ivy, so she could rest her head on Ivy's shoulder and look in the same direction. Daffodil, Violet whispered sternly. You're not supposed to move when you're sky gazing. Violet, Daffodil whispered back in the same tone. You're not supposed to be annoying when you're sky gazing. Violet snorted and cupped her hands around her eyes to stare at the distant shape. You really aren't supposed to move, Ivy whispered softly in Daffodil's ear. Shh, Daffodil whispered back. She squeezed Ivy's hand. My first dragon. Ivy more than understood what she was feeling. She still felt it, a little thrill all the way along her skin, every time she saw one. The dragon circled, swooping lower and lower. It was flying in an odd, loopy way, jerking sideways, then flapping back, then jerking sideways again. It kept shaking its whole body like a wet dog trying to get dry. Huh, Daffodil whispered. I thought they'd be a little more graceful. I think there's something wrong with this one, Ivy whispered back. Quit having conversations without me, Violet hissed from her higher branch. Shh, Daffodil said to her with a supercilious face. As it came closer, Ivy started to feel a new shiver of exhilaration. She was pretty sure this was a kind of dragon she'd never seen before. It had scales as purely white as the snow on distant mountains, glimmering like cut glass. Its face was narrow, and the spikes along its back were long and sharp. More deadly-looking spikes bristled like needles from the end of its tail. By the stars, Ivy breathed, remembering the drawings in the guide. I think that's an ice dragon. It's so shiny, Daffodil whispered. Why is it flying so weird? Violet asked. Is it coming to land? The ice dragon shook itself again and then dove toward the forest, plummeting like a comet out of the sky. Daffodil clutched Ivy's arm, and Ivy held tight to the branch above her, trying to keep as still as she could. The wing watcher's guide said ice dragons had sharper eyesight than most other kinds. Even if this dragon was injured, it could probably still snatch them out of the tree and eat them if it saw them. The dragon crashed into the trees about half a mile away, smashing through the branches and disappearing from sight. Oh my goodness, Daffodil whispered. Should we go see if it's all right? Violet asked. Violet, Ivy said. Foxglove specifically said to stay right here. I'm pretty sure don't go charging up to a wounded dragon was implied. But think of how well you could draw it if you got really close to it, Violet wheedled. I'm with Violet, Daffodil said. Let's go look at it. How is it that when you two finally agree on something, it's the worst thing? Ivy demanded. No, we promised Foxglove. I want to see it up close too, 
but we can't disobey her. They'll make us stay inside for the next two years, maybe longer. She was saved from the rest of this argument by the sound of footsteps running through the trees. They all froze, listening, until they saw Squirrel appear below the tree. Oh, good, he said when he saw them. We saw a dragon land nearby, and Foxglove sent me to check on you. Check on us? Violet asked. Or make sure we stayed put. Both, he said with a grin. We weren't going anywhere, Daffodil said innocently. We wouldn't dream of it, Violet agreed. Ivy wanted to, but we told her no, Daffodil added. Ivy swatted her, and she dissolved in giggles. I'll just stay here and keep you company, Squirrel said. Not because we don't trust you, but because we remember being young wing watchers too. Violet sighed. We think it might be wounded, Ivy said to Squirrel. It was flying all weird and landed in a really awkward way. Foxglove is going to, carefully, scout out the situation, Squirrel said. She'll let us know what she finds. Wait, do you hear that? Violet asked, leaning forward on her branch. They all fell silent for a moment. Thrashing and panting, coming from the direction where the dragon had landed. It wasn't loud enough to be a dragon, surely, but something was heading in their direction. Squirrel silently reached up and swung himself into the tree. He crouched right below Ivy, and they all stared toward the sounds. Something shoved through the bushes, breaking a few branches and shaking the leaves. Something staggered into the clear space below them, breathing heavily. Something paused, maybe fell or collapsed, flattening the grass. But they couldn't see it. They could see the vegetation moving around it. There was a clear outline of something heavy lying below them now. They could still hear it, gasping for breath. It sounded like a human. So why couldn't they see it? Daffodil quietly worked a pine cone off the branch next to her. Before Ivy realized what she was up to, Daffodil leaned forward and dropped the pine cone squarely into the center of the flattened grass. The something let out a yelp, a very human yelp, and then there were some scrambling around noises. Oh, thank the moons, said an extremely human voice. Wing watchers. The shape seemed to collapse into the grass again. Halt there, Squirrel said sternly. Who are you? Can't you? There was a pause. Oh, oh, right. Ivy's Uncle Stone suddenly appeared below them. He looked bedraggled, windblown, bruised, and thinner than before, but it was unmistakably him. Daffodil let out a squeak of surprise. Uncle Stone, Ivy said. She scrambled down to the branch next to Squirrel. Permission to get down, sir? I, I guess this is an unusual case, Squirrel said. Sure. Ivy jumped down to the ground and smiled up at her uncle. Not as far up as the last time she'd seen him. Was it nearly two years ago? He stared back at her as if she were a ghost. Are you all right? Ivy asked. He pressed his fingers into his eyes for a moment, as if rubbing out an old image, and then blinked at her again. You're my niece, he said. Ivy. His voice was rusty, as though he hadn't used it much in a while. Of course I am, she said. Where have you been? And how did you do that? Violet demanded from above. Appear from thin air like that? Stone squinted up. How many wing watchers do you have in that tree? You should get up there too, Ivy said, reaching for his hand. We just saw a dragon land not too far away. Oh, yes, he said. I was, well, riding it isn't exactly the right description. What? Daffodil shrieked. Shh, Squirrel glared at her. Keep it down. Riding a dragon? Ivy echoed awestruck. I needed to get back here, he said. It seems like the fastest way. He gestured ruefully to his torn clothes and the trickles of blood coming from his knees, arms, and face. Probably should have chosen a less spiky dragon. So 
it was helping you? Ivy asked. Uncle Stone frowned at her. Of course not. It didn't know I was on board. Or rather, it knew that something was on top of it, but it didn't know what. How is that possible? Violet asked. You could steer it, even though it didn't know you were there? Ivy asked. Well, he said, not very well. I think it was coming this way anyhow. Invisibility, Violet shouted suddenly. Shh, Squirrel tried again. You can make yourself invisible. That's it, isn't it? Violet said. She was leaning over so far, she was nearly falling out of the tree. Stone sighed. Don't tell anyone, please. He opened his fist to reveal a long, thin, coiled chain made of a silvery black metal. It was in the Sand Queen's treasure. Heath let me have it because he didn't know what it could do. He shook it out and looped one end over his neck, vanishing the moment it touched him. Oh, my stars, Daffodil breathed. Actual magic. Stone reappeared, lifting the chain off his neck. He collected the coils into a tangle in his fist, then stuffed it in one of his pockets. That's how I survived out there, he said. Where? Violet demanded. Where did you go, and why? Stone looked down at Ivy with the sad eyes she remembered from every family dinner. I had a dream that Rose was still alive, and so I went looking for her, but the desert nearly killed me, and then I ended up in a dragon city, which took me forever to escape, and the whole expedition was a disaster, and I don't know what I was thinking. She's been dead for almost twenty years, there's no way she could have survived even a day out there among the dragons on her own. Ivy met Violet's eyes, then Daffodil's. They all looked back at Stone. Um, said Ivy. Who's Rose? Chapter 13 Wren Wren was 14, and she did not have time for Undauntable's nonsense. She probably should have guessed something was up when she found him examining a jewelry trader's wares, and he looked so very pleased to see her. Wren, he cried. She had finally told him her name on their third meeting, figuring there wasn't anything too terrible he could do with it. I have a great idea. Good for you, Wren said. I can't stay long today. She'd promised Skye she would be back before nightfall. He'd recently decided he could sing, which was slightly factually inaccurate, and wanted to make up a song for her. Here's another scale. I need- Stop, 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 Undauntable said. Listen, I know you have a stash of these, and you're just bringing me one at a time. I also know you don't have a family, because you never buy anything for anyone else, and you're afraid to go into the city, which means you're probably an orphan. Wren put her hands on her hips and glared at him. You seem to think you know a lot of things that aren't your business. But you don't have to worry anymore, he said. Because of my great idea, you should marry me. Wren blinked at him, then looked over her shoulder to see if anyone was standing behind her. Undauntable's porcupine bodyguard was there, a little closer than she would have liked. She guessed Undauntable wasn't proposing to him. No. Wren said to Undauntable. To be clear, never. What? He said, his face clouding over. I do have a family, Wren said. My family happens to be a dragon. You don't get to know that. And I am not remotely interested in getting married or living in a city. For someone who wants to marry me, you don't seem to know me very well. Undauntable threw his hands in the air. Because you always leave he complained. If I marry you, you'll have to stay. I'll buy you lots of things. You can bring your whole stash of dragon scales so we can be super rich together. And you'll get to be princess of the city. It's a dream come true. Undauntable, I'm only going to say this once, and I really mean this, Wren said. Yuck. But why? He demanded. Because I don't want lots of things. I hate cities and people, 
And I only want to be friends with you, Ren said. Friends-ish, she amended in her head. The kind who have polite interactions once a year, and that's it. My life is so unfair, Undauntable said, sitting down on the ground. Cat curled up in his lap and stared balefully at Ren. Everything is terrible. It is not actually my responsibility to fix your life by giving you everything you want, Ren pointed out. I'm not a rare dragon scale to add to your collection. I am a person. You are not entitled to have me along with everything else. Every time I see you, you make me mad, he said. But then I'm so bored until you come back. Undauntable, Ren said. That is definitely a problem you need to solve yourself. Ugh, he grumbled, burying his face in Cat's fur. You should try reading, Ren suggested. It's much more fun than getting married. Undauntable looked up at her to see if she was teasing him, but she actually wasn't. She thought it was a perfectly fine idea, and he must have access to loads of books. He narrowed his eyes and glanced at his bodyguard in a way that Ren didn't like. Undauntable was spoiled and grumpy and demanding, and he always complained about her leaving, but he'd never done anything to stop her before. Have you noticed any new books out here today? She asked, trying to change the subject. It seemed like there were fewer encampments in the line than usual. She wondered where everyone was. Not in the city, she guessed. What if you promise to marry me someday? He asked. Ren tucked the scale back in her pocket. Start with a dictionary, she told him. Look up the word never, and stop acting like people are just more things you can buy. She marched away down the line of travelers toward the river, feeling very betrayed. Why did her one human friendish person have to turn out to be terrible, just like all the others? She'd gotten about ten steps away from Undauntable when someone in the line screamed and pointed at the sky. Ren whirled around and saw a dragon hurtling toward the unprotected people gathered at the base of the cliff. Everyone on the ground started screaming and running, while the ones already on the steps froze and cowered into the cliffside. It was a sand dragon, enormous and gleaming in the morning sun. Its teeth were bared in a delighted grin, and its venomous tail was raised behind it, like a promise of death to come. Above her, Ren saw something happening, up in the indestructible city. There was movement along the top of the cliff, like weapons rolling out. She stepped back to see it better and then Undauntable's bodyguard slammed into her, knocking her to the ground. Hey, ow, she yelled, kicking him hard in the stomach. He grunted and rolled away, and she scrambled to her feet. Overhead, the dragon swooped by and circled to come from another direction. Just trying to get you to safety, the bodyguard groaned, and Ren realized that this one was a woman. She hadn't been able to tell with a helmet on. Prince's orders. Ren looked around. She'd been so interested in the city's defenses, she'd forgotten about Undauntable. Where is he? She asked. Isn't he the one you should keep safe? The bodyguard pointed to a crevice in the side of the cliff, not far from the base of the stairs. Undauntable was standing just inside the narrow gap, beckoning to her. His face was scared but not as frantic as some of the people around him. He lived in a city that fought back, while most of these people had probably lost friends and entire villages to dragons. Ren jumped up and ran toward him. He reached out his hand, but as she got close, she scooped up a toddler who was standing still in the chaos, sobbing. Undauntable looked extremely bewildered when she shoved the toddler into his arms. She turned around and grabbed another kid as he ran by. He looked younger than Ren had been when Talisman abandoned her. She pushed him into the crevice with Undauntable and the toddler. Wait, Undauntable said, but Ren had spotted another little girl, trapped by the fence at the bottom of the stairs. She was shaking the gate and crying. Ren ran to her, lifted her over the fence, and carried her to Undauntable's hiding spot. This is a lot of. Undauntable protested. The crevice wasn't very big, 
and he was now squashed into the back of it, with three crying children around him. Room for one more, I think, Wren said, and darted away. Yes, you, he shouted. She found one more kid who seemed to be by himself and brought him back. The dragon was flying back and forth over the city now, dodging whatever they were shooting at him and laughing. This is too many sticky children, Undauntable shouted as she squeezed the last one inside. And not enough you. I'll be fine, Wren said. She tilted her head to look up at the sand dragon. That dragon doesn't even seem hungry. He's acting like he's here entirely to annoy your citizens. He was, in fact, roaring something like, Ha ha, puny scavengers. You can never hit me. I am the greatest warrior in the entire army of sand. Ha ha ha. So weird, Wren said, putting her hands on her hips. Like, just a total lunatic. This is the fifth time that same dragon has come to attack the city in the last few months, Undauntable said. He tried to squeeze past the children toward her, but they clung to him when he moved, and he had to give up. We thought we'd scared them all into leaving us mostly alone. But this one comes back over and over. It might not be hungry now, although I can't see how you could possibly know that. But it has grabbed at least three people from down here so far. Ha ha ha, the dragon bellowed again. Just you wait, you cockroaches. The queen knows you must have her treasure. One day soon, I will return with my glorious army and destroy you. Ah, so that wasn't great. Maybe, if it was Talisman, Ren would be fine with the dragon burning it down. If anyone asked, she'd usually pick dragons over humans any day. But this was a whole city full of people who might be awful, but who hadn't specifically left her to be eaten by dragons, plus also lots of children, and Ren had to admit she didn't want the dragons to destroy it. The dragon wheeled away and flew off toward the desert, still ha ha hawing as he went. He's not attacking, Ren said to Undauntable, after the dragon was out of sight. He's scouting out your defenses, so a bigger group of them can attack later. She gingerly patted one of the children on the head. It's safe to go outside again now. That can't be right, Undauntable said, as the children scampered away. He emerged from the crevice, looking dusty and wrinkled and disgruntled. Two locks had escaped his slick hair and hung over his forehead. Dragons can't plan ahead. They're driven by impulse and hunger. They don't spend months preparing for an attack or work together. That is so ridiculous, I can't even look at you, Ren said. There are entire dragon armies. They're all having a war with one another. Of course they plan and strategize and work together. Undauntable brushed dirt off his robes, squinting at her. How on earth could you know any of that? She was definitely not going to tell him she spoke dragon, or anything else that might lead back to Sky. I pay attention, she said. Something the prince of a city should probably do? Just tell your dad he needs to prepare for a massive attack. Probably soon. She remembered she was mad at him and turned to go. I'll tell him, Undauntable yelled after her. Hey, Wren, I'm sorry. I really am. Will you come back soon? Don't know, she called without looking back. She couldn't wait to get to Sky, away from people who wanted things from her, away from dragons and humans trying to hurt each other, away from a city bristling with weapons that left kids in danger because they were outsiders. Sky was hopping from one foot to another with excitement when she reached the valley. It was long after sunset, and Ren was too tired to light a fire, but she could see his delighted face by the light of the three moons. Guess what I found, he burst out. I mean, I think... I was flying up really high, and I think I saw something great, but I didn't want to go look without you. Can we go look? Right now? Ren asked. It's a thing to see in the dark, he said, and then to investigate in the daylight. Come on, you can fall asleep on top of me if you're that tired. How did you get so bossy? Ren asked affectionately, 
stepping onto his outstretched talons. He lifted her to her favorite spot, settled in the shoulder curve between his wing and neck, holding onto one of his back spines. They lifted into the sky and banked northwest, to her surprise. That direction would soon take them out of the mountains and into the desert. Sky flew higher and higher, and farther than she'd expected. You came all this way by yourself? She called, and he ducked his head toward her. Why not? He called back. You went off by yourself, too. But I am sensible, and you are not, she thought. I can protect myself, and you are my adorable, helpless baby dragon. She knew that was slightly absurd of her, now that he was three times her height, but he didn't have fire, and he had no idea how to fight if a bad dragon came along, or people looking to steal his scales, for that matter. I guess at least people aren't a threat up this high, she admitted to herself. I saw a dragon who seemed dangerous today, she said. A really big sand dragon. You should watch out for him. All right, Sky said carelessly. Look, there it is, he pointed, his wings shivering with excitement. It was a clear night, with the moons bright in a cloudless sky. In the distance, far ahead and below them, Ren saw a cluster of lights on the ground. What's that? she asked. I think it's a city, he said. Can we get closer? Carefully, she agreed. They flew onward, deeper into the desert than they'd ever been before. Ren saw the long, dark, serpentine shape of a river cutting through the sand. The lights were scattered around the river, closer and closer together as the river approached the sea. Wow, she said softly. Sky, I think you're right. It looks like a big city. A dragon city. Isn't that amazing? He said, pausing to hover for a moment. Ren, can we please sleep nearby and visit it in the morning? Visit it? That doesn't sound safe, Ren pointed out. At all. You go to your human city, he pleaded. Can't I please visit a dragon city? Ren felt a stab of her old anxiety that one day Skye would decide he'd rather be with other dragons instead of her, that one day he would leave her for something better. But she couldn't say no, when he was so sweet and never asked for anything. If he did want to go be with other dragons one day, she couldn't be selfish about it. Besides, this didn't mean he was leaving her now. It meant he was curious. That was fine, wasn't it? Let's find a safe place to rest for the night, Ren said. And in the morning, we'll take a closer look at the Dragon City. Chapter 14 Leaf A roar of fury split the sky and shook the rocks, startling Leaf awake. He sat up quickly and banged his head on the ledge he'd been sleeping under. Next to him, the others emerged from their camouflage coverings of branches and leaves, blinking. That sounded a lot closer than all the other dragon sounds, Cranberry said nervously. They'd had trouble sleeping this close to the palace, with roars and growls and wing beats filling the night, especially after lying still all day. At one point in the late afternoon, Leaf had crept back into the forest to walk off his nerves. He'd run through his tumbling training, then climbed the tallest tree he could find. From the top, he could see east, all the way to the hazy blue line of the ocean. Looking south, toward Talisman, he thought he saw a shape arrowing through the clouds, an enormous dragon with scales as black as night. He wondered if the distance was playing tricks with his eyes, or if that was really one of the rare black dragons Grove claimed he'd seen once, too. Now it was mid-morning, and he'd finally gotten about an hour of fitful sleep before the dragon roar woke him. He crawled partway out from under the ledge, rubbing his head and squinting toward the palace. It looked busier than it had the day before. Dragons were boiling up out of the depths of the palace, pouring into the sky like a swarm of bees. They divided into formations and shot away, some of them north, some east, some west. The rest gathered in a hovering red-orange cloud, staring south. An orange dragon wreathed in coils of smoke suddenly shot past overhead, 
flattening the hair on Leaf's head with the wind of its passing. Its roar sounded like the one that had woken them. It soared up to the waiting dragons and roared something at them. Leaf scrambled back under the ledge. They seem angry, he whispered. Maybe Mushroom succeeded. I'm afraid so, Rowan said. She pointed to a ridge below them, edged with trees on one side and a steep dirt slope on the other. A human was scrambling through the trees as fast as he could, carrying a sword in one hand and a sack in the other. Mushroom, Time shouted. He rolled out from under the ledge and sprinted across the boulders, staying low. Mushroom, he called again. That seems like maybe a terrible idea, Cranberry said to Rowan. Too late now, Rowan said, drawing her sword. The three of them ran after time. Leaf kept one eye on the sky, where the orange dragon was still roaring at the others. It looked like it was either giving orders or yelling at everyone for doing something wrong. But as long as their focus was on that dragon, they might not notice the prey darting around below. Mushroom saw his brother a few yards before their paths converged. He skidded to a stop, his eyes wide, and his breath coming in gasps. Mushroom, Time cried. I can't believe you're alive. You idiot. I was so worried. Stay back, Mushroom shouted, slashing his sword through the air. Time stopped abruptly, nearly skidding down the slope, and Leaf almost crashed into him. It's all right, Cranberry called. Mushroom, we can get you back to the village safely. We're here to help. Here to steal my treasure more like, Mushroom snarled. It's mine. You can't have it. We don't want your treasure, Time said. Yes, we do, Rowan interrupted. Crow and Gorge found out what you're doing. If we don't take the treasure back to them, they're going to feed Grove to the dragons. We need it to save him. Ha, Mushroom snorted. There was plenty of gold in that palace. Go get your own, he glanced back over his shoulder. The dragons in the sky were starting to scatter in a search formation. Please, Mushroom, Cranberry pleaded. Come with us. We don't have to give the dragon mancers all of it. They'll never know what you keep. We'll protect you and you can help us save Grove. I don't care about him, Mushroom shouted. You've all laughed at me for years. Well, now I'm the one with the power. I'm going to own my own village soon. Wait and see. Everyone will do everything for me like they do for the dragon mancers. How can that be more important than saving Grove's life? Rowan yelled. Mushroom, Time shrieked. Look out! He leaped toward his brother as the crimson dragon suddenly plummeted out of the sky toward them. In a whirl of motion, Mushroom jumped back, grabbed a piece of treasure out of his bag, and flung it at Time. The treasure, whatever it was, was gold and flat and circular, and covered in tiny mirrors. It flashed through the air like a tiny sun, like a beacon announcing, Here I am. Here I am. Help, I'm being stolen. Look at me, everyone. I'm pilfered property. I'm so shiny and beautiful and helpless. It thumped into Time's chest, and he caught it with a startled expression. At the same moment, Mushroom dove down the slope and shot away through the ravine leaving nothing but a cloud of dust behind to defend his brother. Leaf didn't have time to get angry. The crimson dragon slammed into the ground beside time, drawn by the shining golden mirrors. It hissed furiously and knocked time over with one of its front feet. This was the moment. The dragon was right there, right in front of Leaf, all scales and smoke and flame and claws, and wings as big as a dragon mancer's house and teeth out of nightmares beyond Leaf's worst fears. It threw its head back and roared, and the dragons in the sky roared in response. Leaf glanced sideways and saw that Rowan was frozen too, her gaze locked on the towering serpentine figure. Do it, now, before the other dragons come. He thought of Wren. He thought of her sticking out her tongue and shouting, You can't catch me. I'm the fastest in the world. He drove his feet into the earth and sprang forward, brandishing his sword as he ran. He whirled it around his head, 
aimed for where he was sure the dragon's heart should be, and plunged the blade into the creature's hide. Except, it didn't go in. His sword bounced right off the dragon's scales and sent him flying backward. He landed in a heap beside Time, who had dropped the gold disc and was cradling one arm. Leaf lay there for a moment, with the wind knocked out of him, struggling to take a breath. If we can't stab them with our swords, how am I supposed to kill one? What have I been training for all this time, if nothing I've learned will help? Rowan and Cranberry appeared, their backs to Leaf. They raised their swords and stood over him in time. He could see their hands shaking, but Rowan yelled, Leave us alone. We're not the ones who stole your treasure. Thump, thump, thump. The earth trembled as dragons landed heavily all around them. Leaf forced himself to his feet and lifted his sword again. The orange dragon was one of them. He saw now that she was wearing a kind of crown and chain mail, which made him think she must be the queen. She snatched up the gold disc and roared something, first at the humans and then at the other dragons. A few of them looked at one another and shrugged, actually shrugged. Leaf had never imagined dragons doing something so familiar looking. Then one pointed at the ravine where a mushroom had disappeared. The queen snapped her tail at Leaf and his friends and barked an order. Then she launched herself into the air and shot after Mushroom. She wants the rest of her treasure, Cranberry guessed. She's going to kill him, Time said in a hollow voice. Good, Rowan spat. I hope she bites his head off. He threw you to them to save his skin, Cranberry said. His own brother. I know, Time said. I, I can't believe it. One of the dragons strode over to them. Leaf did a forward tuck and roll under the dragon's feet and stabbed it in the side, or at least whacked it very hard with the sharp end of his sword, which once again could not penetrate the scales. The dragon looked down at him with a very human frown of displeasure, plucked the sword right out of his hand, and wrapped his other giant talons around Leaf. Rowan screamed, but Leaf couldn't call to her. He couldn't even move. The huge claws had him trapped, his arms pinned at his sides. His lungs were squeezed and burning. He felt himself lifted into the air. He caught a glimpse of the ground falling sickeningly away, and the treetops flashing past, and the palace up ahead, and other dragons seizing Rowan, Cranberry, and Time far below. They caught us, just like that. I couldn't kill a single dragon, and Mushroom betrayed us twice over and we didn't even have a chance to try sneaking into the palace. And all that work on the map was for nothing. And now the dragons are taking us away to eat us, and I failed to protect anyone. Then the lack of oxygen caught up with him, and he slipped into darkness. Chapter 15 Ivy Ivy couldn't remember being inside Uncle Stone's cave before. It was small with almost no furniture, and cobwebs everywhere. She sat gingerly on the least dusty bench. Violet sat down next to her, but Daffodil was wandering around the cave, inspecting the very few things that could be lifted and inspected. They'd seen the ice dragon fly away again. Squirrel had escorted them back to the nearest entrance to Valor, then gone to find Foxglove. Ivy had expected her uncle to seek out the dragon slayer right away, but he'd brought them here instead. I'd offer you tea, Stone said, running one hand through his hair. But I don't seem to have any supplies left. You have been gone a while, Ivy said. Mother came and took all the food so it wouldn't go to waste. Right, he said with a vague nod. Right. He gave Daffodil a disgruntled look as she pried open the lid of a jar and peeked inside. So. Violet said. Rose? Right, he said again. Stone stepped over to a shelf high on the wall, lifted down a book, and took a worn thin piece of paper out of it. Rose was our sister. Sister? Ivy echoed. I have an aunt? He handed her the paper, and she studied the teenage face sketched on it. Dark, laughing eyes, a mischievous grin, wild hair. 
She looks like you, Violet observed, nudging Ivy. Except she looks like she's about to get into trouble, and you never look like that. Across the room, Daffodil laughed. That's true. Your about to get into trouble face is more of an, oh no, what are Violet and Daffodil dragging me into now face? Rose drew that herself, Stone said. That's exactly how she looked, especially whenever she and Heath came up with mad schemes. So she was an artist like you too, Violet said to Ivy. But she's dead now, Ivy asked. What happened? She came with us to the Desert Queen's palace. Stone sat down heavily on his straw pallet, sending up a billow of dust from the blankets. She's the one who climbed in to steal the treasure. She wasn't much older than you are now. Brave and clever, and always doing stupid things, usually because Heath teased her or promised her something. Oh no, Ivy said. She'd always thought she was really lucky that no one she knew had ever been eaten by a dragon. Lucky, and living underground, of course. She knew, abstractly, that she must have had family in the old village, grandparents who didn't make it, maybe, but her parents never talked about them. They avoided any mention of the dragon attack. But the rose smiling in this sketch felt real, and lost long before Ivy was even born. I didn't see what happened to her, Stone said, wiping his eyes. Heath said he did, but he didn't give me any details. We were too busy running and hiding. But that's why I thought, when I had that dream, I thought maybe he was wrong. Maybe she survived somehow. I'm such an idiot, chasing a dream of a dead girl into a dragon city. He shook his head and fell silent. Where's the rest of your treasure? Daffodil asked. Daffodil, Violet said. Can't you see a moment is happening? There was a pause in the conversation, Daffodil argued. Maybe I'm lightening the mood. I didn't take any, Stone said. I couldn't bear the sight of it after what happened to Rose. I kept the chain, but I let Heath take the rest. So, poke around all you want. All right, Daffodil said cheerfully, opening another box. Wow, Violet said. She glanced at Ivy with a, did you know your dad took all the treasure? Look, Ivy had not known that. She'd assumed Stone must have something, because the night he left, her father had searched Stone's cave from top to bottom, then come home and shouted at her mother because he hadn't found anything. Ivy had been lying in bed. Listening, thinking, leave her alone. It's not her fault. And why do you care where his treasure is? Don't you have enough of your own? He must have been looking for the chain, the one thing he didn't already have. Knowing he had everything else made that memory seem even worse. She didn't mention any of that, though. She didn't talk to anyone about her father's temper, not even Violet and Daffodil. She could sometimes calm him down when he was really mad, or help him and mother make peace again after their fights. Or when that didn't work, she was also really good at staying out of his way. I can't believe no one ever told me about Aunt Rose, she said instead. All the times I've heard the dragon slayer's story, but everyone leaves her out. That is messed up, Violet said. Doesn't quite fit the heroic happy ending does it? Stone frowned down at his hands. I bet you don't hear much about the scorched villages or the dragon's vengeance either. The what? All three of them asked at once. My brother destroyed the world, Stone said. He stood up, took the magic chain out of his pocket, and started flipping it absentmindedly through his fingers. And I helped him do it. The world's not destroyed. Daffodil said, looking at him like he'd lost his mind. I mean, we were just out there. There are mountains and trees and rivers. Not that we get to see them very often, Violet said. And there are animals and people and underground villages and- Underground villages, Stone scoffed. People living like scared rabbits because it's not safe outside anymore. 
the dragons are still angry with us, even 20 years later. They are still destroying any humans they can find to punish us for what Heath did. Ivy felt like the room was spinning. Violet put one hand on her shoulder. Hey now, Violet said. That can't be all the Dragon Slayer's fault. Dragons have been eating people and burning places forever. That's literally what a dragon is. No, not like this, Stone said. I remember how it was. And when I start to forget, I read the old stories. The ones they won't give you in school anymore. People used to live above ground, in ordinary towns, all over this continent. Occasionally, someone would get eaten, but the dragons rarely burned whole villages. Not until we stole their treasure, killed their queen, and gave them something to be really vengeful about. But everyone thinks the dragon slayer is a hero, Daffodil said. Everyone here, sure, Stone said. You can't live in valor unless you do. That's true. In Valor, home of the mighty dragon slayer, any criticism of Dad, any questioning of the heroic story, will get you banished, sent away from all safety, tossed out into the world. Ivy thought of all the banishments she'd seen over the years, the odd lies and flimsy reasons she'd noticed for why those people had been kicked out. Was it really because they'd questioned the story? Was it because they mentioned Rose, or talked about a time before humans lived underground? Were they sent away to be eaten because her father needed to protect his image? She leaned forward, wrapping her arms around her stomach. Daffodil came over to sit next to her, and she felt both her friends put their arms over her back, like an invisible shield around her. My dad's a liar, she said quietly to them. He let his sister die, and all the people he's banished, and who knows how many hundreds of people in all those villages the dragons destroyed. That's all because of him. But not because of you, Violet said, shaking her a little. You're still our wonderful Ivy. Don't blame yourself for what he did. Yeah, we love you anyway, Daffodil said. So what if your dad is the worst? My sister is totally evil, and I'm still awesome. Ivy let out a half laugh, half sob, at the idea that harmless Daisy could be compared to Heath on any sort of evil scale. Plus, remember, he didn't do it on purpose, Violet said. He didn't even mean to kill a dragon, right? She looked at Stone for confirmation, and he nodded. They just went to steal treasure, like people have been trying to do for centuries. It's a basic fact of human dragon existence. They have treasure. Idiots try to steal it. It was a weird fluke that this one time, this one idiot managed to kill a dragon who happened to be important. Right? She looked toward Stone again, but he had accidentally flipped the chain around his wrists and disappeared. He appeared again a moment later, gazing at the wall. But then that idiot went on to rule a whole town, Ivy thought and he did it with lies and punishments that were probably as bad as executions. Even if killing the dragon was an accident, you can't say that about anything he's done since. We can deal with this, Ivy, Violet said. Together, we're here for you. Maybe we can fix it, Daffodil said suddenly. Ivy could feel the daggers Violet was shooting from her eyes, even with her head down. Fix what, Violet said. The dragon's being mad. Daffodil jumped up and lifted the chain out of Stone's hands so deftly that his fingers kept moving for a moment, catching up to the fact that the chain was gone. He gave her his most disgruntled look yet. How do we fix dragons being mad? Violet asked, her voice dripping with scorn. Send them a politely worded apology letter? That would be great if we spoke dragon. Daffodil scoffed right back. But we speak at least one language the same. We all love treasure. She held the chain over her head with a flourish, like a banner. Aha, Violet said. So we'll spell out sorry about killing your queen in gold coins? Shut up and let me finish explaining, Daffodil cried. What if we give the dragons back the treasure Heath stole? 
There was an awed silence for a moment. Yes, Ivy said. She stood up and pointed at Daffodil. Yes, we can do that. It won't save the people who are gone, but it'll show the dragons we're sorry. And then maybe they'll stop attacking everyone. No, Violet said. No, no, no. You've both lost your minds. Just think about the logistics for one second. Do we walk up to the sand palace with a sack of coins and wave it at the guards? Here's some treasure. May or may not look familiar with three extra delicious snacks on the side. At what point in this fantastic transaction do we escape with our lives? Does it matter? said Daffodil. Um, matters a little bit, Violet yelped. We'll figure that out, Ivy said. First, we have to get the treasure. That's where your plan falls apart, Stone said gloomily. One of many places where your plan falls apart. Violet muttered. Heath will never give up his treasure, Stone said. Not in a million years. Not to save a single soul or a thousand souls. He loves it more than anything in the world. Daffodil and Violet both glanced at Ivy. But she'd always known that, and nothing else could hurt her right now. She was Ivy, and she had spent her whole life making peace between angry people. So what if one side of this fight happened to be giant man-eating lizards? Then we won't ask him, she said. We'll find his stolen treasure ourselves, and then we'll steal it back. Chapter 16 Wren The inhabitants of the indestructible city, according to Undauntable, thought they lived in the most superior, most advanced, most impressive location in the entire world. Wren really wished she could show them this dragon city and see the looks on their faces. She resettled on her branch and shaded her eyes from the sun. She had been relieved to find at least a few trees here, this close to the river and the coast, although she wished there were more of them. These would do all right for hiding in, but if she and Skye needed to escape in a hurry— there was a whole lot of wide-open desert they'd have to cross in pretty much every direction. Except west, because directly west of her tree was the gigantic dragon city. Dragons were already bustling through the streets, although the sun was barely up. There were lots of buildings, more than one market square, bridges over the river, dragons washing things in the water, fruit trees and pots in the courtyards. Some of the walls were painted with scale patterns, crimson red and pale butter yellow overlapping. Others bore images of dragons in regal, commanding poses and an interesting variety of colors. In their travels, Ren and Sky had seen palaces surrounded by dragon communities, the Swamp Palace from a distance and the Mountain Palace from an even farther distance. They'd seen clusters of oddly shaped mud structures that they thought were swamp dragon villages too but they'd never seen anything quite the size of this place. The strangest part was that the inhabitants were not all sand dragons, as Wren had expected. She had sort of been counting on using that as an excuse. Oh, sorry, Sky dear. Only sand dragons can safely go in there. But red and orange scales clearly flashed between the pale yellow ones, and there was a fair number of brown dragons as well. Whatever had brought the three types of dragons together in one city— they seem to be coexisting peacefully. That still doesn't mean it's safe for Sky, though. Something about this place reminded Wren very much of the indestructible city, and that made her nervous. What do you think? Sky called from the ground. She shushed him and clambered down. He was sitting among the roots, beaming at a snail who was noodling peacefully along his tail. It's very busy, Wren said. How could her sweet, easily distracted dragon not get trampled in a fast-paced place like that? Isn't it exciting? He said, his eyes shining. Maybe they have dragon books. I don't know how to read dragon, but maybe we could figure it out together. See, here was someone who really did know her. That idea was the first suggestion that actually made Ren curious about the dragon city. I'm just worried, Skye. Wren said, resting her hands on his talons. 
We don't know what those dragons are like. You're a mountain dragon, but you still look really different from all of them. His beautiful, perfect pale orange scales were unlike any other dragons in the world, as far as she knew. And you don't have fire to protect yourself. You don't have anything to protect yourself, she thought, except me, and I can't go with you. Aren't you different from all the other humans? Sky asked. Yes, Ren said. Maybe not so obviously, but that's why I don't go all the way into the indestructible city. I don't trust them. I'm really, really careful. I can be really, really careful, Sky said brightly. I promise. You won't forget and speak human, Ren said. Promise you'll fly out of there right away if anyone looks at you weird. He touched his snout to her forehead gently. I'll just walk around and look at things, he said. I won't talk to anybody. Maybe they have wonderful desert animals for sale. Ren laughed. Please don't come back with a pet camel, she said. And don't make friends with any scorpions. Also snakes. Snakes are bad. Try to remember that. Camel's bad. Ren wants a pet cobra, Sky recited, then jumped back with a laugh as she swatted him. Don't talk to anyone if you don't have to, she said. But if they talk to you, act normal. I don't know what that means for a dragon, but probably avoid the topic of snails. Definitely don't let anyone know you don't eat meat. I'm pretty sure that's weird. Really? Sky said. But hasn't everyone seen bunnies? Exactly. Don't say things like that, Ren suggested. Don't volunteer any information. But if they ask, you can say you come from that mountain dragon outpost we saw way up north. Maybe your mom is a soldier there or something. Don't say you're from the mountain palace, in case they're from there too, or they might ask too many questions. Ren, I'm sure no one will even talk to me, Sky said. He squared his shoulders and made a fierce expression. Because my face strikes terror in the hearts of dragons everywhere. Ren giggled. Not exactly, she said. You have the most lovely face. No, you have the most lovely face, he said. You're the cutest, best pet any dragon could ever have. Quit that, Ren said, whacking him again. This was a recent recurring joke that Skye found completely hilarious. You know perfectly well you're my pet. He lowered one of his front feet gently to touch her head. Hmm, he said. Not by the power of cuteness. You're the cutest one here. Ergo, you are my pet. Well then, I will probably run off and leave you for another owner if you're not back by midday, Ren said. So keep that in mind. I will he said, nudging her head with his snout again. He gently slid one claw under the snail and moved it to the safety of a nearby bush. Thank you. Be good, Ren. Hide well. I'll be back soon. Ren's heart pounded as he skipped away down the hill toward the city. Did other dragons skip, or was Sky the only one? What if he had all sorts of other obviously human habits that would make the normal dragons suspicious of him? She scrambled back up the tree and found the highest spot with a view of the city. From there, she could see Sky sauntering happily past a dragon farmstead. Was that tangerine dragon glaring at him over a field of vegetables? And then over the river to one of the smaller market squares. Sky wandered along between the stalls, gazing at the piles of carpets, the pottery, the different weirdly shaped cactus plants. She should have warned him to act less impressed. He must be staring at everything with his wide-eyed, who knew something like this could exist, face. He looked very small next to all the full-grown dragons around him. Ren watched him until he turned a corner and disappeared from view, and then she stared at the spot where he'd been until the sun was well over the mountains. He'll be fine. He's a dragon in a dragon city. It's not like anyone's going to eat him. He's probably having a lovely time. She wondered whether Sky felt this way each time she went to the indestructible city. She hoped not. This was terrible. She made herself climb down to eat something, but before long, she was back in her perch. If only she had a new book to read, at least. Stupid undauntable, 
ruining everything. This absolutely horrible panicked feeling she was having, like spiders running under her skin, this was his fault. If she only had a book, she'd be perfectly relaxed right now. It made her feel a little better to have someone to blame. Sky will be back soon, and he'll tell me all his adventures, and then I'll feel silly. The sun rose higher and higher, and then it began to slide quietly away to the west. Midday had come and gone. Sky wasn't back. He got distracted by something. Some amazing animal or cool dragon invention we've never seen before. Or he forgot to look at the sun. He'll come running out soon and apologize for worrying me. The sun slipped farther and farther away. The sky turned orange and pink and gold, then slowly purple, and then the sun was gone. In the city, dragons lit torches and went on their merry way, packing up their wares or chatting on balconies, strolling along the river or getting their little dragons off to bed. An ordinary dragon day coming to an end. It was dark now. Sky could be fluffy-headed, but he would notice the difference between midday and full night. He would be back by now, unless he couldn't be. Something has happened to him. Wren wiped the tears from her eyes and rubbed her face as hard as she could. He doesn't have fire. He only has me. All right. Fine, Dragon City. I'm coming for my friend. Chapter 17 Leaf Leaf woke up because something was licking his neck. It was not big enough to be a dragon tongue, he thought. He hoped. He desperately prayed. But it wasn't a small, adorable kitten tongue either. And it had the breath of something that had eaten all the garbage in the world. He pulled away and opened his eyes and a goat standing over him gave him a calculating stare. It looked pretty sure that it could pin him down and eat his hair if it wanted to. Ha, look at that, all four of you alive, said a voice nearby. Wow, you showed up at the right time. She must be planning a feast if she's saving all of us for later. Leaf blinked, looking around wildly. He was in a room with no windows or doors, the only exit was a giant trap door in the grated ceiling. It felt more like a pit or a box than a room, really, but gigantic, a box for dragons to keep things in. Snacks, to be specific. A snack box for dragons, full of live prey for later munching. The air was hot and smoky and smelled awful, like a neglected farm, which made sense given the number of animals milling around. Not just animals. People, too. We're not the only people trapped in here, Leaf noted, as Rowan crouched beside him. There was a big bearded man leaning against the wall, watching him, and another figure lying on the floor with his arms over his head, whimpering. A third guy had draped himself over one of the cows and was asleep, or maybe unconscious, as the cow wandered slowly from side to side and sniffed the stone floor disapprovingly. Perhaps it was safer to sleep like that instead of on the floor, where the cow could walk right over you. Cows, goats, very large chickens, two foxes, a beaver, several miserable squirrels, also an alarmed deer and an actual bobcat who was crouched in the corner, snarling. Leaf wondered if it was feeling outnumbered by all the prey, or if it had any idea it was now in the category of prey itself. As are you. Imaginary Wren reminded him. Glad you're okay, little brother, Rowan said to him gruffly. She shoved his shoulder. I know your plan is to kill dragons, but I didn't think I'd trained you to run straight at any dragon you see, you big dope. Did you see what happened? Leaf demanded. The part where we got caught by dragons who are going to eat us soon? Rowan asked. Yeah, I did notice that. No, with my sword, Leaf said. I stabbed that dragon twice, and my sword bounced right off. It doesn't penetrate their scales. Rowan frowned. Well, that's terrible. So what did the dragon slayer do differently? Leaf asked. How did he manage to kill one? 
You never said swords wouldn't work on them. That wasn't in the story. He did use a sword, Rowan said. I'm like 85% sure that's what I heard anyway. I don't know what he did to make it work, though. Magic sword? Cranberry guessed from over by the wall. She was sitting next to Time, who had his arms wrapped around his legs and was staring vacantly at the bobcat. Or maybe it was dragon made, and their own swords are strong enough to stab each other. Arr! Leaf groaned, dropping his head into his hands. All that training, and he still knew nothing? He was finally inside the dragon's lair, and yet he was further away from protecting his village than he'd ever been. Doesn't matter anyway, said the bearded man, and Leaf realized that was the voice he'd heard before. They took your swords. You might get one back if you're chosen for the arena, but you still don't stand a chance. The arena? Cranberry asked. She shoved away a cow that was snuffling at her boots. This dragon queen likes to watch fights, he said. Mostly between dragons, but sometimes she sends humans out there too. How do you know? Leaf asked. Yeah, if you've been here long enough to figure that out, why aren't you dead? Rowan crossed her arms and arched an eyebrow at him. He chuckled unpleasantly. I've been here five days. On day two, they split up the humans. Three for the kitchen, three for the arena, far as we could tell. We haven't seen the first three since, and I'm the only one that survived the arena. By fighting a dragon? Leaf asked. Ha! No, by lying down and playing dead until they dragged me out again, he said with a snort. Not a great trick, though. The other guy who tried it got trampled in the action and wound up actually dead. Well, you're good at horror stories, I'll give you that, Rowan said. Name's Cardinal, he offered. But don't get attached. You can get attached to us, Cranberry said defiantly. We are not going to die. Cardinal shrugged, as if it wasn't worth proving her wrong, since the world was about to do that pretty fast. Can we climb up there? Rowan asked Cranberry, pointing at the grate overhead. Or throw you up there? Leaf and Cranberry could toss each other pretty high, but the trap door was as far away as three dragons stacked on top of one another. They tried anyway, and they tried putting Cranberry on Rowan's shoulders and Leaf on the very top, and they tried vaulting off cows, despite the cows' objections, but nothing got them anywhere close. Dragons kept stomping by overhead, rattling the bars of the grate as they walked over it. A long time after Leaf woke up, a dragon stopped to throw some food down through the trap door, but the mad scramble to get to it looked almost as deadly as the dragons themselves, so Leaf stayed against the wall and waited it out. Another long time later, a tangerine-colored dragon opened the trap door and swooped down, dropping a bleeding sheep and another deer into the muddle of animals before swooping out again. How did the dragons catch you? Leaf asked Cardinal. You're not from Talisman, and I thought there wasn't another human village anywhere near the palace. Lots of folks wander without villages after theirs were burned, Cardinal pointed out. And the dragons can go a lot farther afield than your town. I met one person in here who lived in a village far down the coast. And then, of course, there are the idiots who show up here, trying to steal treasure. Rowan and Cranberry exchanged a guilty look. Yeah, I thought so, Cardinal said with a snort. He nodded at the man who slept on cows, who had turned out to be a very morbid, morose fellow named Arbutus. That was our plan, too. I bet the dragons think it's real funny how we just walk up and ask to be eaten. I'm not here for treasure. Leaf said fiercely. I'm here to slay a dragon. Cardinal laughed. Well, that's even stupider, he said. But I guess if you end up in the arena, you'll get a chance to try. Should be great entertainment. A chance to try. A chance. That was what Leaf needed. If I did win in the arena, Leaf asked, would they let us go? Cardinal squinted at him. No. They would eat you. They're dragons, he said slowly. You can't reason with them or bargain with them. They're giant, mindless, hungry monsters. 
That's what Leaf had thought. But he was having trouble fitting together mindless monster with arena sports, elaborate castles, carefully drawn blueprints, and feast planning. He could easily believe, however, that the dragons would never let them go. They'd thrown all the humans in with their other prey, no matter how much they played with them first. Eventually, the dragons were planning to eat them all. He was not going to die without taking down a dragon first. That's right, Imaginary Wren said cheerfully. I must be avenged with violence. But how, he asked her. Where are they vulnerable? In their stupid faces, she guessed. Imaginary Wren still often talked like the seven-year-old he remembered. She might be right, though, he thought. The mouth, perhaps? The eyes? Maybe their wings? That made sense, but it only made the task more daunting. Dragon faces weren't exactly at an easily stabbable level. Leaf brooded about the challenge for days. Far above the trap door and the grate, they could see a window and the clear blue sky beyond as it turned to night and back again. Leaf wished she had spent more time climbing to high places to watch the sunrise with Wren. It had been one of her favorite things to do, but he'd usually preferred to sleep through it. Dragons came periodically to remove or add more prey and to throw food at them. They didn't seem entirely clear on what all the different kinds of animals might eat, so there was a lot of raw fish and bundles of grass. On the fourth day, the dragons took the guy who'd been whimpering when Leaf woke up, which was a little bit of a relief because he'd had screaming nightmares every time he'd fallen asleep. He'd refused to speak to anyone, so they didn't know his name, or where he'd come from, or why he was there. Cardinal couldn't guess whether he'd gone to the arena or the kitchen. What if Cranberry threw me at a dragon? Leaf wondered. Would that get him high enough to stab it in the eye? But he'd probably be in the arena alone. He presented the problem to the others. Could you climb up a dragon's leg to get to its head? Cranberry asked. It would have to be either asleep or not very aggressive, Rowan pointed out. I'm not climbing any dragons, Time said. I'm running in the opposite direction as fast as I can. They like that, Cardinal interjected. It's much more fun for them to chase their prey. You don't know that, Rowan snapped. You're thinking of cats. He shrugged, unfazed. Probably true of dragons too, though. Are we sure we can't talk to them? Time asked. Maybe charm them into letting us go? That made Cardinal laugh for a very long time. Finally, on the fifth night, the dragons came. The sky through the distant window was lined with a sunset red glow turning to purple dusk above. It had been a busy day overhead, full of dragons darting back and forth, roaring, crashing pots and pans, more roaring, the sound of things falling, and the smell of meat burning. Leaf wasn't sure what was happening, but all the dragons in earshot seemed to be having a meltdown about it. Three dragons threw open the trap door and descended into the pit. Leaf scrambled to his feet and tried to look fierce and interesting enough for the arena. Pick me. I'll give you a memorable fight. Hand me a sword and point me at a dragon. The biggest of the three dragons was crimson red, the color of fresh blood, with a slash across her face that had taken out one of her eyes. A thin gold chain was wound around her horns and neck, which made Leaf guess that she was one of the dragons in charge, at least of the kitchens or food supply or something. She snarled at the other two, jabbing her claw at the panicking mob of animals below. One of the others, a burnt orange dragon with a few missing claws, swooped down and seized a sheep, carrying it straight out the trap door. The last dragon, darker red with yellow eyes, grabbed one of the deer and flew away with it. Was that it? Leaf wondered. Just dinner for the queen? Then the dragons came back for a goat and the beaver, then again for a fox and the yowling bobcat. They came back again and again until almost all the animals were gone. Told you, Cardinal said, slouching against the wall. Saving us for a feast. Maybe it's her birthday he snickered. 
Yeah, right, said his partner glumly. Dragons who know their own birthdays. Ha. Arbutus was long and angular and wore his dark hair in a waist-length ponytail. He didn't talk very much. He seemed resigned to their fate as dragon food. Because he spent so much time sleeping on top of cows, he smelled even worse than any of the other humans. Maybe she has guests, Rowan said. I saw a dragon fly by the window earlier, who was a different color than the others. Sort of a pale yellow, Time said. I saw it too. Could be a sand dragon, Rowan said to Leaf. Like the one the dragon slayer killed. I wonder if they're easier to stab. Ooh, let's find out, Ren suggested with great enthusiasm. Let's try stabbing all the dragons and then make a chart of which ones are the squishiest and which ones go clang, ouch, growl, and then eat you. Leaf glanced up at the one-eyed red dragon who was still hovering overhead. He was pretty sure they'd been picking out dinner, pray for the feast, as Cardinal had guessed. It seemed unlikely that the dragons were planning to watch a fox and a bobcat fight each other in the arena in the dark. So maybe they weren't taking anyone for the arena today. And with only six humans left, maybe they weren't taking any of them for the feast either. Maybe they'd all get to be in the arena tomorrow. The carrier dragons returned. The one in charge barked something at them and pointed at time. Before anyone could move, the orange dragon soared down, scooped him up, and flew away, as businesslike as it had been with the sheep. Time! Cranberry shouted. No, time! Hey, give him back! Give him back! Leaf was so stunned, he couldn't even call after his friend. He stared at the spot where time had been a minute ago. He can't be gone. Time can't end up as a side dish at a dragon buffet. I came here to save people, not to lose more. The next growl from above didn't break through his daze. It wasn't until Rowan shrieked his name and Leaf felt claws closing around him that he realized the one-eyed dragon had spoken again. Choosing one more human for the feast. Choosing him. Chapter 18 Ivy The main problem with finding the treasure Ivy's father had stolen from the dragons was that apparently nobody had seen even a fraction of it in Ivy's lifetime. They figured this out slowly. Violet approached each of the merchants in Valor and asked, as casually as Violet could, not very, whether the dragon slayer usually paid in gold or precious jewels or what. Each of them chuckled or looked nervous, or waved her away. But the general gist of their answers seemed to be, the dragon slayer doesn't have to pay for every item like a lowly villager. He's the lord of valor. He has as much money as a dragon queen. We know his credit is good, ha ha. So wait, Violet would say. When did he last pay you? And then there would be mumbling and more nervous looks, and soon she'd be shooed out of the shop without much more information. There did seem to be an informal system of favors in place, Violet pointed out. If, for instance, the dragon slayer decided on a tailor whose clothes he liked, he'd spread the word, and soon that would be the most popular tailor in valor. Or if one candle maker made a special dragon slayer scent, she was likely to find herself upgraded to one of the biggest caves in the marketplace. As far as I can tell, he pays with power and influence instead of with money, Violet explained. Huh, Ivy said. So, where is his money? What does he do with it, if he's not using it to buy things? Maybe he piles it up in a cave and rolls in it, Daffodil suggested. Not that that's what I would do with a giant mountain of gold coins or anything. Ivy had been hoping to catch a glimpse of the gold the next time her father had to buy something big but apparently nothing was too big for the dragon slayer to buy on credit from one of his worshippers. While Violet interrogated merchants, Daffodil was sent to talk to her grandmother, the oldest inhabitant of Valor. That did not go well. She wanted to know where my yellow ribbons were, Daffodil reported with indignation. She said my uniform is boring and does nothing for my complexion, and she told me to sit still like 800,000 times 
And why was I even interested in the dragon attacks? And of course she hasn't seen the dragon slayer's treasure. How rude do I think she is? Except, of course, when he first rode back from the desert and announced his heroic deeds in the town square. That, Violet asked. Did you ask more about that? I tried, Daffodil said. She said it was very exciting, bells ringing and everyone admiring the tail barb and cheering. And then whoosh and boom and roar and crash and everything was on fire. And Aunt Petal managed to get Grandma into the escape tunnels. And by the way, have I heard about how Aunt Petal was the very best of Grandma's children and no one else will ever measure up? She did not say that, Ivy objected. She absolutely did, Daffodil said with Mother sitting right there. I swear, Aunt Petal sounds as dreadful as Daisy sometimes. Anyway, then I couldn't get Grandma back to the treasure no matter what I tried. Plus, it was getting very boring, so I left. Well, Violet said sarcastically, good effort. Thank you, Daffodil said, ignoring her. Ivy's mission, of course, was to search the Dragon Slayer's home. She was often left alone so finding a time to do it wasn't difficult. She started with her parents' room, then her dad's office, then the dining cave where he hosted council meetings and parties. She reached into every nook and cranny and ledge and crack in every wall of the caves. She ran her hands along every fiber of their hammocks, looking for hidden lumps. She riffled through each book on the shelves. She took everything out of the cabinets and looked for secret compartments. It was really odd and uncomfortable, trying to find her dad's secrets this way. It felt like she'd been colored over with a drawing of a different Ivy, a braver, but sneakier Ivy, with a different father, who couldn't be trusted in any way. She could remember the harmless, charming dad she used to think she had, but now she could only see the shadows around him, the ghosts he ignored, the smile that said he didn't care or think he'd done anything wrong. Her heart pounded as she searched. If he caught her, what would she say? How would she calm him down? Would she be able to lie? Or was he such a master liar that he'd see right through her? She waited for the times when she knew they'd be gone for a while, and then she looked everywhere. They owned a lot of elegant carvings and small jewelry and gold leaf-painted vases, but those had all been made by human hands, there wasn't a speck of dragon treasure to be found. That is bonkers, Daffodil said from her perch in Violet's hammock. They were meeting in Violet's cave again, because Daffodil had recently had a new nightmare about the dragon tail barb, possibly prompted by the story of the dragon attack on the old village, and didn't want to go anywhere near it. Violet also didn't trust Ivy's mother, and at this point, Ivy wasn't sure she did either. Violet's dads were always at meetings or trials or arbitrations, so this seemed like the safest place to talk without being overheard. Heath must be really good at hiding things if you really couldn't find anything, Violet agreed. Or, it's not in our cave at all, Ivy said. Maybe he was worried someone would try to steal it from him, so he keeps it somewhere else. But where would it be more safe? Daffodil asked. Everywhere else in Valor is public space. I'd think it would be harder to protect anywhere outside his own cave. They were all quiet for a moment. Violet was lying flat on the floor in her thinking position. Ivy was at Violet's desk, trying to draw the ice dragon they'd seen. All the spikes made it extra hard, but that helped her mind focus instead of rattling around in circles. Was there anywhere else her dad went and nobody else did? Oh! She cried, dropping her quill. Of course. Where is my brain? You guys, the old village. Violet sat up, and Daffodil nearly fell out of the hammock. That's probably why he made that law that no one else can go there, Ivy rushed on. Maybe Pine got too close to wherever he's hidden it. Oh, oh, and that time I saw Dad leaving with a bag hidden under his shirt? Maybe he was going to get some of the treasure. I bet that's it. The treasure is hidden in the old village. That's brilliant, Violet said, grinning. You're brilliant, Ivy. I'm really not, Ivy said. 
I should have thought of that way sooner. So let's go get it, Daffodil said. Let's go right now. We can't. Ivy buried her hands in her hair. I mean, we can't. First of all, we don't know where the village is. Secondly, there's no way we'll be allowed to leave Valor on our own. Even our Wing Watcher friends don't think we're ready for that. And most of all, it's so forbidden. I don't think Dad would banish me, but he might banish you two. And I, that would, it would be the worst thing to ever happen. She couldn't imagine life without Violet and Daffodil. She couldn't imagine watching them get banished, knowing it was her fault. And she couldn't imagine ever forgiving her father if he did that. I can solve all those problems, Violet said. Foxglove will take us there, and Squirrel will make sure no one catches us. Violet? Ivy threw a ball of paper at her. Then Foxglove and Squirrel could be banished too. Well, that's my five favorite people, Violet said. So if we're all banished together, that's fine by me. Ooh, let's get Forest banished too then, Daffodil said. Daffodil gross, Violet said. No, I forbid you to have a crush on Forest of all people. I don't, Daffodil yelped. I just think he's funny. You are wrong, Violet said. He is horrifying. He's not horrifying, Ivy said, passing Daffodil a bowl of pumpkin seeds to stop her from leaping out of the hammock and strangling Violet. His humor is a little juvenile, sure but it's okay for Daffodil to think it's funny. Most importantly, no one is getting banished, because no one else is going to the old village. I'll go by myself. Terrible plan, Daffodil said. Absolutely not, Violet said at the same time. Ivy tried to convince them, but she didn't stand much of a chance when the two of them joined forces. Still, she thought the argument was ongoing until three days later, when Foxglove summoned them for another sky-gazing mission, and then they got outside and found Squirrel waiting with a knapsack and a grin. Uh-oh. Ivy shot a look at her friends. You didn't. Of course we did, Daffodil said cheerfully. They would love to help. That's a slight exaggeration, said Foxglove. There was a tiny amount of blackmail involved. She arched one eyebrow at Violet who did not look even the slightest bit guilty. The sky was overcast, full of billowing gray clouds, and the wind whipped through the trees with more strength than Ivy was used to. Far off to the north, a misty skein of rainfall connected the sky and mountain peaks. If there were dragons in those clouds, would we see them? Ivy wondered. Would we hear their wing beats over this wind? What did you do? Ivy asked Violet. I told them we needed a guide to the old village, Violet said serenely. And if they helped us, I would stop trying to decipher the secret Wing Watcher code I know they've been using. This does not mean there is a secret Wing Watcher code, Foxglove said sternly. But less of Violet poking around in other people's business would be great. She strode off down the hill, and Ivy had no choice but to chase after her. The wind tossed her hair in her face and all around, and she thought how hard it would be to fly in weather like this. This is too dangerous, she said breathlessly to Foxglove. I don't want anyone to get banished. Neither do I, said Foxglove. But I think Violet is right that your father is hiding something in the old village, and with you along, we might finally be able to find it. With me, finally, Ivy said. Wait. You mean you've looked before? Foxglove smiled. Trust me, this is not the first time I've been to the old village, and this won't be the time I get caught. Daffodil bounded down the slope past them, leaping from rock to rock like a mountain goat who just escaped from trolls. Violet was following them, more slowly, talking to Squirrel as they walked. Ivy glanced back and saw three more wing watchers climbing out of the underground city. She thought she recognized them, all from Foxglove's year. We have a system, Foxglove said, noticing Ivy's puzzled expression. If anyone else comes out, there will be a signal passed along in time for us to hide. You don't have to worry. 
A whole system, Ivy thought, as they trekked through the woods. Sparrows flitted through the trees overhead, clinging to the branches when they thrashed in the wind, with many wing watchers in on it. Violet was right about one thing. They have secrets. Foxglove has been sneaking off to the old village, and she never told me. Because she couldn't really trust me after all? Was she afraid I'd tell my father? Would I have, before I knew about Rose and everything Stone told us? She doesn't seem worried about it now. Ivy glanced at Foxglove's face, but it was her unreadable expression, the one Ivy still couldn't imitate even after all these years as her friend. She didn't see any signs that Foxglove was angry, though. Ivy hoped Violet hadn't really blackmailed her. She didn't think she could handle it if Foxglove was mad at them. Behind them, she noticed two of the wing watchers following at a distance, and then, after a while, just one. She guessed they were spread out along the route, so they could pass their signals quickly. She hoped they'd be safe, from dragons, from her dad, from everything. West, Violet noted, assessing the sky. We're heading toward the desert. The village isn't far from the edge of the forest, Foxglove said. I see you taking notes in your head, Violet. Remember, you promised you would never go to the village by yourself. I did promise that, Violet said. Yes, that I did. Foxglove narrowed her eyes at her. Going with ivy and daffodils still counts as going by yourself. Stop trying to find a loophole. I didn't say anything, Violet objected. I wasn't even planning anything. I'm absorbing knowledge, that's all. Like a diligent wing watcher apprentice. That's me. Well behaved and learning things. Ha, Foxglove snorted. Daffodil, she called. Get back here. Daffodil obediently wheeled around and charged back toward them. Foxglove signaled for silence and they all crouched in a huddle. This might be a little upsetting. Foxglove said softly. Are you sure you're ready for it? Very ready, Daffodil said. Of course, said Violet. Ivy nodded. She wasn't sure. She didn't know what to expect, but she couldn't say no now. Foxglove gave a low whistle, listened for another moment, and then beckoned them forward. Squirrel stayed behind, climbing a tree. Up ahead, Ivy could see a break in the trees a spot where there seemed to be more light, even on such a gray day. As they approached, she began to notice a smell, too, like charred wood. They stepped out of the forest into a charcoal painting of devastation. The black, twisted shapes slowly resolved into tree stumps, crooked walls, fallen towers. Ivy could see where paths used to run between houses. She could imagine the gardens that once grew here, before the dragon fire consumed it all. Foxglove led the way between stone foundations to something that seemed to be an open plaza where all the roads met, like the central cave in Valor. A toppled bell tower marked the center of the square. An old iron bell, large, rusted, and cracked, poked out of the rubble. Ivy couldn't pull her eyes away from it. Was her father the last person to ring it? Had he been so proud of himself? And then what had he felt when the dragons descended? Right, Foxglove said, standing next to the bell with her hands on her hips. What next, clever boots? She looked at Violet. We spread out and start searching, Violet suggested. It's a big town, Foxglove pointed out, and we can't stay too long. Got any more specific plans? Violet pivoted slowly, studying the space. Ivy had to admit, it didn't look promising. Where would she hide treasure in a ruin like this? And didn't it make her father sad? Every time he came back here, wasn't he reminded of everything the town had lost? Everything that was destroyed? Because of him? Didn't he look around and feel crushed by guilt? She did. And she hadn't even been alive when it happened. She'd never seen it bustling with people and full of life. If something like this had been her fault, she would never have been able to look at it again. But she couldn't think like herself. She had to think like the dragon slayer.
He didn't see a ruin. He saw a clever hiding spot. A safe hiding spot. One that he trusted, apparently. Where would he feel like his treasure was safe? Dad's old house, she said. Wherever he used to live, we should start there. Sounds great, Foxglove said. Which one is that? Ivy had no idea. She frowned at the ruins, trying to think of anything that might give her a clue. Her father liked big houses, lots of space, fancy things. But his family wouldn't have been able to afford any of that when he was a kid. That was the whole reason he'd gone to steal the dragon treasure, wasn't it? Because he wanted to be rich, and he wasn't? So, probably not one of these bigger houses around the square, then. Guess what? Daffodil announced suddenly. Guess what? What? Violet asked in her most deliberately bored voice. There are footprints over here, Daffodil cried. She pointed at a muddier area on the other side of the bell. Leading into town that way. What if they're the Dragon Slayer's footprints? We could follow them straight to his hiding place. Violet crouched beside the footprints and studied them skeptically. These are two different sets of footprints, she said. They can't be the Dragon Slayer's. He only comes here alone. Let's follow them anyway, Daffodil suggested. I mean, what if someone is here? Maybe they already found the treasure and can save us oodles of time. Did you think about that? There is someone here, Foxglove said slowly. But they have not found the treasure. They have looked, with no success so far. Of course, they were supposed to do a better job of covering their tracks, she said loudly. She fixed her gaze on the three girls. Can you keep a secret? A real one? You can't breathe a word of this to anybody. Yes, Daffodil breathed. I promise. So do I, said Violet. I would never betray your trust, Foxglove. I believe in keeping secrets as a matter of honor. Ivy, Foxglove asked before Ivy could chime in. You're the one whose promise I really need. This could be asking a lot of you. I really, really promise, Ivy said, a little hurt. It's not asking too much. You know I'm good at keeping secrets. She is, Daffodil agreed, taking Ivy's hand and squeezing it. Foxglove climbed onto the highest stone step still standing and waved both her arms. A shadow detached itself from a leaning stone doorway and came toward them. Another rose from behind a low wall and followed. As they approached, Ivy was startled to see that they were both wearing wing watcher uniforms, torn and threadbare, but still recognizable. One had a scar along his neck, and the other kept glancing at the sky nervously. Oh, wow, said Daffodil. She grabbed Ivy's hand again and squeezed even harder. Ivy, she said in her famously loud whisper voice. That's pine. And Azalea, said Violet. They were both banished from valor. Daffodil clasped her hands under her chin. I can't believe you're still alive, she said to Pine. Do you remember me? Pigtails with yellow ribbons? He looked at her like he actually did remember. At the school, he said with a grin. You were always so excited about the peaches. Yes, Daffodil said. Peaches, it was definitely about the peaches. That's what I was excited about, definitely. I'm Daffodil, by the way. Foxglove, what are you doing? Said the other banished wing watcher. Azalea's hair was short and wild, as though it had been chopped with a knife and no mirror. Ivy vaguely remembered her kicking a bunch of guards at her banishment. We've talked a hundred times about whether it would be safe to bring her here. She nodded at Ivy. We said no, a hundred times, remember? This was different, Foxglove said. She asked to come. She wants to help. Azalea's eyebrows shot up, and she looked at Ivy with disbelief. To find the treasure, Foxglove added quickly, as we've been trying to do for years. These three think it must be here too. And what do you need with treasure, princess? Azalea demanded. There was a pause, and Ivy realized she was waiting for Violet or Daffodil to answer for her. 
but Azalea was staring only at Ivy. We want to give it back to the dragons, Ivy said, to stop them from burning any more villages. Azalea tilted her head and took a step back. She looked at Pine, who had a small smile on his face. He shrugged at her. Not the worst idea, he said. Disagree, but never mind that, said Violet. Have you been living here this whole time? Since you were banished? Our friends helped keep us alive, Pine said, nodding at Foxglove. Aster went to take her chances in the indestructible city and hasn't returned. The dragons got root a couple of years ago. What about the other people who were banished? Ivy asked. The ones who weren't wing watchers? We know where most of them are, Pine said. But we're not going to tell you, Azalea cut in, looking at Ivy. No offense, but just in case. That's fascinating, Violet said, studying Pine. You were banished because you came here, but then you ended up living here. And now you can search for the Dragon Slayer's treasure all day, which is probably why he banished you in the first place. No one ever said the Dragon Slayer was smart, Azalea said with a shrug. No offense, she added to Ivy again. Ivy was quite sure offense was intended. It was pretty clear that Azalea was angry at her and meant to stay that way no matter what Ivy said. But Ivy didn't feel angry back. She felt worried for them, living out here in a burned-down village with only a few wing watchers to help them. But you haven't found anything? Violet asked. Have you figured out where the Dragon Slayer used to live, at least? Pine spread his hands. No luck. I don't think the treasure is here after all. But then why banish you? Just for seeing this place? Foxglove asked. Maybe I offended him some other way, he said. Do you remember where you went when you came here the first time? Violet asked. Did he catch you here? Yes, he said. We've searched all over that area, but I'll show you where I was. The six of them made their way through the ruins, with the foxglove at the back scuffing up the prints they left behind. Pine stopped in a corner of the village that looked pretty much like everything they'd passed, but with smaller foundations, chimneys, and hearths than some of the big houses near the center. I was just poking around here, searching in the old fireplaces for iron. He came out of the woods and asked what I was doing. And I told him, and he looked very serious and said, we'd better get back to Valor. I didn't realize I was in trouble until we got there, and he had two of his guards arrest me. Ivy walked along the path, studying each of the houses. There were five people in the family, the parents and three teenagers. So it couldn't be either of these one-room houses, she thought. They'd have built on another room or more, like these did. She stopped in front of a house near the end. The building next to it was almost entirely gone, but buried in the ash, she could see the corner of a blacksmith's anvil, and behind it, the outline of a building that might have been a stable. They had horses, she said to Violet, who had followed her. They rode horses to the desert palace, right? Could they really afford three horses? Or maybe their father was a blacksmith and they took whatever horses were here for new shoes. Maybe? It's a good theory, Violet said. She pointed at the house that adjoined the blacksmith's shop. Let's start in there. Foxglove stayed outside to watch for warning signals while the rest of them searched. With five people, it didn't take very long to sweep from one end of the house to the other. There weren't many places to look unless they started digging, but Ivy didn't think her father would have buried the treasure. He didn't like to get dirty, and he hadn't been carrying his shovel when she saw him leave the underground city. Ivy couldn't imagine her father as a teenager, or Uncle Stone, but she could kind of picture Rose here, skipping in and out, bothering her father while he made horseshoes next door, avoiding her mother whenever chores needed doing. Hmm, said Daffodil, tapping her nose. You said he caught you looking in fireplaces. Did anyone check this fireplace? I reached up the chimney as high as I could and felt around, Violet said. It's pretty unstable. I was afraid the whole thing would fall down on me. Maybe this is the wrong house, Ivy said. 
Think like Heath, Violet suggested. Why would he come back here? Because he already had a hiding place, Ivy said. Somewhere he hid things even when he was a kid. Like the crack in the wall behind Daffodil's hammock where she puts her love po- Not love poems, she said quickly at the look on Daffodil's face. Anything but that. Other secrets. Ivy, seriously, Daffodil said in outrage. Let's see if there are any cracks in the wall in the side room, Violet suggested. Pine, you're the tallest. You check the fireplace again. Ivy ran her hands along what was left of the stone walls. She pictured herself as Rose, sneaking in here while her brothers were out so she could play with their things. Ivy had never had siblings, but she'd certainly heard enough about daffodils. Daffodil was an expert at finding every new place where Daisy hit her diary, and also an expert at ranting about how boring it always turned out to be. She writes down everything she eats, Daffodil had complained more than once. There's not a single word about boys or any interesting gossip. How can she be that evil and that boring at the same time? Unless this is a decoy boring diary, specially designed to throw me off the scent. I bet that's it. One day, I'll find her real evil diary and show everyone the truth about her. Daffodil, Ivy said. Where would Daisy hide her diary in this room? Daffodil stood in the center of the room, staring around with a narrowed gaze. She wouldn't, she said at last, because this is a room we'd have to share. So she'd hide it somewhere I'd never go. Was Rose allergic to horses? Or banned from the smithy for setting things on fire? Where did you get that idea? Violet demanded. Daffodil shrugged. I don't know. She looked like someone I would like, that's all. Let's check the smithy, Violet said. They clambered over what was left of the wall, and Ivy went over to the anvil. It was so heavy. She could see why no one had managed to bring it down to Valor yet. Anyone trying to transport it would be easy prey for dragons. Daffodil stuck her head up the chimney and quickly emerged again, coughing. Blech, she said. Pine, come be tall over here. Pine and Azalea came over the walls as well, but as they crossed the smithy, suddenly, all of them heard a piercing shriek in the sky. Azalea didn't hesitate. She dove under a pile of leaves and ashes in the corner and vanished in the first heartbeat. Foxglove came running in, grabbed Ivy and Daffodil, and dragged them into the smithy fireplace. Violet and Pine were already over the wall and hiding in the tumble-down house. It'll see us, Daffodil gasped, trying to squish farther into the fireplace. Foxglove crouched and lifted Ivy onto her shoulders. A moment later, Ivy's head was up the chimney and Daffodil was pressed to Foxglove's side below her. They were all as still as rabbits caught in the garden when the torches were lit. Ivy rested her hands lightly on the chimney walls and prayed that nothing collapsed on them. She could see a small triangle of gray sky at the top of the chimney. She couldn't see the dragon. Maybe it was up too high, hidden by clouds, or didn't cross that section of sky. She wondered which kind it was, was it one of the sand dragons? Come back to marvel at what they had done to the village? She heard it shriek one more time, and then again a minute later, a little farther away. No one moved for a long time after silence fell. Ivy wasn't sure any of them would ever have moved, except that it started to rain, big fat drops plopping down the chimney onto her face. She leaned down to avoid them and felt a loose stone in the side of the chimney wall, near where her knees were. Oh, she whispered. Foxglove, can you feel this? Foxglove reached up and wobbled it with her hand. Yes, she said. Let me put you down and I'll check it out. Ivy and Daffodil waited by the anvil, shivering in the rain, as Foxglove levered out the loose stone and carefully placed it beside the fireplace. There's a big gap behind it, she said. This could be his hiding place. She climbed up into the chimney. Ivy held her breath. Had they really found it? How quickly would her father notice that the treasure was missing? Could they get it to the dragons before he realized he'd been robbed? Before he banished anyone he decided to blame? 
Foxglove was hidden from view for a long time. Azalea, Pine, and Violet joined them, but nobody spoke. The rain was coming down harder, plastering their hair to their heads and soaking through their green tunics. The feeling in the air was almost unbearable. Ivy wondered what Azalea would do when Foxglove emerged with the treasure. The tension radiating off the banished wing watcher was making her very nervous. Finally, Foxglove ducked out of the chimney and faced them. Ivy felt her excitement dim. The look in Foxglove's eyes was hollow. I think it was here, she said, but he must have emptied it sometime after he found you in the ruins, Pine. Emptied it? Azalea cried, rushing over to the fireplace. She climbed inside and Crab walked up the chimney wall to see for herself. It's all gone? Pine asked bleakly. Almost, said Foxglove. She held out something that flashed in the dim light. The only thing left in the hole was this. Glowing in the palm of her hand was a shimmering blue sapphire shaped like a star. Chapter 19 Wren In the city, some dragons were still awake and wandering the moonlit streets, but Wren had waited as long as she could, and she thought, she hoped, that most of them were asleep. She crept out of the trees and down the hill in the dark, through the farmstead, following the same path she'd watched Sky walk earlier that day. A goat bleated huffily at her as she snuck past, nearly giving her a heart attack. But no dragons stirred. The ones who lived on the outskirts seemed to be the early-to-bed types. The bridge was deserted, but there were two dragons in the market square, sitting on the steps of a statue and arguing about something. Wren stayed low as she crossed the river, in the shadow of the bridge railing. She had to dart from the bridge to the first stall, now covered for the night, but neither of the arguing dragons noticed her in the torchlight. Don't be an idiot, one of them growled. Stick with Burn. She's going to win. We all know it. I don't know, said the other. It sounds all right in the... Something about scorpions? Right now with the... Something about claws? In charge. The first dragon muttered a bunch of insults Ren didn't completely understand, although she would have liked to learn them so she could use them on Undauntable one day. She worked her way around the square, staying behind the stalls, and finally she turned the same corner that Sky had turned. More streets. Another square up ahead. Balconies overlooking the alleys. Giant windows for the dragons to fly into. Wren had no idea where Skye had gone from here. She was a very small human in a very big dragon city. But I am going to find him. She followed the streets, trying to think like Skye. Would he have wandered down this road because it was lined with flowering garden boxes? Would he have stopped to climb around on the dragonette playground, even though he was probably too big for it? It was a little hard to concentrate when every so often, a dragon would suddenly swoop out of the sky, and she'd have to fling herself into a doorway or under a cart of vegetables to hide. More than once, she had to take a quick, unexpected turn because she heard a whole party of laughing dragons coming around a corner. But close to midnight, she came upon something that she knew would have caught Skye's attention, a courtyard lined with cages. Most of them were covered for the night, but Wren could hear twittering and rustling, and a few soft growls. This was some kind of shop for dragon pets, just as Skye had hoped for, she guessed. She peeked under a few of the covers and saw mostly weird, lovely birds. The one closest to the torchlight had bright green, blue, and yellow feathers, and a large hooked beak, and it tilted its head at her curiously. Another cage held a kind of desert mouse, with giant ears and a long tail. Near the edge of the courtyard were three uncovered, empty cages. Wren nearly went right past them, but something caught her eye about the latches on the doors. She stopped to look at the latches on the doors and realized these cages had been broken open. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Did Skye decide to free some of the animals? All by himself? I bet the shop owner didn't like that very much. She glanced around wondering what had happened and looking for clues. 
Had Sky felt sorry for something adorable? Had he just started opening cages? And then, did the shop owner attack him? Or were there guards who might have arrested him? In Talisman, the dragon mancers had a few goons with sharp sticks who did all the hands-on arresting, and then the dragon mancers decided on the punishment to follow. In Undauntable City, there was a lord and the porcupine soldiers. Was that how this dragon city worked, too? Was someone in charge? Ren spotted something on the cobblestones and crouched for a closer look. The torchlight turned it black, but she was pretty sure it was a drop of blood. That better not be Sky's blood, she thought, or I'll be the new dragon slayer in town. She searched down each nearby street until she found another drop, and another, a faint trail to follow. The drops of blood led her around a few corners, but she lost the trail, or it ran out, not far from the animal cage courtyard, on a quiet street of what appeared to be family homes. Firelight glimmered behind a few of the curtains, and she could hear dragon voices murmuring while others were dark and quiet. Wren paced up and down past the last drop of blood, studying the houses around it. Was Sky inside one of them? Did he want to be? Was he hurt? None of them looked like a jail, at least. She'd been there a while, trying to peek in some of the windows, when she heard footsteps approaching. Quickly, she scrambled up the side of one of the dark houses and hid herself in the greenery decorating the top of the door. A dragon came along the street, yawning widely. She stopped at the house next to the one where Wren was hiding, sniffed a few times, and swung her head around with a puzzled expression. You don't smell human, Wren prayed to the three moons above. Please don't smell me. Hrumph, the dragon grunted. She shoved open the door beside her and went in. You're so late, a voice said from inside. What took so long? Paperwork, the dragon grumbled. Very annoying. At least we get to eat the, she said a word Wren didn't know. You should have sent someone to clean up out there. I can smell its blood on the street. She waved one wing out at the dark road, then shut the door behind her. It was too dark, the other dragon argued, his voice muffled now. Wren wanted to break something. All that trouble to follow the trail, and it wasn't Sky's blood. It wasn't even a dragon's. It belonged to whatever these two were about to eat, which meant it had nothing to do with Sky at all. She was about to jump off the house when the second voice asked, What happened to that dragon? Did he pay for the lost animals? Wren froze. It was harder to hear them with the door closed, and she wasn't entirely sure she was translating right, given how wobbly Sky's dragon could be sometimes. No. The first dragon grumbled something for a while, and then her voice rose again. Very strange, though. Someone offered to buy him from me. Wren dug her fingers into the side of the house and edged closer, resting her feet on the tops of the windows until she was as close to the conversation as she could possibly be. To cover it, the second dragon was saying. More than enough. Don't know what they want with them, though. Weird, scrawny, and obviously a troublemaker. The second dragon said something that Wren didn't understand, except that it echoed the word weird. Oh. Maybe, said the first. There was silence for a while, and some clattering that might have been pots or plates. Kind of feel sorry for him if that's it, the dragon added eventually. What? Wren thought desperately. Where is he? What is happening to Sky? Maybe the... Something. We'll let him go, said the other one. We'll know when we see them fly back to the palace tomorrow, said the first. She used a word that wasn't quite palace, but sounded close. He'll be with them or not. I'll be glad when they're gone, the second replied, sounding a bit louder and more animated. Marching around the city, knocking things over with their weapons, ordering dragons about. Someone should tell them they can boss around sand dragons all they want, but they're not in charge of the rest of us. Ha, said the first dragon. It's not going to be me. They started joking about which of their friends might be brave enough to do it, but Wren didn't need to hear any more. 
she was pretty sure she'd figured it out. Marching, weapons, that meant Sky was being held by Sand Dragon soldiers, wherever they were camped in the city. And if she didn't rescue him, tomorrow he'd be flown to the Sand Queen's palace for some mysterious, terrible reason. She slithered back down to the ground and set off running through the city. Her guess was that an army would be camped in the desert outside, but the best way to find out would be to get up high. Ren followed her instincts, taking turns that led higher and higher, until she came to one of the towers she'd seen that overlooked the city. It seemed to be a landing station for new arrivals, where traveling dragons could get their bearings before entering the city. Of course, there were no stairs, no door inside, nothing helpful for a small human with no wings. But the walls were made of rough sandstone bricks, and she'd been climbing trees her whole life. Ren saw a pair of tiny lizards chase each other up and around the towers. All right, if lizards could do it, she could do this. It was quite a bit harder than climbing a tree with lovely, useful branches, and it took a lot longer than Ren would have liked. But finally, she hauled herself, gasping, onto the top of the tower. There was a little roof here, perched on columns and decorated with carvings of dragon wings. There was also, somewhat hilariously, a large map of the city carved on a smooth block of wood. When Ren stood in front of it, she could see how the shapes of the buildings lined up with the map. The map was covered in labels, but they were all in dragon, odd symbols that looked like claws and moons and flames. It really would be useful to read dragon, Ren thought. Otherwise, the map was useless to her. She went to the edge of the tower, held onto a column, and peered out into the night. It was clear, with all three moons overhead, and she could see pretty far in all directions. It didn't take her long to spot a collection of tents and large sleeping shapes, organized in a pattern around a small oasis on the western side of the river, where the buildings began to shift into farmland. It took a lot longer, though, for her to climb down from the tower and run to the encampment. She didn't like the light gray color the sky was turning, and she kind of felt like murdering the birds who were starting to chirp overhead. But finally, she came within sight of the tents and saw, with a sinking heart, that many of the sand dragon soldiers were awake. They were hurrying around, rolling up the tents, and securing supplies, and doing other busy-looking army things. It would be pretty dangerous for a human to stroll in between their talons right now. Was Sky really here? How could she find him? She crept as close as she could and found a large stack of firewood to hide behind. As the tents were folded down, she watched each one to see if it might have a prisoner inside. And then, finally, she spotted him. Sky was sitting by the embers of a campfire, his wings drooping dejectedly. A chain locked his talons to a brawny sand dragon sitting next to him. She wore armor and was grinning with a lot of very sharp teeth. Oh, Sky, Ren thought, her heart breaking. I'm here. Don't be sad. I'm here to set you free. But she had no idea how. A voice started roaring from one of the tents, and all the soldiers snapped to attention. How are we all this fine, fine morning? The dragon bellowed. He swept out of his tent and spread his wings wide in the morning light. Ha ha ha! An excellent day to fight some ice dragons before we go home, don't you think? Yes, sir! All the soldiers roared in unison. Oh, no, Ren thought, staring at the leader of the dragons. She recognized him. He was the one who'd attacked the indestructible city. This must be the army he was planning to destroy them with. After fighting some ice dragons, apparently, and taking Sky to the Sand Queen, maybe. Then off we go, the leader shouted. He leaped into the sky. Wait, now? Ren thought in a panic. Already? A storm of sand surrounded her as the soldiers began vaulting into the air after their captain. Through the stinging wind, Ren saw the dragon guarding Sky give a yank on the chain and drag him up with her. Wing beats and hollering and wind drowned out everything for several long moments, 
and Ren had to crouch down with her cloak over her face and her hands over her ears. Finally, the clamor and the hurricane died down. Ren was able to stand up again, shaking sand off her cloak. She blinked around at the deserted camp. The general and his army were gone, and they'd taken Sky with them. Chapter 20 Leaf Rowan lunged for Leaf, wrapping her arms around his legs and dragging him back down. The dark red dragon made an annoyed clicking noise and shook Leaf as though Rowan were a troublesome ant. When she clung tighter, it hissed, grabbed her in its other claws, and yanked her away from him. Rowan! Leaf called, struggling to yell over the edge of the dragon's fist. Rowan, when you get to the arena, kill a dragon for me! Don't you die, Leaf! She screamed back. Don't you dare get eaten, too! And then the grate was getting dizzily closer and closer, and that was all Leaf could see for a moment, until the dragon soared out of the trapdoor, and Leaf caught fractured glimpses of a huge, bustling kitchen full of frantic dragons. Dragons chopping fruit, dragons stirring cauldrons of soup, dragons stacking elaborate-looking appetizers on plates. It looked a lot like talisman preparing for a feast, except the vibe in this kitchen was a lot more Someone's going to kill us if we get this wrong. Leaf wasn't sure how he sensed that, something in the way the dragons held their wings in tightly, pushed one another aside to grab things, and scurried from station to station with tense expressions. It was all weirdly human, actually. He was probably imagining most of it, thinking the dragons had feelings like humans did, the way his sister Bluebell used to think every butterfly was her friend and truly loved her. The world tilted sideways, and Leaf was swung upside down as the dragon veered through a doorway and up into the heart of the palace. Leaf remembered copying this from the map more than once because it was hard, and he kept getting it wrong. There was a giant hall in the center, with several levels of balconies all around it, a huge hole in the roof above, and windows open to the night sky everywhere. Fires burned in many of the rooms off the balconies, giving the whole palace an ominous smoky glow and a charred smell. The wind rushed past Leaf's ears, but he could still hear the flapping of dragon wings all around him. Dragons were rushing from level to level. The one carrying him snapped at a dragon carrying a pile of firewood who nearly crashed into them. Suddenly, the dragon banked left, sending blood rushing into Leaf's ears, and whooshed through a tunnel, then right through an enormous doorway that led outside. After five days in a box, Leaf would have thought going outside would be a huge relief. But it was hard to appreciate the fresh air when there were approximately 800 zillion dragons out there waiting to eat him. He was on a plateau, surrounded by sheer cliffs going up on one side and even more sheer cliffs going down on the other. The plateau was full of dragons milling around looking exactly as awkward as all the villagers did during Dragon Mancer Appreciation Day celebrations. Globes of fire hung over the party, lighting up the scales below, red and orange, but also many pale, yellowish dragons with differently shaped snouts. Rowan was right. There was another kind of dragon here. Where had they all come from? Why were they all here now? And then the dragon dumped him unceremoniously, in the middle of the party, and flew away again. Almost immediately, a massive dragon talon slammed down beside Leaf. He rolled quickly to his feet and darted away, dodging through a sea of tails and claws and other prey. He nearly ran straight into the bobcat, who had its back against a statue and was hissing with all its fur standing on end. As Leaf stumbled back, he saw that the statue was a smooth white marble dragon wearing a crown, and raising one claw as though she was making a speech. Just a few steps away was a black statue of another dragon, or the same dragon. It looked like a similar crown, with rubies glittering in the eye holes and wings spread behind its glare. There was treasure everywhere. At least half the dragons wore jewels and gold. More jewels were embedded in the decorations. This dragon queen clearly wanted everyone to know how wealthy she was. 
Leaf guessed that thieves could get away with a few jewels without the dragons even noticing. Perhaps the dragon mancers really had been successful dragon treasure smugglers once upon a time. The strangest decoration, though, was a contraption like a bird cage that hung suspended on wires over the party. Inside it was a small dragon who was yet another different color from the ones on the ground, more golden yellow than sand pale, but who had a similar snout to the pale yellow ones. He'd thought for a moment that she was another statue, but then a dragon on the ground threw something at the cage, and she flinched away from the bars. A prisoner of war, Leaf wondered. Do dragons take prisoners? She looked too small to be a threat to any of these dragons, and as sad as the humans in the kitchen pit. There you go again, Ren observed, seeing human feelings in the droop of a dragon's wing. At the foot of the tall cliff that backed the plateau, a ginormous golden throne towered over the entire party. Atop it sat the orange queen, who had chased Mushroom into the ravine. Leaf wondered whether she'd caught him. Time is here somewhere, he remembered. Maybe we can figure out a way to kill one of these dragons together. Another set of huge talons smashed down beside him, scaly and hot and rippling with muscles, and he took off running again. I have a suggestion, Ren offered. Maybe focus on staying alive first? Leaf darted between the animals and talons, searching the crowd for time. The tunnel that led back into the palace was blocked by a tall barrier of rock and a pair of grouchy-looking guards. As he crouched behind yet another statue, this one made of gold with a diamond-studded crown, he saw the guards both look up sharply, then turn their heads in the same direction. Did they hear something? A few of the dragons standing near them paused their growling conversation and turned to listen as well. Their expressions caught the attention of a few others and the listening silence began to spread quickly through the party. Finally, it was quiet enough for Leaf to hear what they heard as well. It sounded like... music? It was coming from somewhere in the mountains nearby, probably another part of the palace. The moonlight cast silver shadows on the peaks around them as all the dragons lifted their faces to the sky. It was music. It was the sound of many voices singing together, but it couldn't be, because the voices sang in the dragon language, rumbling well above and below human registers. How can dragons sing? Leaf thought, shaken. How can they have music? Isn't music a human thing? Don't you need a, a soul to make music? Especially music that was weirdly beautiful. Leaf wasn't sure why, but it made him think of Wren and how she would always fight for things she cared about. He rubbed his arms, trying to scrape the goosebumps away. Over by the cliff, the dragon queen let out a hiss and leaped off her throne. She stalked through the party, flicking her tail at the large sand dragon who'd been sitting beside her. The dragon stood with a displeased expression and followed her into the palace as did several of the red and orange armored guards. In the stillness she'd left behind, Leaf finally spotted Time lying near the edge of the cliff, peering over at the rocks below. Leaf waited until the distant music cut off and the dragons started moving and talking again. Then he sprinted over to Time's side. Don't lie down like that, he whispered. You'll be easy to grab, and you won't even have a chance to run. Time sat back on his heels and put his hand on Leaf's shoulder. Oh, Leaf, I'm so sorry you're here too. Maybe we can both get out of this, Leaf said. Maybe now, while the queen is gone. He glanced over his shoulder at the cliff that rose behind the party, then leaned over to peer down the one in front of him. Not far away, he could see the glitter of moonlight reflecting off a waterfall. I think climbing up will be easier than going down. It looks shorter. They both look impossible, Time said. There's no way I can climb either one. Leaf had to admit to himself that Time was probably right. Leaf's skill could maybe get him through the sheer spots and over that ledge near the top, but Time had never trained quite as intensely as any of the rest of them. Time sighed and gave him a rueful smile. You should go, though, he said. 
If you stay to keep me company and get eaten, Rowan will never forgive me. I wonder what happens to the animals that aren't eaten during the feast, Leaf said. Maybe all you have to do is hide until it's over, and they'll put you back in the pit with the others. Yay, Time said. It was the only hope Leaf could think of. He glanced around the plateau again, looking for a hiding spot. I know, under the tables, he said. There were several tables laden with food and, more important, covered with long gold brocade tablecloths. You can hide under there until the feast is over. Hmm, Time said. That's a little closer to the hors d'oeuvres than I was planning to get, but it's not a bad idea. Leaf studied the cliff behind the throne, which probably led to the top of the palace. Maybe there was a way to get from up there, down into the central hall, and then back to the kitchens. He wasn't about to leave the palace without Rowan and Cranberry, even if he could. Are you really going up? Time asked. Won't the dragons notice you? Hopefully not, Leave said. They seem preoccupied. And I think it's the best way back to the others. Time grasped his arm for a moment, then nodded. Good luck. You too. Leaf wasn't sure how long he had before the queen returned. He ducked behind one of the tables and ran along it all the way to the cliff, then rolled behind the throne. The cliff loomed above him, looking a fearsome amount taller than it had even from the other side of the party. I can do this. It can't be any harder than killing a dragon. And it might be the only way to rescue Rowan and everybody else. He took a deep breath reached for the first cracks he could fit his hands into, and started to climb. The first half of the night went pretty well, he thought. Leaf climbed and climbed, resting whenever he found a secure spot, freezing whenever he heard dragons lifting off from the party below. He climbed as fast as he could at first, to get himself above the fire globes. Once he reached the darker part of the cliff, he felt a lot safer. This also made climbing slower and harder, though, as it was difficult to see exactly what he was reaching for. Race you to the top of the cliff, Ren said cheerfully. Just kidding, I would clearly win. Hey, which of these dragons do you think ate me? I hope it was the queen. Watch out, that part of the cliff looks a bit crumbly. Come on, Leaf, you can do it. Just imagine me at the top, laughing at how slow you are and then cheering when you finally get there, and then throwing you a sword and waving my own in the air and charging off to fight the dragons. We'd have been a good team, wouldn't we? I could have helped you protect the village. First, I would have tied up all the dragon mancers and stuffed them in a cellar full of rotten potatoes. Leave tried again to imagine the dragon mancers when they were younger, sneaking around this palace and stealing treasure, and hightailing it back into the mountains. Maybe it had been easier back then. Maybe there had been a different, less ferocious queen, or something like that. He certainly couldn't imagine haughty, sinister Master Trout climbing a cliff like this. Inside his head, Ren giggled. Somewhere around the middle of the night, Leaf's arms began to shake with exhaustion. He heard the feast breaking up, and felt the rush of wind as guests flew away. When he glanced down, he saw dragons cleaning up the mess that was left behind. A few of them gathered the last surviving animals and flew back into the palace with them, but Leaf couldn't see whether time was among them. The air was cold against the back of his neck, and his fingertips were going numb. He kept reaching for new handholds and missing. I have to stop and rest, Leaf realized. He glanced up and saw that he'd almost reached a narrow shelf of rock that jutted out from the cliff. He'd seen it from below and thought it would be hard to climb over. But if he could get onto it, maybe he could lie down and sleep for a moment. Leaf gritted his teeth and forced himself onward. That tiny handhold over there, toes barely clinging to the cracks in the rock, another inch higher, fingertips aching, hand muscles cramping. One more shove upward on his left leg. He reached and caught the edge of the shelf, then hauled himself onto it with the last fragment of his strength. The shelf was barely wide enough for two people to lie down side by side, parallel to the cliff. 
A scraggly little bush jutted out from a crack in the rock, glaring at Leaf in a very wren-like, this is my safe spot, go get your own, kind of way. Leaf collapsed flat on the stone. His whole body was in pain, especially his shoulders. No, his fingers hurt more. Maybe his knees, which kept scraping against the jagged surface of the cliff. Sleep will fix it all, he thought as his eyes closed. Leaf's sleep was deep and dreamless, but it was cut short abruptly by the sound of hundreds of dragons screaming in terror. He shot up and nearly knocked himself off the ledge. For a moment, he crouched against the cliff, clutching the thorny bush branches, his heart pounding. The sky was full of screaming dragons, shrieking dragons, roaring dragons, dragons shoving one another aside in a mad panic to fly as high and far as they could. What is going on? What scared them? He craned his neck toward the arena prison, where dragons were fountaining into the sky like an erupting volcano of scales and smoke. Did the sand dragons attack the mountain dragons? Or was it all a trap for the sand dragons? Did one of them betray the others? Do dragons do traps and betrayal? He had no idea what could have set them off, but suddenly there were dragons everywhere, and it was mid-morning, and he had to get to Rowan before any of these dragons did. He turned to the cliff and started climbing again. I can do this, Wren, he whispered. I can get to the top of this cliff, and I can find my way into the palace, and I can find Rowan and the others and get them out of that pit, and this is a totally rational plan that is going to happen. No problem. Several minutes later, he had gotten almost nowhere. His shoulders were screaming with pain, and he was realizing that climbing in the daytime, exhausted, was a whole lot more terrifying than climbing at night. There were so many dragons everywhere, and even though most of them were flapping around panicking, it still seemed highly likely that one would eventually go, Ah! Unspecified catastrophe! Everything is ter- Ooh, I do need a snack right now, and pop him right into its mouth. He'd barely had that thought when a dragon whooshed past, so close that he felt a wave of fiery warmth from its copper-colored scales. A moment later, there was another rush of wing beats, and Leaf flattened himself against the cliff. The second dragon flashed past, and he blinked, then blinked again as both dragons disappeared over the top of the cliff. The second dragon was blue. Blue. Did you see that? he thought to imaginary Wren. A sea dragon, maybe? Did the sea dragons attack? Is that why they're all freaking out? Would a sea dragon be any easier to stab? A gust of wind made him close his eyes as another dragon whisked by. Keep going, Wren whispered. Only 4,000 more tiny toeholds to go. He reached for the next bump in the rocks, and as he did, he saw the last dragon do a slow, lazy turn in the air and come speeding back toward Leaf. It was looking right at him. It was reaching for him. Its talons closed around him, and Leaf was lifted off the cliff, and the claws of a dragon once again.